Wonderful to be here after such a long time in this beautiful place. Thank you for your welcome. Let's come into the present moment, it might be a good idea. Uh, which simply means to start with, mean to acknowledge the present moment, what is. If you have encountered any kind of irritation on your way here, which is quite possible, because uh, the, we, one encounters many sources of irritation every day, then I suggest to that you look at it, feel it, and instead of saying, I am irritated, you say, there's irritation in me, and I can feel it. This is a big difference, it's not just a play with words, the difference between saying, I am irritated, or angry, or sad, or whatever the condition may be, and saying, this is what I feel, or that, that is what is in me at the moment. By saying that, you've taken a step back, you're not in the grip of the irritation, you're in the awareness behind the irritation, and that's the beginning of an awakening, to be the awareness behind whatever arises. And if one starts with any, whatever has arisen, in the past hour, or in the past two and a half years. <laughs> Many people carry all kinds of stuff that has accumulated during that time, particularly when we all had to face the same collective challenges. <clears throat> it could be fear, it could be anger. If your main concern has been the pandemic, it's fear. If your main concern has been the, 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 in your opinion, unjustified measures taken, then you feel angry. I'm not taking sides here. Whatever it may be, that's there. But that is not who or what you are. There, it is something that arises. You are beyond that, but most humans don't know that yet. They are not, so well, the term we use is awakening. We are talking about the possibility of a awakening. This is why we're here, our evening, this gathering here is an event that should be seen in the context of the awakening of human consciousness. And almost all of you are here because you are already awakening. If you were not already awakening, you would perhaps never have heard of this or would see no point whatsoever in listening to me. <laughs> what? <clears throat> and uh, <clears throat> I welcome particularly those uh, a few people here. I'm sure there are some who were dragged here by a friend or relative and uh, said, you really must come and listen to this guy. Um, and if that is the case, if somebody told you that, I think I'm sure he or she is right. <laughs> the question is, though, whether this evening will be meaningful to you. It may be, in which case it could bring about the beginning of an awakening, or it could be that you're not quite ready for awakening yet, which is fine, in which case you would find this evening um, at best boring and possibly even irritating. <laughs> and that's fine too. If you absolutely cannot stand it anymore, anymore, feel free to remove yourself. Nobody will judge you because most people here are sufficiently enlightened not to judge anybody else.
And if you're not ready, then, as I said, it's absolutely fine. All it means is you need a little bit more suffering. <laughs> and uh, the universe, or whatever you want to call the greater intelligence that, that lies behind all phenomenal existence, will make sure that you get what you need for your awakening. <laughs> so that's all very well. Uh, now, it may well be that uh, awakening is not necessarily something, even though it may be happening to you, it's, it may not necessarily be a term that you would have applied to what you experience as a, perhaps as some shift in consciousness, some improvement in your mental-emotional state, a greater ability to harmonize with the present moment. But perhaps you would not have called it awakening, or you may not be quite sure why we call it awakening. Uh, and if you are totally new to this, you say, well, I'm already awake, what is he talking about? But if, you, but if you look in traditions, spiritual traditions, it's a very ancient term, the term of the awakening. It goes back thousands of years to the time of the Buddha and perhaps even beyond. When the, the Buddha is not a name, nobody. The Buddha is, uh, the term arose when 2,500 years ago there was a man, uh, uh, Gautama, who later became known as the Buddha. People asked him, he, he was giving spiritual teaching, probably about living in the present moment. And they asked him, who, who are you? What, what is you? Who are you? And instead of giving his name, he said, I am Buddha. At that time, it wasn't a recognized title, but the root of the word Buddha in Sanskrit is to be awake. So all he said is, I'm awake. That's who or what I am. Well, that's interesting. So the Buddha is the one who is awake. Now, and you might look at uh, this hidden teachings in Jesus in the Gospels that are not usually understood by conventional Christianity. They, they have a superficial interpretation of it. We could call that exoteric Christianity instead of esoteric Christianity. Jesus says, for example, in <clears throat> now I'm going to impress you with my knowledge. <laughs> Chapter 13, verse 37, Gospel of Mark. He says, And what I say to you, I say to all, stay awake. Oh, stay awake. And many, there are various parables about staying awake. So the, his disciples, he was, his function was to awaken his disciples, to bring about at least the beginning of the awakening process. And then now the challenge is to stay awake. We start to awaken, but now you have to stay awake. So quite a few times in various places, Jesus talks about the importance of staying awake, staying alert. So all, all ancient teachings, all true deep teachings point to that. It's a timeless message. And one more thing, if you go back and look at spiritual traditions, in, uh, in ancient India, there's a, in ancient Indian spiritual philosophy, there is a, a term which in Sanskrit is Turiya. Turiya <coughs> means the fourth, first, second, third, fourth. Turiya means the fourth. Now what refer that refers to is the fourth state of consciousness. First state of consciousness is deep sleep. Second state of consciousness is the dream state. The third state of consciousness is conventional wakefulness. And the fourth state of consciousness, Turiya, is the state of, well, the awakened state, the aware state. So they all, so, that, so it points to that as ultimately the next stage in human evolution. And this is why we are here to the wider context for being here goes far beyond 
the individual personalities that are here, including this personality, there is a, a deeper movement happening here that has brought us here together, and that is the movement of, of the awakening of consciousness. That's why we are here, and this evening is designed, one could say, or intended, or to deepen or accelerate that awakening, and also to point out possible or likely obstacles that may and probably will arise in your life to prevent the awakening because there are certain patterns in you that do not want you to awaken. Uh, the, the patterns that make up the egoic self, the egoic sense of self, which is the state of consciousness of normal wakefulness, but compared to which, compared to the awakened state, normal wakefulness is a dreamlike state. Now, of course, I don't just want to talk about it. I would like this gathering to be experiential so that it's not just words or concepts, although it operates, of course, also on that level, but something deeper arising, something deeper that is touched in you and that perhaps by being here, accelerates, uh, comes forth more easily and more quickly. All spiritual teachings are really ultimately here to save time. Ultimately, you, you get enough suffering and you awaken eventually. <laughs> and that is a strange thing. The awakening into this new aware consciousness, another word we could use, to be present, another word we could use, to point to it, it strangely, and I must say, unfortunately, it doesn't happen while you are in your comfort zone. It hasn't happened to anybody in their comfort zone. Although everybody is longing for a comfort zone. Ah, I can finally say, everything is fine. I've sorted out my life. <laughs> my relationships are great. Not that you should not strive to, to have a great life, to, to, to live well, to, to achieve things, to have good relationships is a wonderful thing. Okay, that is true. But it's also true that quite often relationships are not that good. And it's also true that for many people their main source of suffering is their relationships. And that's only one, one source of suffering. So many things make up your life situation. Your relationships are very important, your health situation, uh, your professional situation, your living situation, where you live, what uh, your status in society, whether you consider yourself to be a success or failure, weird terms. And certainly, if you listen to this world to tell you whether your life is a success or failure, that is very misleading because this world is, uh, to a large extent, let's say, to put it mildly, a little bit insane. <laughs> and if you, if you allow the world to tell you your worth, that you're listening to a somewhat insane person to tell you who or what you are. So the, what awakens us is the difficulties of life, when you get a shock here and there. One, other, one word we could use is adversity. <laughs> so we encounter many different kinds of adversity. It begins in childhood. There's no child that does not encounter already at an early age adversity, difficulties, challenges of one kind or another, some far, far, far greater than others. That is true. But no child is free of suffering. 
And even if you are a, a very conscious parent and a very careful parent, if you want to, you do all your best to pre prevent the child from suffering. You do everything in your power to prevent the child from suffering. And then if you succeed for several years in preventing your child from suffering on all levels, then unfortunately, the fact that the child has never encountered adversity will become the child's greatest suffering. So you can't win. <laughs> so, and of course, adversity comes, it can come, it come as a personal challenge, it comes into your life, large and small. And collectively, as we have been experiencing recently, a challenge that affects everybody, millions of people all over the planet. And so, usually people complain when challenges happen. Challenge is a term that is a kind of euphemism for something that usually is bad. But if you are spiritual, then you call it, it's a challenge. Well, that's good, okay. Uh, uh, if you're not spiritual, so it's dreadful stuff, awful, awful. Oh, it's a challenge. It's easy to tell somebody else it's a challenge, but when it happens to you, it might be different. <laughs> so, challenges will come. Uh, every day, small challenges come, and then periodically, from time to time, bigger forms of adversity come into your life. It's inevitable. And that is always the possibility of awakening out of the egoic state, the possibility arises. It does not necessarily happen yet as one first, second, third uh, challenge comes into your life. The possibility is there. So humans, uh, it's, it's important perhaps as the first thing to do. There are not many things you need to remember from this evening because it's not, not memory-based, concept-based. But if you don't remember one thing is uh, when unexpected things happen that you, your mind says, this shouldn't be happening, why is this to you? Why does he behave like that? He shouldn't do that, he shouldn't have said that, that shouldn't be happening, why am I here? Can't they, can't they do something about it? They really should. Uh, all kinds of narratives in your mind that make you unhappy. Not the situation, the narrative makes you unhappy. Oh, that's an interesting thing, by the way. <laughs> when you find irritation arising or some kind of suffering. The Buddha calls it dukkha, which is, he says, wherever you go, you'll find it, unless you awaken. Dukkha, usually translated as suffering, can also be translated as unsatisfactoriness, misery, unhappiness. Wherever you go, any situation, relationships, sooner or later, often sooner rather than later, <laughs> something goes not quite right. Have a look at your relationships. You fall in love. Oh! That's the end of my suffering. <laughs> and so you key at this early stage before you move in together. <laughs> you can always tell when you're in a restaurant, when a couple, couple sitting at having dinner, you can tell whether they've been married for a while or it's their first or second date. It's their first or second date, it's a totally different way they look at each other. They look at the other as a kind of god or goddess. <laughs> they, are not, they are not living together yet. <laughs> And then they start living together and then, uh, oh, I forgot to mention, the, the married couple or the one who they've been living together for a while, they, they, they don't relate to each other in a different way. They may, may both be on their phones. <laughs> and I sometimes wonder, are they texting each other? Or, <laughs> or is one or both of them already looking at the 
app that they forgot to delete that brought them together in the first place. <laughs> and saying, I want to see what else is out there. Because when you, again, you, you begin to live with somebody and then one day something arises in that person that you didn't know was there. Who is that person? Some, some weird, some kind of transformation, they're probably this nasty creature. Right? And suddenly you have to, and then you really begin to doubt. Have I made a terrible mistake? No, maybe you've already signed, signed a piece of paper that's to promise you're going to be together forever. Then it's even more problematic. But no matter where you go, whatever situation you go into, you will encounter something doesn't quite work out the way it is expected. Um, so humans envision, have this vision that it is possible to achieve, to have your life work out on all levels. And for very brief moments in time, that is possible. Health is, my health is great. Fantastic relationships, great income, wonderful place to live, beautiful children, they're all doing well. Um, everything is absolutely fine. It's everything on every level. Well, if that is the case with you at this moment, then just wait a little. <laughs> and sooner rather than later, some, what, somewhere, somewhere, something, is no, no longer right. And life continues like that. But humans, ex they always believe there's something drastically wrong if you know, they meet these unexpected challenges. There's something drastically wrong. Now, because they believe that uh, the world or life is here to make them happy. And that is a huge misperception. And if that your belief is here, the world is here to make you happy, uh, then you will become very frustrated because it can't do that. <laughs> and, and so if you have this, this, the, this discrepancy, your expectation and the reality that life is always problematic, it always brings up some, no matter how much positive thinking you do, which is a wonderful thing to do, how careful you are, you are in arranging your life, you do your best everywhere, even then, and you should do your best. And positive thinking is good, far better than negative thinking. So I recommend positive thinking, but it, it will bring good things into your life. But nevertheless, adversity will still happen. It is, it is designed to be so. That's it. So humans then have this expectation there's something wrong with their lives or with them. It is, it's, it's, that's how life works. If you go to, a reflection of life is a movie. You go into, if you watch a movie, it's a reflection of life. Now, every, the, one could almost say the plot in every movie, if you want to simplify it to, to its simplest denominator, I can describe the plot in almost virtually every movie that you see in the following way. Very early on in the movie, something goes wrong. Something has to happen to the characters. Something, some, they have to be challenged in one way or another, unless it's an absolute comedy and just everywhere, and everything goes wrong and you're supposed to laugh about it. So something needs to go wrong, otherwise you will fall asleep in the movie, or you'll walk out. <laughs> so what keeps you awake in the movie is adversity that the characters encounter of one kind or another. Wow. So in the movie you demand it, but in your personal life you resent it. <laughs> so the life, the, uh, the world, the things of the world are not here to, obviously to make you happy because if that were the case, the world would be failing you. <laughs> and of course, some people have this underlying belief that the world is somehow uh, withholding something from them, that the world is being unfair to them. Uh, or they call it God. And then they stop, stop believing in God because 
if there were gods, wouldn't that mean that only good things happen to me if I go to church every Sunday and pray? Doesn't that mean that only good things will happen to me? And no, it doesn't. So they blame God, they blame, they blame the world, they blame certain sections of society, etc., for their unhappiness. But it's in the nature of things. Of course, we should improve our lives and improve society also. But there can be improvements, but to pursue a, a utopia, either in your personal life, a utopia of everything absolutely great, or to pursue a utopia collectively, which was the case, for example, with communism, we, it, there were perhaps some good ideas behind it. We must achieve equality, we must achieve this, that, to make life better for everybody. That was a good idea. What they neglected to uh, consider is that it was only a good idea, but the awakening had not happened in any of them. So the egoic state just had a good idea. And then he tried to implement that idea with disastrous results. Disaster, millions and millions dead, killed. Disastrous results, starting with a good idea, a good, good intention. Isn't there a proverb about intention? The road to hell is paved with good intentions. So good intentions are good, but in the absence of awareness, which is another word for the awakened state, in the absence of awareness, good intention is not enough. It often brings about the opposite. And awareness is inseparable from wisdom. What we call wisdom arises out of awareness. And so without wisdom, we cannot bring about a better world in every avenue we pursue and any action we take to bring about a better world very often has, is counterproductive and actually makes things worse. <laughs> you want to attack a problem without knowing all the repercussions and consequences because intel you're maybe very intelligent. Intelligence is something that is different from wisdom. Wisdom is something far deeper. Wisdom arises out of the awakened state. Intelligence is in the use, usually in the use of the ego. So an increase in, is it, of intelligence is not going to save us. An increase in knowledge is not going to save us. We already are drowning in knowledge. It's all in your phone. You can get all the knowledge you want in your phone and can drive you crazy. So, in, and intelligence, intelligence is often in the service of madness. You build weapons of mass destruction. You need great intelligence to build these things. They're all very, and yet it's intelligence in the service of madness. So what the world needs is wisdom. Wisdom is able to see the totality of a situation. And it doesn't attack one problem, it sees the totality. And then right action, which is a Buddhist term that's frequently used, right action arises out of a right awakened consciousness. And right action cannot arise out of the egoic consciousness. So this is the context, this is the awakening. Now let's go more deeply into the actual uh, re realization of the awakened state and what what is the unawakened state uh, to put in simply terms uh, the most simple terms uh, the unawakened state is you are run by the thinking mind this, there's a continuous stream of thinking that goes through your mind and it absorbs your intention almost completely. You're, you're completely in the conceptual mind. And you can look at a person quite often, you can see how, how absent rather than present a person is. They're completely in their thinking mind. 
you go, they're not really here. They just have enough consciousness so that not to uh, stumble, uh, to trip over some furniture or to, to stumble into something. Just enough awareness of their surroundings. And, and even then, maybe not even enough and so an accident happens because they're totally in their minds. So there's the, there is the, the voice in the head for many people, it never stops talking. It's a continuous little man or woman or maybe a transgender person, who knows, and he's talking, talk, he's commenting on things, interpreting, judging according to its conditioning. That's how it is, and that often, well, I wonder what he's doing there. What, what is this? What am I going to do? Tomorrow, yesterday, tomorrow, yesterday, tomorrow, next moment, last moment. Never this moment. Always last moment, previous moments or next moments. So you live almost exclusively in past and future. There is the burden of the past which is often for many humans, yes, there are some good memories, but even good memories bring up nostalgia because you feel bad because the good things are no longer here. So even the good memories can make you unhappy. <laughs> you feel, but then there are many bad memories, bad, there are grievances, there's all kinds of feelings of guilt, what you did, and you now know it was bad, you shouldn't have done it, but it was 20 years ago. Guilt or grievance, something that somebody or the world did to you. Oh, and you carry it like a like a burden. For people, for many people, they look. They have this veil. They look at the world through the, the veil of mental emotional conditioning, and more often than not, the veil is not a pleasant one. There are many people who carry a huge amount of grievances in their mental emotional field. And then if you, a person a bit, if a person lives with a grievance or many grievances, they become a walking grievance. And there are people, many who are, one could say there are grievances looking for a cause. And whatever situation, any, the slightest thing that goes wrong will add fuel to the underlying accumulated emotion, pain body, I call it, and it will feed that. It will look for th things that are wrong. It will look for things to be unhappy about. It will look for things to criticize in others. <laughs> That's, so the egoic state is the state of complete identification with the thinking mind. And so then you live with the burden of past and future. The future often is anxiety, because who knows what's going to happen to me. The future, of course, also promises hope. hope. Maybe things will get better, and of course, sometimes they do get better, until they don't anymore. So you have hope, you live with hope for, the, everybody looks for the future, for, for some kind of li uh, relief or liberation. I look to the future because I hope that my life is eventually going to work out out there somewhere. It's going to work out. I still have that hope. I'm going to make it. That's a weird expression. Well, are you going to make what? I'm going to make it. Yes, you can make it. What am I going to make? Uh, it means to, to arrive at some point of completion. And sometimes you do achieve things, which is wonderful, but ultimately what you are looking for through that achievement, it cannot give you. What you are looking for is something deeper. What every human is looking for is something deeper than the world can give you. The world can only challenge you, give you challenges and adversity so that you awaken. The world cannot, as I said, it cannot make you happy because it's not here to make you happy, but it has another purpose. It is here to make you conscious. That's the, how it operates. Also, that means whatever arises in the present moment is just right for this moment, for you at this moment. 
But if you are stuck in the mind, the egoic mind, then you will completely ignore or even continuously dislike the present moment. And, and that is an amazing way to live. It is dreadful. But millions still live like that without knowing it unconsciously. They live for the next moment until they get they're very old. Then they know there's not much time left. Then they, the past becomes more and more important. The heaviness of the past. Oh, oh. <laughs> so living for the next moment is for most people unconscious and quite normal. They live hoping that at some point they are going to achieve fulfillment. And little fulfillments come here and there. And there's nothing wrong with that. It's wonderful when you achieve things. Uh, it's even wonderful when you fall in love. Enjoy it. Falling in, it's not going to last, but enjoy it. <laughs> so that's great. It's not but there's always, I've met in the, fortunately been able to meet over the years quite a few people who are in the eyes of the world highly successful. <clears throat> they've got, got everything, they've got fame, they've got money, they've got everything, they've got their private jets, they can go anywhere at any moment, can have anything, any pleasure. <laughs> and they've told me that after, when, after they achieved fame and fortune, they were, there was an initial time period when there was elation and they were on a continuous high, but then gradually more and more they, ex they experienced a very deep low in their mental emotional state, including depression and wanting to, to not wanting to live anymore. They had everything. But and, and some had to go to drugs to make life bearable, had everything. It wasn't enough. It wasn't enough. And then you can't fool yourself anymore when you have everything. You can't fool yourself. When I achieve that, I'll be happy. No, you have achieved everything, but you're not happy. <laughs> so the worst thing is, would be for you to achieve, to get everything that you want. And then you can't fool yourself anymore and, and look to the future for some fulfillment. And that's really dreadful. So, that is the, the human condition. And it all is connected to who you sense yourself to be, your identity. Your identity as who you are. Your sense of self. That is the foundation for your life. Your sense of self. And everybody is concerned with identity. When from childhood onward, the identity becomes very important. Of course, every human needs shelter and food, uh, sustenance, shelter. And one can say almost the next thing, well, the next thing is, as a human grows up, needs some kind of um, love or affection. But that's already bound up with identity. Because if you don't get love and affection, then you already have a deficient sense of self that developed in early age. Um, the, so identity refers to your sense of self. And where, where does your sense of self come from? What, what does it mean to be you? And usually, most humans, especially those who are not awakening yet, they look to their sense of identity through a narrative that is connected to their past. So that's, I call that sometimes the story of me. So everybody has the story of me. I call that, uh, it's, well, it's a narrative. And you, people call it, this is an interesting expression, they call it my life. So you think about my, my life, let me think about that. Hmm, well, it's a mixture of good and bad. It's been all kinds of weird things in the past. And certainly, almost everybody says it didn't quite go the way I had imagined it to be when I was 18 or 17. 
uh, and so many people have a feeling something went wrong somewhere. It's not, uh, uh, but strangely, many people have the feeling they haven't started to live yet. Uh, it's almost like I'm still, I'm hoping at some point I'm going to start living. Soon. <laughs> I'll start, I just need to meet the right person. I just need to get that job. I just need to find this or that possession, or if people would only recognize my words, or one recognition of one kind. It's an unconscious process. The, the longing, my life hasn't actually started yet. And some people have that throughout their life until finally they are surprised that they reach retirement. And they still, but just maybe a few years before retirement, you can look to your retirement as the liberation. Then I can start living. Now I know. When, I'm re when I retire, then I'll, I can start living. Okay, two more years, one more year, six months, one, and then the moment comes, <laughs> you sit in your office, and the clock reaches five o'clock, it's my last day. And then off you go. <laughs> and the first few days and weeks are great because you go, to the golf course and, and then sit around. If you have sufficient funds, you can have your cocktails. You may not have sufficient funds these days, so that's another problem. And so a few weeks pass and you sit there and then you take a trip and you come back. And then you move to a better climate because you don't, you, let's move to Florida, okay. Uh, and then you sit in Florida, just looking at the sun, and then they play another game of golf. And then a kind of fatigue sets in, and then their mind says, and now what? And nothing. Who am I now? I had this title, I had a job description, I was the vice, the vice president of this company, or whatever. And now I'm no longer a vice president. And a great part of my identity was derived from the concept of vice president of the company. And suddenly the concept has dissolved and who am I now? Without that, well that's weird, I get this weird feeling of not being nobody anymore. And so you're retired. And it's a strange thing that um, it is not uncommon for people to uh, to start to die uh, uh, just two or three years after retiring because there's nothing there anymore to li to live for. They they were looking towards retirement for some kind of uh, solution, but that's not it. So it's not. Uh, Everybody is looking where it cannot be found. It cannot be found in the future. That what you're looking for cannot be found in the future because, don't tell anybody, but there is no future. There is no future. There just seems to be a future. How, how can you say that there is no future? Obviously there's a future because I'm going to have dinner later. <laughs> And tomorrow I faced with, I have to meet that awful person again. That's, <laughs> how can you say that's not, okay. Um, in your immediate experience of life, have you ever experienced the future? Let me think about that. Um, actually, no. But, but haven't you always thought the future was a, more important than the, than the present moment, and do you, you, treat it the, do you treat the present moment as, as only a stepping stone towards the future, continuously you are on your way somewhere, which is on a practical level, future works quite well, but on a deeper level, future is very misleading. So are we, well, I could say we are here for 
one and a half to two hours. I don't know how long, but is there? A, but are, uh, do you actually experience the one and a half or two hours, except as a thought in your mind? Ultimately, you experience this event as a present moment experience, not a future. There is no, you cannot experience the future. So, what we call future, although necessary here to function in this dimension, it's a necessary and very helpful thing. Sometimes people look at me and they say, oh, you, you wear a watch? Why do you wear a watch? I thought you teach the now. <laughs> and in fact, quite a few people have given me watches that they had specially made, it's, and it's, they say, now, 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 now. <laughs> and somebody else gave me, a, gave me a watch with a totally blank face. It has no mechanism in it at all. <laughs> so when you look at it, you say, oh, it's present moment. <laughs> no. Now, the reason why I wear a watch is there are two reasons. I don't like to be late and keep people waiting, although unfortunately I had to keep you waiting for two and a half years. But uh, I don't like, I like to be on time, and on a practical level, future works quite well. We met here because we use future for practical purposes. Otherwise, we, meeting here, we would have waited a long, long time to meet here accidentally at some point. <laughs> One day, accidentally, we will all come together here. It, it could be maybe half a million years, and then finally, here we are. Because, so there is a paradox. On one level, you cannot deny the existence of time, certainly. In fact, on that level, where you cannot deny the existence of time, you also find that Time is, on the, first of all, it, it gives you the possibility of, of growth and development, which is wonderful. It gives you a, that possibility on this horizontal level, I call it. On the horizontal level, time is, gives you all, a child grows, gets stronger, learns things, etc. And, and even, uh, spiritually speaking, on the perspective of the horizontal dimension, the spiritual awakening seems to take time. So time, on the one hand, seems like a good thing up to a point for in a human being's life. And then time becomes your enemy, so to speak, because it is like an illness that you caught at the time of birth and it, it's certainly it's going to kill you. <laughs> There's no doubt that time is going to kill you and me. It, and, it, and sometimes it does it in a, almost in a cruel way. It begins to erode your body, which looked so great when you were young. <laughs> like, look at a, a fresh Apple, uh, put it on your windowsill, it just exudes energy and it, it's shiny, even without applying any substances to it. It's shiny on your windowsill and there it is in its full splendor. And then you come back two weeks later, you left it on your windowsill and it's, it's a little bit less shiny. It's kind of, something is beginning to happen to it. And then you come back three, four or five weeks later, and it's beginning to kind of shrink, and it looks wrinkly. And if you leave it for long enough, it goes... And the same happens to your body. And the most beautiful body, this is the most tragic thing when it adds to a really beautiful body. And when you have a really beautiful body or very strong body, the ego loves that naturally, it's normal, it's fine. You derive a significant part of your sense of self from identification with 
body, body image. And then this gives you, for perhaps 20 years of your adult life, it gives you a sense of who you are. If you're a, a very a beautiful, and in addition to having a beautiful body, you might be so lucky that you, even your face is beautiful. They don't necessarily go together. But. <laughs> And you have a, a, a so you, the body becomes important for, for everybody, and even if your body is not beautiful, to some extent you identify, which means you derive your sense of self from the appearance of your body. So if it's beautiful, it gives you an enhanced sense of self, and that sustains you for quite a while. If you're really strong and beautiful, then that can become the main part of your identity is that because you impress everybody you meet either with your strengths or your beauty or both maybe the more masculine thing might be you have a strong body I would have given years of my life when I was 20 years old for having a great body I didn't I, I would if, if somebody had said to me okay you have to lose 20 years of your life but you'll get, you, you look like Arnold Schwarzenegger I would have said, yes, I'll do it. <laughs> I would be dead by now. <laughs> so I saw, um, we were at a place um, a, a few years ago, I remember seeing, I believe it was Sydney, Australia. It was beautiful weather, walking along near the waterfront. But just perfect temperature, not too hot, not too cold, a little bit warming up a little bit. Everybody was happy walking, and there was one man, uh, <clears throat> he was wearing no shirt, just, uh, and his, his body was absolutely fantastic, and he walked uh, through. The, he was the only person who f found it a little bit too hot, so he had to take off his shirt. <laughs> 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 And, and everybody, kind of some people tried not to look at him and others, others looked. Uh, and he arose a, a lot of envy, envious glances. And uh, some women were, I think, attracted. Uh, uh, so, and then others, Probably it's because the ego, when there's some super, perceived superiority in whatever level in another person, the, the egoic sense of self feels diminished. <laughs> so if you are a puny weakling like me, and you met uh, somebody like Arnold, you would feel diminished in your sense of self, if you were still identified with the body. Or if you are not particularly good looking and you meet and see a person, then you would feel somehow diminished. And this is how envy arises and how the ego then compensates for that by creating some kind of narrative that diminishes that person's value. Say, so look at that guy, he's probably in the gym six hours a day and there's not a, not a thought in his head, he's totally vacant. Or look at that beach bum there. You just again, you can quickly diminish the the ego seeks always some kind of through comparison. It seeks some kind of superiority, and it fears inferiority. It seeks superiority. So the the egoic sense of self is then derived from this image making in your mind, a conceptual identity, and it's never happy for long, it's rarely really at ease, except when it's taken a few uh, drinks or drugs, then the, you achieve some kind of self-transcendence, which is a spiritual term. Self-transcendence is to become free of yourself in the sense of egoic self, limited self self-transcendence, everybody is ultimately longing for self-transcendence. They don't know that. They are longing for it. And then all they can think of often is 
sub, the need for some kind of substance to take in, for example, alcohol or some kind of smoke or other things that are kind of quite destructive. Uh, in, so when you when you have this, have a little smoke of this, I think it's legal here now. Uh, oh no, uh, we are in we are in Washington. I was in California the other day. I don't know. See, so you have a little. Uh, you may notice that some a change happening. Your mind slows down. The egoic, the, the the mind which fuels your sense of self, the narrative of me and my life slows down. You can't think that much anymore about your problems. Well, I wanted to listen to this talk. <laughs> um, you can't listen. The, the, your mind slows down and you, after a few more puffs, you feel better. But why do you feel better? Because you have achieved a small degree of self-transcendence. You're not thinking about your problems anymore. You come to, kind of a bit more present, and then you go. You suddenly feel like a weight lifted off your shoulders. And you, some people again, they laugh kind of crazily when they tra smoke their stuff. <laughs> it's, and an outsider might think you've suddenly become enlightened, but you haven't. But you have a, had a little glimpse, a little glimpse of self-transcendence. However, it is not a direction of, uh, of true awakening because you are, at the way I put it, you are falling below the thinking level. You think less and less and that's why you feel happier. You feel, perhaps, feel a little bit more even your sense of being in the background a little bit, but you are moving in the direction of back to sleep, to unconsciousness, instead of rising above thinking to a state of relaxed alertness, which is presence. So, freedom from thinking is self-transcendent. It doesn't mean you don't think anymore, but you are no longer trapped in the dimension of thought which, which before gave you your identity. That is the identity where you mentally construct an image consisting of words and, and images that becomes you. You call it my life. And it's probably always problematic. There's no life that is not problematic. And people spend a lot of time thinking and talking about their lives. They carry a burden and they call it my life. Does that sound familiar to some of you? They, they, they walk with a burden which is their life. But where is that life? Where, what is that? Well, it's not your life. You call it your life. But the truth is, that's your life situation which it has a past and future. But your life is inseparable from the present moment. It can only ever occur, be experienced, happen in the present moment. That's where life is. In fact, life and now are inseparable. There is no life apart from now. So the, the my life is a narrative. And for many people, because they identified with the narrative, it is a heavy burden. It's full of regrets, grievances, and anxiety, and the burden of past and future. This first started, there's an, you may have heard in ancient Greece, there was a, there's a mythological tale of a young man. There's, also, there's very deep wisdom in mythology, uh, hidden in mythology. So there's a Greek myth of Narcissus, a, a man, this is where the term narcissism comes from. Narcissism being a, a, a particularly strong form of ego. Uh, so Narcissus was a young man, according to this ta mythological tale, who was extremely beautiful and he was very, very happy. He was just very, and one day, this was a time long time ago in a mythological past 
before, not only before we invented mirrors, but also before selfies. <laughs> so he looked suddenly, he came upon a pool of water, very still, and, or a puddle, and he looked into it and he saw for the first time his reflection. He looked into this pool of water and, and he saw his reflection and he realized that was him. And according to the tale, he fell in love with himself. I am so beautiful. I am beautiful. Suddenly, he wasn't himself anymore. A second self arose, which was an image self. This mythological tale describes the beginning of the human ego. When you, you, an entity arises that is an image, a mind-made image of who you are. <laughs> instead of being who you are, instead of being who you are, you begin to have a relationship with yourself. There is a split, a duality has come in. So then you have me and myself. And this is the beauty of deep, deep wisdom in this tale. And the end of this tale is not a happy one. He, be, he became very unhappy after that. He never had a moment of happiness again. <laughs> That's the beginning of the human ego. <laughs> and now many thousands of years have passed. And now, of course, this mental image of me has grown and grown and grown. So humans now live with this image of who or what they are, which build, builds up from early childhood. So the world telling you who you are, you're this, that, you identify with all. Identify means you take, you derive your sense of self from this, that, or the other. Possessions begins with a toy that a child called my toy, mine, it's mine, it's me, somebody takes it away. Oh, terrible pain, Be not because, it's, because somebody has moved this toy from here to there, but already there was identification. The child's identity was beginning to arise, a mind-made identity that is my toy. And dreadful pain already happens when that toy is taken away, although five minutes later the child probably loses interest in the toy completely. So it's the, the mind, the, the mental equivalent of toy, the mental image of toy that became part of the, the developing ego. And the toy becomes later, other toys come, possessions. Later the toy becomes your, your BMW or whatever toy you look for for your sense of self. BMW may not be enough because too many people have it. I need. Maybe a Ferrari will actually complete me if I just need to, uh, because the Ferrari is very loud, the engine is very, very noisy, everybody's going to look at me, and that the ego feels good. It feels enhanced. Or it could be that after you achieve the Ferrari, you suddenly come to a talk by Eckhart and you realize that was your ego, and then you say, okay, I'm getting rid of that. I'm going to, from now on, I'm only using a bicycle. <laughs> and then you get your bicycle, and then you see somebody else, this Lamborghini pulling up beside you, and you feel, look at that, that uninvolved human there. <laughs> <laughs> I am infinite, so in, obviously infinitely superior now. <laughs> okay, you can exchange one ego for another ego. This is the second one is the spiritual ego, can be just as strong as the non-spiritual, the materialistic ego. <clears throat> so possessions, attainment, abilities. I, even children already say. I can, jump, can I, I can jump up this wall, can, you can't do that, can you? Look, I can do it, you can't. Ah, the ego feels better, and the other ego feels diminished. Oh, I can't. 
nowadays uh, um, um, in some schools um, they want to get rid of that in order not to hurt anybody and they say everybody gets a trophy oh well I would have been very happy if that happened to me when I was a child <clears throat> I didn't get any trophies maybe that was a good thing I don't know so the egoic self then we now have devices that can amplify the egoic self um, the phone, I have it somewhere the, so you're not always over many hundreds and thousands of years people have already projected this image of who they are had a relationship with that image who they are often a love-hate relationship um, some people hate themselves I don't like my body, I don't like where I am, I don't like this, I don't, how awful way to live, I hate myself. It's much better to love yourself, so in New Age teachings, you learn to let go of this dysfunctional relationship with yourself, and then this is a good thing, it's much better to love yourself than to hate yourself. So, but you have to achieve that transition, not easy, if, if the hating yourself has been deeply ingrained, you may have to put little stickers on your bathroom mirror, I love myself, oh yes, <laughs> and, and everywhere, you are lovable, oh thank you, thank you, yes. <laughs> and again, this is fine, it's a transitional stage, it's not the final stage, sometimes in New Age things it's the final stage. It's a, it's a lovely transitional stage, but really it's the stage of uh, awakening is that you begin to let go of having a relationship with yourself so that you can just be yourself. And you have to be in the present moment in order to be yourself. And that is, you can sometimes learn by looking at an animal, with, the animal is at a pre-egoic stage. What we are moving towards or into is a post-egoic stage. Now the animal, like your dog, is pre-egoic. The dog has consciousness, but not conceptual consciousness. The, the, not, the dog does not operate through mental concepts. In other words, the dog does not have an opinion about you. Isn't that, that's why you love the dog so much. <laughs> and also, the dog does not have a relationship with himself or herself. Humans have, but I have not met a single dog that has a problem with self-esteem, for example. Uh, I have not met a single dog that has a problem with body image. Even the, the, the ugliest dog is okay. <laughs> because the split hasn't happened yet. The split into me and myself. So the, the dog, this is why the dog often is often joyful. And the slightest thing, you, uh, sometimes you go, you, if the, you have a dog, you go away for 10 minutes and you come back home. The dog acts if you have been away for 10 years. He's so happy, and the, the, the hap is contagious a little bit, the happiness of the, dog, the wagging tail of the dog. Why is the dog so happy? Because the dog does not have a self. <laughs> the dog is him, her, itself. The dog is, and then the tail goes, life is good. If the dog could say something, he would say, life is good. In the present moment, just give me my fault and then it's even better. <laughs> So the humans, they love to be with their animals because it gives them a little bit of, a little glimpse of self-transcendence because when they look into the eyes of the dog, they are not being judged. And that feels good. And you can sense, by looking at the eyes, you can sense the being of the dog. Well, now, the dog, what you really love in the, it's just an example, dog, cat, what you really love in the dog is not the outer surface of the dog, although it's lovely to the touch and all that, yes, but you know there is something that you cannot see 
that you relate to when you look into the eyes of a dog. That, that is the, the essence of the dog. The, what you love is actually the consciousness of the dog, which has no ego in it. It exists at a pre-egoic state. You love the consciousness of the dog. And when you look in the eyes of you feel a little bit, you connect a little bit to that in yourself for a few seconds. When you're not, you don't need any defense mechanism or anything like that when you relate to a dog. Although there are some humans with huge egos, I have observed a few, who relate to their pet through their ego, but that's another story. And that's a sad story. <clears throat> they have an ego relationship. I knew a woman who would, in the evenings, you would put food out for her cat, would go out, the cat would be in the garden, and she had the window open. That was a neighbor of mine years ago. And she would put the food out. And this woman had a very accomplished person, but a gigantic ego. She would, she put the cat, food of her cat out. And then if the cat didn't come, um, because cats have many things to do out in the garden. <laughs> uh, uh, and it was dinner time for the cat and she put the plate there and she was sitting there waiting for the cat to come. And 15 minutes passed, and then she said, okay. Then she would close the window, said, if she doesn't want to see me, I don't want to see her. <laughs> oh, my God. I... <laughs> she has an ego relationship with her cat. <laughs> so a relationship with yourself, that eventually is transcended so that you can simply be in the present moment, not, and let's go deeper now, so that in the present moment, uh, which is a portal into the awakened state, in this present moment, let's see who or what are you in the present moment without reference to any thought, without reference to any thought about who you are. Uh, that's an interesting pointer. In other words, what does it feel like to be yourself without remembering your past or thinking about the future, just in this moment? You don't need to remember your email address or anything. It's not necessary now or what you ate yesterday. Without reference to past and future, um, what does it, do you disappear or what is left of you without the memory, the narrative that usually do you describe as my life? Without that memory of that you need to revive continuously, without that, what does it feel like to be you? And I cannot answer that, I can only give it to you as a pointer and slow down a little bit as I talk so that you can perhaps inquire, investigate internally what, what it feels like. What is the most essential thing about your identity? Is, are, are you still there when you, you don't think about your life? Like now. Are you still there and what, what is that? I'm not going to answer it, and I don't expect a conceptual answer. Um, so the... That's me. Hmm. There was an ancient uh, spiritual teacher in India who his favorite meditation was asking his disciples to ask themselves, who am I? You can also ask yourself, what am I? Who or what? What am I? What am I? But don't answer it verbally, but feel or sense what it means to be alive or to be you. What am I? There's a, there's a gap in the stream of thinking. Then what, what is there when there's a gap in the stream of thinking like now? And in that gap, there's a, there's a stillness, yes? Um, 
there's also a sense of there's something there but it's hard to describe. There's a sense of presence of beingness and in that sense of presence of beingness you know that you are you know you can say I am you know th that without adding any qualifiers to it without adding anything to the I am it's the pure sense of being which is I am it's very peaceful you need an alertness to sustain it just for a little bit without the alertness you will immediately fall back into the stream of thinking but it's not you don't use willpower to, to stop your thinking mind that doesn't really work so you don't hold your breath in order to stop thinking that does it might work for a little while but then you think even more it's like a boiling kettle hold the lid on a boiling kettle just alertness and so Jesus said as I said at the beginning and what I say to you I say to all stay awake in some translations it's in it's uh, translated as stay alert what I say to you I say to all stay alert that alertness is consciousness without thought it seems at first just to be an absence it seems at first like okay stillness one could say is the absence of noise in a stillness an absence it, it might seem at first as a kind of nothingness and yet if you if you stay with it for a little bit just a few more seconds stay alert then you can sense it's not just the absence of something it's also the presence of something but not so much the presence of something but the sense of presence itself not of something and, and so that is dimension of consciousness that is the fourth dimension of consciousness awareness or presence and you encounter that in between two thoughts or for example if you find it hard to stop thinking don't use your willpower use a little device use a little bit of help for example become aware that you're breathing you become aware of you're aware of the inflowing and outflowing breath and you, your attention moves with the breath into the body and out of the body and you, again your attention is there and again your attention follows the breath into the body stop for a second and out of the body you might it's helpful if you can breathe as deep as the abdomen although the air doesn't actually reach it but your attention reaches it and now you may realize that when you become aware of your breath which is a very ancient meditation method when you become aware of your breath you cannot be thinking at the same time <laughs> <coughs> That's why the Buddha recommended this meditation, which is called Anapanasati, which is the, the you, your, uh, awareness of your breath 
stops your mind, the thinking mind, automatically. The moment you start thinking, you lose awareness of your breath. So the Buddha said, his main teaching, I would say, is be aware of your breathing. <clears throat> he didn't say, stop thinking, because that seems too difficult. But awareness of your breath is possible, and automatically thinking subsides. What remains is a sense of alert presence. That is the, con the awakened consciousness, and that is inseparable from what I call the vertical dimension of life. It is the presence in the now. There is no time in this sense of beingness, stillness, alertness. There is no time, and yet it, that is essentially who or what you are. That gets usually mixed up with content, a bit like diluted. So this, this is the consciousness that is in its pure form. When you start thinking, it's still consciousness, but it, it takes on a form, a thought form. When you perceive things, it's consciousness perceiving. The perception is a form in your mind. Consciousness has taken on a form, takes on many forms continuously, and there is a, a bundle of thought forms in your mind that make up the main part of your sense of identity, and that is the, when you identify with that, and you don't know yourself, yourself more deeply in the vertical dimension, then that's the ego. But when you know yourself more deeply in the vertical dimension of the present moment, then all that that is, is the, that which makes up your personality. Of course it's still there. Your story, the narrative of you, unchanged, it's still there. The difference, however, is you no longer look to it for your ultimate sense of self. You don't derive your true and ultimate identity from the narrative of your, your life that you tell yourself in your mind. Of course it's still there, but you don't look to it for, your, for liberation or fulfillment or some future self. You don't even look to that for liberation or fulfillment because all that is the horizontal dimension of life. And that is time, what time operates. And from the millions of humans still, that's all they ever know. All they ever identify with is the, the personality conditioned by the past, problematic, problem-making, uh, continuously, often very dysfunctional, coloring everything that you see and perceive, get like a, through this veil of conditioning, you perceive the world and judge it through the veil of your mental conditioning. You don't see anything clearly. So this is the, the awakening into that Turiya, the fourth state of consciousness, the awakened state that all, all the ancient teachings already pointed to as a possibility. And it's here now, and it's more important now. It's not just something for very few humans to realize but something that becomes available to more and more humans, especially now that we are being confronted collectively with various manifestations of adversity. And it's not the end yet, fortunately. It's not the end yet. There's more to come. So, and that is the this gives you this dimension, the awakened dimension. This is where the resilience you find for living in troubled times. 
This is where you can, you are rooted in this ultimately deep and unshakable rooted consciousness in be of being. You are, you realize who or what you are beyond the personality. It's not, they're not ultimately two. The analogy I often use is the ocean and the ripple on the surface of the ocean. You are a ripple on the surface of the ocean as a personality, surrounded by other ripples on this horizontal dimension. Some ripples you like, many others you don't like. Some ripples are very unpleasant, a few others are great, you like them. And yet you're only a ripple and it's uneasy, and it's never quite enough, and others are bigger ripples and even waves some occasionally. Who is that guy? the wave, and life becomes unsatisfying, and at some point you meet another ripple who says, have you not realized who or what you are beyond your ripple existence? And you say, no, no, I haven't. Okay, then can you sense, if you stop thinking for a moment, can you sense the depths of you? Can you sense that there's more to you than this surface appearance? And the ripple goes, no, no, okay. And finally, the ripple, the attention goes deep as the vertical dimension opens up, and the ripple goes, oh. And then, of course, the ripple won't know what to say, it doesn't know what it is, but it senses something. It senses that its connectedness to something vast, infinite, it's the ocean. And it's not only senses its connectedness, it senses its oneness with that. And then it, that is self-transcendence of the ripple. And in this analogy, of course, you are the ripple. And this is, the essence of all spirituality is to sense that in yourself, in the vertical dimension of yourself, to sense it as yourself. And the moment we talk about it, it sounds as if it were something that you perceive this sense, but it's only because we use language and then every sentence has a subject and an object. So you could say, I am aware of myself. Yes, it's true, but ultimately that's not how it is, because the moment you've said that, you've created a duality, I and myself. But, but when you sense the essence of who you are, there's no duality. The awareness of yourself is the awareness. <coughs> so it's not aware being, being aware of something, but being aware of awareness itself, so to speak. You, can, you sense your own consciousness as consciousness. You know you are. You, that's an amazing thing. It sounds almost, it sounds so simple that it's impossible to realize, to know that you are, <laughs> not as a, as a particular this or that, it, 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 it's pure beingness, you know that you are, and you can sense that you are. That is such a, a liberation and such a wonderful, ah. And then you realize there is a depth to who you are that far transcends who you are as a personality. That's, and that, that is, in some spiritual traditions, that is called liberation. And you can see why it liberates you from yourself. Jesus also used the term salvation. You can use salvation, you can use liberation. <clears throat> um, so, this is the, once you have a glimpse, it's your mission to invite that 
dimension into your life more and more. Not just doing the meditation. Meditation is good if you have a meditation practice, if you meditate rightly, and many people don't meditate rightly. The mistake that can easily creep into meditation is you meditate in order to achieve a particular goal. Or you have a future self of an, an awakened master and you want to achieve that. And therefore, you have the idea that you are doing a meditation in order to get somewhere. That's always very hard to get rid of this mind pattern because everywhere else it operates. You always do something in order to achieve something. And in order to achieve something through your doing, you need time. For everything you need time. Even make a cup of tea, you need time. And this doing idea can easily come into the idea of meditating. So you're doing it in order to get somewhere. So you bring future time into your meditation unconsciously without knowing it. Whereas meditation, true meditation, is not a doing, but it's the realization of being. And there's no time in being. Simple realization that you are. This is why I... Some techniques are fine. Eventually, every technique you have to let go. Like a raft. Buddha, Buddhism has a, the image of a, the analogy or the story of a raft that you use to cross a river. You use a raft to cross a river. When you've crossed the river, you don't take up the raft and carry it around with you. So the raft is a technique or the teaching that can take you there, perhaps. But once you're there, you realize you don't need it. So whatever technique you use in meditation, eventually it is to be transcended. Or you can transcend it right now without any technique. This is why I don't call this a meditation. Because if I, it's, again, I love meditation, but there's another possibility, and that is uh, any given moment to, to, to invite this uh, awareness into your life, this dimension to, to see there is a possibility of awakening, simply realizing that you are in this moment, and so that you, awareness of awareness, the realization of being. And in that, then, as you are, our, this deepens, again, this is time, to talk about something timeless, and that becomes your identity, the being, not the personality or any achievement or whatever it may be in your past or future. That's fine. You manipulate, you hold, you, you, you handle your life consciously. It will actually improve when you are rooted in the, in the unconditioned consciousness, because that's what it is. Then if you are rooted in the vertical dimension, things begin to actually also improve in the horizontal dimension, because that consciousness flows into your life. Not that it ever becomes totally free of challenges. The challenges continue. But the challenges will then only take you deeper instead of making you more unconscious, which is what they often do for many humans. <coughs> so the, that is, um, se there's an ancient word, <coughs> Self-realization, you can use that expression, that's who or what you are beyond the personality. And then that is what Jesus calls when the, there's a parable about him, he tells a parable about a man who builds a house and the house is built on sand. And when the storms come and the floods come, the house is swept away. And then there's another man who, before building a house, he digs deep, that's, that he, he digs deep 
until he reaches the from the rock which is deep and so he reaches he reaches the front after he digs deep and finds the foundation and then he builds the house on the rock and the floods come and the rains come and the storms come and the house is not swept away it stands this is an analogy about states of consciousness the state of deep connectedness with being the vertical dimension and the state of being trapped only on the horizontal dimension when life becomes actually suffering to use the term of the Buddha frustrating suffering and then you can resent it all and so on so this is the now your mission is to invite this into your life throughout the day don't miss an opportunity yes you, you still go about your normal activities but allow yourself to uh, become aware of the vertical dimension um, as much as possible it seems at first there's a current in you that doesn't want that there isn't the egoic self and they will tell you that this is not the time to be present you have other I've got so much on my plate I can't be present now but, uh, don't talk to me about this look what I'm dealing with here and, and you want me to be spiritual just I'll, I'll be spiritual when I'm when I've solved all that and uh, then I'll, I'll find a nice place in the retreat center in in Bali and then I can finally <sighs> of course life does not stop challenging you so don't wait have your life interspersed with that brief moments initially brief brief moments of spaciousness brief moments of spaciousness one one conscious breath is already something let's say you are you're on your computer, okay, one conscious press. You look away from the screen. If you can, look away at the sky or a plant, anything natural, or close your eyes. But if you close your eyes, then the, the, your screen will still be there. You'll still see the computer screen. Awful. So you look at one conscious press. A little bit of spaciousness has opened up. And during that time period, which in, if you measure it in time, it would be like maybe 10 seconds, whatever. But this, that is a little bit of spacious consciousness you have suddenly experienced. And you might even want to take a second conscious breath. Follow the breath with your attention. And maybe even a third. Although your mind says, I don't have time for this. But it's only one minute. So don't believe every thought that comes in and says, I, I have to deal with this first. No, I have to do this first. I have to do... That's another, another parable in the Gospels where the, 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 you're invited to a wedding feast. People get invited to a wedding feast and everyone says, let me do this first. First I need to sell my cattle. No, I need to do this first. Let me do this first. There's always something. Don't believe your mind when it says, not now, can't do it now. There's nobody who does not have one minute to, to be aware of their press. Unless it's an emergency. You have to get to the hospital now, okay. Get into your car every time. I would recommend you close the door and stay. Just a moment of spaciousness. I suggest half a minute to one minute, but don't measure it, just feel it. So, okay, I'm going to do one minute now. <laughs> and then you're just internally already trying to get to the end of it. You have to be, be there. Anytime you're waiting for something, be present. 
use, if you cannot just be present, that this ability may arise a little bit later, when you can just uh, decide, so to speak, not the right word, to just be free of thinking, but just be aware. So that comes a little bit later, just the ability to just have that space. Um, somebody asked me some years ago, what's your greatest achievement in life? And I said, well, my greatest achievement is I, I don't think when I don't have to think or don't want to think. I don't need to think. That's my greatest achievement. But it's not really an achievement, is it? It wouldn't get me a job. <laughs> uh, I'm applying for a job in my uh, um, uh, what you call CV uh, resume. Um, can be free of thinking. <laughs> so it's not. It's not an achievement, again, it would be a misperception to call it an achievement, because that discovery, this realization, that dimension of consciousness has already always been there. In that sense, it's not an achievement. I, I made it. No, you didn't do anything. You, you just became aware of being, which is not a doing. <laughs> it sounds like a doing when you talk about it. You become aware of being, not an achievement, because being is the essence of who you are. And to know the essence of who you are is not an achievement. And so, wow, that's... But until the, um, you're able to do that, it's not a doing, we just to talk about it that way. Uh, use the breath, there are other entry points also into this present moment, which is present moment awareness. Uh, another entry point is uh, through the feeling of inner body, the, the, I call it inner body awareness, that can be also a portal into presence. And that is very simply sensing the aliveness that is within your body. This is often can easily be connected to, to breath awareness because when you breathe deeply into the body you can sense down into the abdomen and you can sense there's an energy that begins, you begin to realize there's an energy there. It's not what you sense, is the animating presence one could say in the body, not, not the physical body. And that's inseparable, it's a manifestation of consciousness, the consciousness that keeps the body alive, that inhabits the body, the animating presence, the inhabiting presence. And you can sense it, and you can sense the inner body. From there, every cell of the body is alive. Many humans are never present in the body. So inner body awareness is another portal into presence. You can, you can either start with breathing into the ab as deep as the abdomen and then feel the energy spreading from the abdomen into the rest of the body. It's always been there, but now you sense it. It's, and then you get a global sense of aliveness throughout the inner body, and that becomes your portal into presence, and it becomes an anchor for presence too. And after a while, perhaps the body image disappears and there's just presence remains. So these are closely connected, the breath awareness and inner body awareness. And they're all connected. If you have one, the others automatically come in also. Another entry point, highly, highly to be recommended, is <coughs> sense perceptions. So when, when, you're, when you come into the present moment, the first thing you may become aware of is the world that surrounds you. In other words, you become more aware of your sense perceptions, visual, auditory, and alertness arises. So the alertness is there behind the sense perceptions. You're more aware of any sounds you hear, whatever you see, you look around, you listen. Perhaps other senses are involved too. If you're out in nature, perhaps you can feel 
the air a breeze on your skin or the warmth of the sunlight on your skin. Perhaps there's a scent, especially out in nature, whatever you can smell. So uh, sensory awareness can also be an important entry point, but it only works if you let go of uh, interpreting what you perceive. And that's not that difficult because interpreting is a habit, a deeply ingrained mental habit. Whenever you look at something, you immediately have to call it something. And it's not necessary. You can actually more deeply perceive things more clearly, more deeply, at a deeper level, sense the aliveness that's in everything. If you don't interpret, label mentally, compulsively. So to here and now, as I talk about it, practice here and now, you see the totality of this room. You, you, perhaps a word may arise, beautiful, but you don't need to interpret it, just take it in, just be the, be the awareness for the sense perception, instead of labeling it. Be the awareness. So you become like a, like a little child that looks at the world for the first time. That's perhaps why Jesus said, be, you have to become as little children, otherwise you cannot enter the kingdom of heaven. Because a little child hasn't got the conceptual knowledge, the, con the mental concepts yet to... So you, and you need an alertness to sustain it for a little while. It doesn't have to be long. It's a beautiful spiritual practice, easier in nature than in the city, because in the city everything is made by the human mind, cars, buildings, and so on. Although you might have a bit of sky or a tree here and there, that's good. But it stimulates the mind much more, city landscape. Once you are more the presence, the power, so to speak, has grown in you, then you can be in the middle of a city and also be in that state of pure awareness. But first of all, in nature it's easier, quite a bit easier. You go out into nature, sky is beautiful. I love sky, the changing sky. I love weather, all kinds of weather, and to actually really perceive the weather, the changing weather, doesn't matter what it is. Uh, soon you'll have opportunity living in this city to experience uh, a lot of wet weather and <laughs> this, uh, uh, you don't need to, so instead of when you open up the curtain and it's, let's say it's the middle of uh, December or it's already gone on to January or February and it opens one more time and then look at the sky and the mind might say, oh no, not another rainy day. You've labeled why not open the curtains and just look with now no judgment, no interpretation. It's a spiritual practice in itself. So sense perception, and then you perceive more deeply and you know things non-conceptually. If you look at a flower or a tree, choose occasionally choose one tree, and I hope this doesn't sound too kind of new agey, but this, uh, it's beautiful. You look at a tree and give it attention. Just give it some attention. You look at the slides of movement, the quivering leaves, and there's a slight breeze. And it's alive. There's an aliveness there that is hiding behind the surface appearance of tree. You can sense its even the tree has a sense of being, as you can sense its being deep, more deeply than you could ever sense it if you were labeling it mentally. Well, there is a time for labeling things too when you communicate and so on. It's useful. You need to have both. The conceptual, the conceptual knowledge is helpful and necessary in this world, but if you're confined on the level of concepts, then you are trapped there. You're trapped in the horizontal dimension. You can't, you're continuously conceptualizing. The deeper connectedness with life is missing. So it, it creates a continuous sense of separation. So you need both. 
I emphasize <clears throat> this non-conceptual knowing that is part of being present. And I recommend that you, when you experience new things, there are always two ways of experiencing. Perhaps you started, if you started traveling again, let's say you go into some unknown place and there's a beautiful building, let's say you go into a temple or a cathedral, ancient cathedral somewhere, and how do you experience it? You experience it through learning about it, which is one way, There's nothing wrong with it. You can hire a, a guide come that is a, a recording that takes you through the cathedral and explains everything, fine. Or you can walk around with your, with your phone and see, look for photo opportunities for this, 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 or yourself there and, and there. That's me there and that's me there and there's another me there. <laughs> or, or you can also experience it by just entering this magnificent, let's say it's a magnificent building or temple or cathedral. You can enter and you go, wow. Wow, wow, that's a nice word. Wow. And then you walk around, take in the entire energy field of it and the beauty of the various things that you see, and you sense the totality of this room, as an, and then you come out of it, and conceptually, you, you know nothing, but yet you have experienced it very deeply. That's another way of being there. And if you can, after that, you go through one more time and learn about it conceptually. And if you have even more time on the third day, you go in and then you will have learned about the history of this place, etc., etc. And also, if you have the ability to experience it beyond concepts, and you can be in both worlds at the same time, where you know things, but in between the knowing, there are always spaces of pure awareness. So you can interpret things and know things about it, but not confined to that. You can also experience it more deeply. You need, it's a vital to have these two dimensions in your life. Otherwise, and I emphasize, of course, the non-conceptual because the entire world is lost in the conceptual. The entire world is lost in conceptual identities, conceptualizing everything, manufacturing identities for other people, judging concepts, not being able to relate deeply beyond the conceptual personalities. All that is a huge... Um, limitation in our lives to be just trapped on that level. We need both, of course. So you can look at a flower. It's, it's unbelievable, but there's so, there's so much there, and that goes beyond what you see. There's something, and again, it also goes beyond concept. When you call a tree, whatever the tree is, it's an oak tree, Usually, then you you have the illusion that you really, you now you now you know what it is. It's an oak tree. Okay, now let's go on to the next thing. What tree is that? Oh, that's that. That's a that's a Douglas fir. Okay, Douglas fir. Okay, what's the next thing? That's, so you never. It gives you the illusion that you know what it is when you have attached a label to it. But that's really you, uh, there's a possibility of relating to it at a deeper level. And then we find a completely different relationship to nature, where you relate nature at a much deeper level than just the conceptual. And that needs to be awakened, it's part of the awakened consciousness, to realize that connectedness with nature and the, the sacredness of nature. The sacredness, and sacredness is not something you would hear very often these days. And sacredness is not something that can, one can easily define. You might, the conceptual mind asks, what do you mean by sacredness? You cannot uh, know what sacredness means unless you uh, have at least a glimpse of sacredness. And you can have a glimpse of sacredness when your mind stops 
and you become present and even here when you become present of this spaciousness in this room you become present of not only what's in this room but you become aware of the the space of this room and so there's an entire the sense of presence is not only within it's also without there's a presence here that you the mind cannot even know of it it can't interpret it but there's a it is yes it's a little bit mystical but it's it is vitally important to have access to that dimension in your life vitally important and this is I don't know I don't usually I used don't use that word very much because it's so many misconceptions and around the, the word God but in a deeper sense you could say that presence is the presence of God not the traditional authority, authority figure in the sky but something that pervades a vast intelligence that pervades the entire universe and that is also the essence of who you are the consciousness of you I, I call that the emanation of the light of God it, it, that brings what that is the consciousness that you are and so when you know yourself as consciousness then that is in uh, theistic terms is the beginning of God realization not that you are God as this little thing but you can you can feel your connectedness to something vast and that you are actually carried by it and you're only temporarily a ripple on the surface of existence but in essence you are the ocean and that is a liberating realization that who you are in your essence thank you thank you thank you Is this what is called a meditation? Maybe it is. Natural meditation. Sitting quietly. There's an ancient Chinese saying from Taoism. <clears throat> I'm not sure how to pronounce it. It's something like Wu Wei, which is translated as sitting quietly, doing nothing. One of the highest virtues in Taoism. Sitting quietly, doing It means rooted in being and aware while you sit quietly doing nothing rooted in being the Tao and being aware there was a French philosopher perhaps it was Pascal or somebody like that a few hundred years ago and he said more or less all the troubles of humanity um, can be traced back to a person's inability to sit quietly in a room <laughs> so as you go back into your regular daily life hopefully the retreat does not come to an end but remains with you and within you the essence of the retreat is not the physical location but a state of consciousness
transcendent state of consciousness. Your task is to live, one could say, in both worlds or both dimensions at the same time. Occasionally you may lose yourself in the worldly, horizontal dimension, the doing realm, the thinking realm. And usually when that happens, you will notice dysfunctional, unpleasant inner states arising very quickly, anxiety, fear, anger, irritation, resentment, trouble. And if you're in that state and then are disconnected again from the transcendent, the being dimension, the other dimension, then that's the unconscious state, and if there is no trouble, you will create it. That's what humans do. Troublemakers. <laughs> Both on an individual level and collectively. If you want to learn a lot troublemaking collectively and watch the news, <clears throat> as much as possible. Have the main focus of your attention in your daily life in the present moment. The rest of your attention, so that's the, the main focus, here's this. The rest of your attention is where you want to go to, your, whatever task you're engaged in has a certain purpose. The purpose is you want to finish the task, then it has achieved its purpose, and that's here. And that's in, the, in your peripheral, the peripheral vision of your consciousness, that's where you want to get to. And this is what you're doing in order to get there. And your main attention is not where you want to get, and in the meantime you're just doing it in order to get there. You can see how that already creates an inner stress. I'm here, but I want to be there. That's the normal way of living, is this, the main part of people's attention is there, but in the meantime they are here, where they don't really want to be rather be there, as shown in famous stickers on bumper stickers on cars which say something like, I'd rather be fishing. <laughs> <laughs> when I visited Ram Das, the spiritual teacher who has now passed away, he lived on Maui, <clears throat> On his car I saw a bumper sticker which said, I'd rather be here now. <laughs> <laughs> That's a good teaching on a bumper sticker. <laughs> so your, your attention is and this is a reversal almost of how you must normally, usually live. It's the opposite. And so th 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 that is in itself already a shift in consciousness. And then of course you're also aware of the past, the certain things that, you, that may have relevance in the present. Um, that's fine. So peripherally, past and future, Usually future is the more important because you're moving towards that. And here's the central vision of present moment. In the present moment, you're either actively doing something or you are 
more passively perceiving something. You're there as a an observer, or you're just there, not actively doing, but simply um, perceiving. That could be when you travel back from here already, you might be sitting in a car. If you're driving, you're doing something. There it's particularly important to be present. <laughs> uh, or you might be sitting on a plane, and this is a good opportunity for be, being the, you go into the witnessing mode. There's nothing in particular to do unless you get out your laptop and start doing. That's fine. And sometimes situations arise that are problematic. That's quite normal in life. They, they, they are challenging rather than problematic. And then you, you face the challenge. You look at it, so to speak, not necessarily visually. But you give it attention. This is a challenge. Instead of unconscious reactivity, the challenge is your flight is cancelled. Oh. It's not one of the greatest challenges a human can have, <laughs> but some people react as if it were. And when any challenge arises, is there anything I can do to, to respond to this situation? Or is that something where I simply have to say, well, for the time being, I, I accept the way it is, because right now there's nothing I can do. I heard, for example, in, at some airports they're so busy uh, no, not sufficiently staffed people, when the plane lands, they're still trapped on the plane for two or three hours. It has happened in Toronto and other places. <laughs> That's a good opportunity for surrender. <laughs> Some people can't do that. They start screaming and shouting. Does not, that does not, no, no particular purpose, but they can't help it. It happens to them. So always the question was, is this an opportunity for surrender or is action called for? And that is some, a practice to, to get used to until it becomes second nature to have the, your attention in the present moment rather than elsewhere. And it usually implies you are aware of your surroundings. That's inseparable from present, being in the present through your senses. A more alert human being than a normal human being. But an alertness in which there is no tension. Often alertness in a human is associated with, with being tense. But there's an alertness without tension. But it's not enough to be just aware of your sense perceptions. That's a good thing. It also can help you to avoid dangerous situations that otherwise you just stumble into and you don't know how you got there. You're more alert of your surroundings. You see how animals in that sense are very alert. Because if they are not, they get eaten by other animals. So there, many animals have this incredible alertness, not the same as the human alertness, but it is an alert awareness of their surroundings that many humans don't have. They walk, they walk in the street, and they're, they're not really there in their, in their mind thinking about 
all kinds of things except where they are and so they're not here whereas the the bird on a, sitting on a branch or the deer that's stepping out of the forest and there's a field and the deer stops for a moment and and the ears, they're very huge ears they go <laughs> and it can hear probably a hundred times better than the human <laughs> or a bird on a branch sitting it goes like this and then suddenly it goes <laughs> <laughs> and of course there's no decision making involved when a bird starts, suddenly flies off uh, it did not think uh, I'm now going to fly off this branch <laughs> and I'm going to over, go over there it just happens there's a flow to life there's no mind there is a consciousness there, but there's no, no conceptualization at all. But when an animal rests, an animal also rests completely. It is completely at rest. Not thinking about my life. <laughs> I have to figure something out. What's the purpose of it all? <laughs> this is why it can be very healing <clears throat> to live with an animal. Yes, it can be quite a bit of work too, but it can be very healing to live with an animal and, uh, and to have an animal presence in the house. Dog, cat, usually. This unproblematic existence, except when the dog or cat are neurotic, which can happen, but there are reasons for that, You're usually connected to their early life, just like, like human childhood, when things go wrong in childhood, it leaves traces. So if, <clears throat> but usually dogs and cats in normal state is, um, unless they are hungry or want to go for a walk. They can be really rooted in being and joyful. The cat purrs, the dog's tail wags, and it's a joy just to see it. No problem with no psychological problems unless it spent too much time with neurotic humans. <laughs> it's a conscious practice. So an animal can bring you into the present moment just to look at an animal it's in the present moment. Uh, an animal that is, lives with humans may not be quite as alert as an animal out in the wild. Uh, because it knows that it's, it, the environment is relatively protected. Nevertheless, dogs are quite alert, and cats too. So be, you become, uh, again, the center of your attention always bring back into the present because it's, first of all, because it's all there ever is. Well, that's a good reason because it's life itself. Your life situation, yes, it exists in time, there's a past and a future as far as your life situation is concerned, but it's not your life. I wrote about that a long time ago, but it's so important. You can, people confuse their life situation with something more fundamental, more real, more immediate, deeper, which is called life. 
life situations, circumstances and events in your life. And most of your life situation is experienced in your mind. And then life situation is relationships, work situation, financial situation, living situation, all kinds of problem often problematic situations. It's very rare that all of these situations are working uh, smoothly and perfectly. Relationships, family, professional work, financial, environment, living situation, health situation, <clears throat> all working in harmony and perfectly. It can happen for short periods, but usually something somewhere goes wrong. It has to periodically, frequently. That's normal and that's good. But your, so your life situation always has an, this element of uncertainty, instability too, although you might not recognize that when you look at seemingly solid things. And your life is your experience of this moment, the only thing there ever is. And if you neglect that, you miss the whole thing. And then you reach a retirement age or old age and you say, was, was that it? And you, perhaps you spend your whole life trying to arrive at some point. And the points change that you want to arrive at, but you always want to arrive at some other point. So when your attention is in the present, yes, you're more alert, which is helpful. You notice things that before you didn't notice. People, objects, all kinds of things around you, natural things, and it's quite, everything is a manifestation of life all around you. And the deeper, uh, the deeper aspect of being present is, is not just being aware of your surroundings, although that's fine. You're aware of yourself as the aware presence. And that's, that is the secret, that is the key, that is not something that one can easily explain you can only experience it, what it means to be aware of yourself, not as an ego self, like having a relationship with a, with a conceptual, conceptual identity, that's me, I don't like me, or I love me, I'm in love with me, That's happened to Narcissus, and things after that didn't go well for him. Although you hear that quite often in, uh, in uh, certain people, they, they love, to, I love, I love me. Well, uh, um, it's a little strange. <laughs> who are you, and who or what is a me? Oh, I hadn't thought about that. I love myself. I hate myself. Oh, that's worse even. That's, the, that's not uncommon either. I'm not happy with myself. But who is that I that constantly says these things? Who is that I that has a relationship with a, an ima ultimately an imagined entity uh, mind made a uh, conceptual entity and this happened to me one night as I talked brief about briefly in the power of now when my mind said I can't live with myself anymore because the I was unhappy 
and I couldn't stand the unhappiness anymore, so I couldn't, I can't live with myself anymore. And this sentence suddenly, I looked at it, and I realized it was a very strange statement. I cannot live with myself. I, at that point I realized that there must be two of me here. I and the self that I cannot live with. That's an incredible, that was an incredible realization. There's two of me. There's the unhappy me that I cannot live with. <laughs> who am I and who is that unhappy me? This is a, almost like a koan, like a Zen riddle that you can't, hard to answer or impossible to answer conceptually, but I, I actually can answer it conceptually. I couldn't at the time, it took years before I realized what all, all this meant. And that moment, the, the consciousness that I am that was trapped in the movement of thought and continuously absorbed by the movement of thought, this movement of thought created the entity to the person, the unhappy person, the entity, the unhappy entity, the mind-made entity. And it was so active that it, it absorbed all of my consciousness, was always trapped in the movement of self uh, identified thoughts. Uh, so it was trapped in there and when the this strange statement arose in my mind what it and I looked at it and but looking at these statements a, a sudden separation happened between the consciousness that was trapped in the movement of thought who suddenly was able to release itself, to extricate itself from the being held, held in the womb of thought and stood back and there was I as the consciousness looking at the unhappy thought movement. <laughs> so it was a separation of consciousness was withdrawing from the, the dimension of thinking. It, and then, very quickly, thinking subsided. It was no longer fueled without the consciousness. There can be no thinking because thinking is not possible without consciousness. But a thought is consciousness that has, that has taken form. Whereas the realization of I as consciousness is consciousness that is prior to form or unconditioned. So I became aware of myself as consciousness, as the I, and the thought then began to dissolve. I, I, consciousness had been, without consciousness, it's nothing. <laughs> thought is consciousness that has taken form, and it dissolved, and then I was kind of felt like a, falling into some hole, but it wasn't fear, not fearful. Uh, the next morning I woke up and I was at peace, like a new, a new person or a new, no person. I was just contemplating things around me and everything was lovely. And I didn't know why I was at peace. And then I went around the city, on the buses, on bus, still at peace, the hustle and bustle of London where I was living. <clears throat> I was at peace. Why I was at peace? I couldn't understand it. It's, of course, now the peace that passes all understanding. I suppose that's several years it took me to understand why that's very weird. I did not realize that I was at peace for one reason, and the reason was that I wasn't thinking that much anymore. <laughs> Especially there's no, the whole movement of thought that is 
imbued with a sense of self, self-referential thought wasn't happening anymore. Occasional thoughts, yes. But a lot of the time there was just awareness, but I didn't have a word for it, I just called it peace. And so what happened then was the consciousness had withdrawn from its... Uh, his, uh, until then it had been imprisoned in the movement of thought and continuously absorbed by thought. And then it st stepped out. And that is, later I realized that, one realization came to me first when I talked to a Zen monk I happened to see a Zen monk and he, we talked a bit about spirituality and Zen uh, and he said quite simply, um, well he said Zen is really quite simple, it's, um, you stop thinking. I had expected a, a more complicated answer. but. <laughs> But then I realized that's actually happened to me. I stopped thinking, especially overthinking. I could still think, and some thinking, of course, still happened. But there were long stretches, but there was just a very peaceful awareness. And there was, and then what was kind of building up was, out of that awareness came a deep joy. Um, and that was very strange. It, um, not con not at, at sometimes the joy was so intense that it was incredible. And I was just on, sat there for wherever in my bench in the park for long periods. That really is what's called bliss. And it's just, oh. Um, the, the, that intensity of bliss that I had for, for two or three years, or the, I don't seem to have any more. I have peace. But the intensity of bliss, now I don't know what, it could be that when you get used to something, it doesn't stand out that much anymore and it becomes quite normal. And perhaps I experience a, is that bliss because I, there was still the contrast. I remember my previous state of consciousness, and then I was that one, who knows. <clears throat> but this is the main teaching then, all spiritual teachings come down to this, consciousness has to be rescued <laughs> from where it's been, it, consciousness has been kidnapped by thought, <laughs> It, it's trapped in that, and this is, your task is to, to free consciousness from where it's been trapped. It, in involuntary, compulsive thinking, that's always thinking that is imbued, we identify with, imbued, so every thought is imbued with a sense of self. <laughs> So that's the spiritual practice, is that the stepping out of the movement of thought so that I is no longer confused with the movement of thought. That would be the super, the surface I. So the cessation of thought and when you practice present moment awareness, and make that the main, the central focus of your life. Whether you are active or passive in that moment, it doesn't matter. If you are active, you give your attention to the doing. You, you honor it. You give it attention so that it doesn't become stressful. That sounds almost impossible, I know, to many people. If you give your fullest attention to the doing, it's not really stressful unless your mind project itself to some future point, or your mind, um, while you're doing something, th thinks of several other things that you really should be doing also at the same time. Of course, you can't. You can only do one thing at a time. Another definition of Zen that the Master gave is 
Zen is doing one thing at a time. <laughs> That's too simple, isn't it? Too simple. To... One. So you give, if it's doing, you give your attention to it. Then, as I said yesterday, high quality. It is it, a high quality. If inspiration is helpful for in that particular activity, it will flow into what you do because you're connected with the unconditioned consciousness, the presence. With some doings, you don't need any inspiration, you just need to get it done. You do the dishes or whatever it is, you don't need particular inspiration. Or the while you do it in a place of um, giving it your attention, honor it, rather than do something, but would rather not be doing it, but I'm doing it anyway. That's how many people live all the time. If you, if, if you, are, if you have a work situation where you work for, uh, your daily work, um, you need to re re decide, is it possible to honor the work that I'm doing or even if it's something simple and I, uh, may not be what I ultimately want to be doing, but right now uh, I need to honor the present moment. Whatever it is, in whatever form it arises, it's my responsibility is to honor life by honoring the present moment. And if your work situation is so dysfunctional that um, the, the, the environment in which you work, for example, or the kind of work that is demanded of you may be what is perhaps conventionally called soul-destroying, so that this is not a work that you could do and honor it because it's just very unpleasant. If it's that kind of thing, then you need to remove yourself from that situation. Even though you may be stepping into uncertainty, you cannot remain in a toxic situation like that where you, the, the, the honoring of what you do, do seems impossible because, for example, you might be surrounded by people who are um, in very negative states. There are many situations like that. But in other situations, you may be able to say, okay, this is not the ultimate thing that I want to be doing, but for, but for right now, this is what I'm doing, uh, and I'm able to honor what I'm, and I do it carefully and consciously. So you, only you can know wh whether you're able to do that, or whether you need to remove yourself from that situation. So, in order to seek something else that is more compatible, that is compatible with presence. Many, many things are compatible with presence and quite a few other things are not. So when you, your attention is in the present moment, let, let's say now we've been talking about activity, then the, the other many moments when you're not actively doing something, you're just sitting somewhere or standing somewhere or walking <clears throat> and that is a more uh, kind of passive uh, state of presence and that's very important too. You are, the, are you the observing presence at this moment as you're sitting on a plane looking out of the window on, or looking at the aisle if you uh, don't have a window seat and you're sitting there can't, now you might say, well, this environment on a plane, you maybe uh, you don't have a window seat. It's not particularly inspiring, and this after you've looked at it for a few minutes, you say, okay, what else is there to look at? Nothing, and then you might get drift off into something else. So it's important to realize there's not just present moment awareness is not just the awareness of what is around you, it is more fundamentally the awareness of yourself in that moment. 
so it doesn't, your environment does not need to be particularly interesting. And if it's not interesting, like as it would be if you're going out into nature, this wonders are all around you. But if it's not particularly interesting, like you're trapped on, if you're sitting on a plane or on a bus or wherever, or at the airport, in the, um, then direct your attention um, to yourself. This is the essential part, the deeper part of being present, is to 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 be consciously, to realize that you are, not to realize who you are, but to realize that you are, and that is the sense of beingness or presence, present within. When you are conscious of your surroundings, you are present without. Then being conscious of yourself as the presence is being present within, one could say. Both should be operating really at simultaneously. But there may be times when you may close your eyes and, and then you can sense very strongly that you are. In other words, I am. Not, not, you're, not that you are anything, this or that, just I am. That's the key. That's what God to, to, to called himself, herself, itself. <laughs> the I am. And as I'm speaking about this now, the important question is, can you, do you realize at this moment what it is that I'm talking about? Thinking has nothing to do with it. If you think you need to understand what I'm saying, you're wrong. You cannot understand it. It's nothing conceptual. Can you do? Can can you sense the beingness of you, the presence here and now, which you cannot define in any way? But there's a silent power, one could say, at the center of your being, there's a silent power. That's one way of putting it. It's, it's very still, but it's alive. So, the question, who am I, has two answers. The first answer, who am I, is, I'm a man or a woman, and I'm such and such age, such and such a race, such and such profession, such and such um, physical condition, all those things describe who you are on, on that level. So when you ask people that question, this, this is what they refer to as I. Who am I? Well, obviously, I'm a so-and-so old, I'm an old white male, in my case. That's my form identity, as people would call me nowadays. Maybe in the past they might have said a wise old man, but now I'm an old white male. <laughs> Not doesn't sound very good. <laughs> but what can you do? So, that's one answer, and you have different answers, of course, for that. That's who you are. But the second answer, who you are, comes from a deeper place. So if I ask you again then, who are you? 
but from the deeper place, beyond all the things that, that you just told me about who you are, gender, etc., etc., age, etc. Who are you? Now, when the, the second answer to the question cannot come, it can come through words, but that's not the real answer. You could say, I am the consciousness, and that is true. But that's still a conceptual answer. The real answer is silence. And in the silence, or stillness, there is the realization of being. Uh, so, that is the depth dimension, the deep I. You are both, but the depth dimension is a more fundamental, more real. The only real thing is that the rest is an insubstantial movement of a dreamlike movement of fluctuating forms. Another Buddhist monk I talked to, I must have spoken to many Buddhist monks, uh, uh, he said, there are no people. What do you mean? He said, no, there are no people, there are only karmic formations. <laughs> so now you know what you are, you are karmic <laughs> formation. <clears throat> that would be the personality, as I call it, with all its attributes. And of course, who you are on that level is determined by the past. You have come, even your body is determined, it goes back hundreds of thousands or a million years of people uh, um, reproducing bodies, one body after another, after another, and finally you appear briefly, and then you disappear, <coughs> and then there's the whole, the whole past, cultural past, genetic past, life past lives, whatever, all that makes up who you are. That's what he meant, karmic formation, that's your whole karma. Karma is the, the, the un, karma literally means action, but karma is the, the unconscious, the, con, the conditioning that you identify with as yourself. And that, and that is the unconscious state. Karma gets perpetu perpetuated in the unconscious state. So the same conditions you perpetuate in your lifetime and you transmit it to, to your children and you infect other people with your karma, people who are around you. That's the, uh, the moment you, you wake up and become aware of your conditioning, which is the person with its characteristics and idiosyncrasies and all the things that make up the person. The moment you become aware of yourself as an ultimately not really being the person, but the awareness that's behind the person, that you come to the end of, of karma in the traditional sense, of perpetuation of the stream of unconsciousness, the wheel, the, the wheel, um, that, that then a different dimension enters through that awakening. <clears throat> and karma manifests and is, you can, the karma ends in the present moment when you are able to respond to situations instead of react to situations. Because the way in which you react to a situation or respond to a situation is usually determined by the conditioning of your mind, your mental emotional conditioning. 
So what happens, what is much more important in your life, people think things that happen to me determine my life. But that's ultimately not true. The way in which you respond to what happens to you determines how you experience your life. So not so much what happens, but how you respond or react to what happens. That determines your, experience, your life experience. It also determines what happens next, how you deal with the present moment. In the unconscious state, you react to life situations and thereby usually it means any challenge you usually make it worse and you amplify it through your reaction. That is the case with human beings when you have a confrontation with another human being. It's the case with any challenge that anything that happens to you in your life, you contract an illness and then you react, oh my god, it's horrible. Your, your psychological suffering is often far worse than the physical suffering. And then you get old, oh my god. And for many people, this is that psychologically, they suffer more than physically. Uh, so, how you how you respond, to, and that if you are, I have to, we can use uh, the two words: react, respond. The way I use them is react means it's a karmically determined reaction. The, you 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 act you react out of the conditioning of your mental emotional field response implies that you are present and your action is no longer determined by the mental emotional conditioning of the person there is a higher intelligence one could say or i i call i call it wisdom but in other words, there's a high intelligence that can then operate in your daily life. A higher intelligence, which we could call wisdom. So it's not the conventional intelligence that you can measure in IQ tests. <clears throat> That's a very limited version of intelligence. There's a higher intelligence that comes in through presence that deals more intelligently with any situation that arises in your life. That's, that's the only possible way of dealing intelligently is by um, dealing with the situation through presence. Especially important, of course, in human relationships. Because there's so much unconsciousness that happens in the interaction between human beings, between two human beings and larger numbers of human beings and then groups of your collectives of your millions of human beings here and another million there and there. Or this, you can see when you look at politics and affairs and so what's happening in the world, there's very little intelligence, the way they deal with things. And you would be, you're amazed. How can they be so short-sighted and ultimately have to use a simple word, stupid? <laughs> uh, but these people have degrees, they have university degrees. How can they be so stupid? Well, they only activated a, a, a very limited version of intelligence that you can measure in IQ tests, that's not enough. You, you, I'm sorry, I don't want to offend anybody who has a very high IQ, <laughs> uh, or is a member of this, there's an organization called Mensa, I believe, so if you have a very high IQ, you can be a member of that, and that's good for your identity, of course. <laughs> so I don't want to take anything away from you, but, the there is that is what real intelligence it's a yes it, it's a form of intelligence but it's a re relatively low form of intelligence a much higher intelligence comes in through presence and that is lacking in the world there are occasionally you see 
the very rarely you see a politician actually you can see oh this person has some real intelligence and insights and it's usually not the people who are running things it's if it's a politician it's usually somebody who's been pushed to the periphery of politics uh, and from there he or she comments on uh, the, un the stupidity of what's happening in, uh, in the world. Uh, I've observed it, it's um, in different countries, a similar phenomenon. There are, okay, there are a few people here and there who ha you can see clearly where we are going and what we're doing. It is crazy. Because there is a lack of true this higher intelligence that is beyond the egoic mind and um, well at the moment it doesn't look good because we are going when, uh, uh, <laughs> I was going to use that weird expression about the hand basket again <laughs> mm. So when you can see it, now it's important when you look at the state of the world, um, it's important that you, don't, you do not enter a reactive mode because that will draw you into unconsciousness. If you also, if you watch too much television or current affairs, you will be drawn into uh, most likely unconsciousness unless you watch it as an uh, um, you watch it as an anthropological study of how, how misguided humanity can be <clears throat> so you need to stay present while you look at all this and see what's happening question may arise Shouldn't I be doing something to, well, there may be something you can do, bring some sanity into this world, perhaps through saying something, speaking out, pointing out something, not, cre not creating enemies. If you see people are, do uh, are deluded in what they say or do, to, don't make them into enemies and attack them and say, you are totally crazy now it's the it may be that the what they what they do maybe and probably is dysfunctional and stupid or the the opinions they hold may be extremely misguided and irrational so you can you can address the opinions that they hold, their mental positions, and point out the rationality and so on, without making the people who hold their opinion into enemies. So don't equate the mental positions that people hold with who they essentially are. You can speak out, maybe you can post something on one of the many platforms that are available, something to, that is sane rather than insane. But it may, perhaps you can post something that points out the insanity of it all. Some people do that, so that's a good thing. No, because some people may suddenly say, oh yes, that's true. So higher intelligence comes in, and that can then deal with situations and that's the end of karma. What humanity is doing now collectively is uh, karma playing itself out, the movement of unconsciousness. And so, as we mentioned yesterday with reference to individuals, we, you remember we talked about responsibility. Can you, can you hold a person responsible for what they do if they are unconscious? We talked about that yesterday. If they are 
in the grip of the, their mental emotional conditioning that is part of that's their karma can you hold a karmic formation person can you hold a karmic formation responsible for what they do <laughs> not really so there's a deep wisdom in what Jesus said forgive them for they know not what they do forgiveness means the realization that they are not responsible they can but I cannot do otherwise but we also and this also applies to the collective what all the, the politicians are doing and so on <clears throat> they don't they don't don't know any better they are in the grip of egoic reactivity and short-sightedness that comes with it and so on but as is, as is the case with individuals, although they may not be and are not, cannot be held responsible, and yet they have to suffer the, co the consequences of their unconscious. This is how humans ultimately awaken. They are not responsible, but they still have to, they create suffering for themselves and others, and through the suffering that created through the by the unconsciousness an awakening happens so in other words the ego uh, is necessary for the awakening to happen the ego ultimately self-destructs it has built into it a self-destruct function <laughs> the, that is ultimate wisdom um, uh, so that's also applies to the collective um, already if you look at the 20th century the wars that happened and the internal conflicts in countries that happened the countless millions upon millions killed by other humans what they did the terrible suffering after this is all the movement of unconsciousness they, they can't they don't know what they do and then they suffer, human, humanity suffers and suffers and suffers through the suffering, gradually, an awakening happens. So the, the, the ego's dysfunction creates suffering, and ultimately the suffering acts as an awakener. <laughs> it's just a question of how much longer is the suffering going to go, and what's the next stage, you may ask, in the, on the scale of collective suffering. I don't know, but it doesn't look good at the moment. <laughs> but you are here to represent, to embody the higher intelligence. I mean, hopefully you don't make that into a mental concept. I embody the higher intelligence. <laughs> it is true, but it should not become a mental concept that you identify with. <laughs> And so the sanity, you, you embody the sanity in a world that is still predominantly, one has to say, insane in many ways. Not all of it is insane, but a lot of it, some important parts are insane. So let's then see what the, whatever comes is, uh, may be bad from, from a, a, a lower perspective doesn't look good but ultimately everything that happens in the service of the evolution of consciousness even in your own life and if it's, it applies in your own life it also applies to the collective of humanity So don't allow yourself to get drawn into these dysfunctional states that are associated with ego, for example, fear and anxiety. And the other would be anger or despair or another very dangerous uh, dysfunctional state is called nihilism or nihilism which is 
the sense that it's all completely pointless. One could slip into that. There are many millions of humans these days who are in a nihilistic state where the whole world does not make sense and everything is pointless, whatever I do is pointless. They see the world, things are not going well in the world, what's the point of it all? It's all meaningless. Nihilism is particularly, particularly started in the 19th century when the notion that there is um, a purpose disappeared when Darwin, Darwin discovered the, the, the fact of evolution, but uh, unfortunately the misinterpretation was that evolution is entirely random, there is absolutely no guiding intelligence behind it at all, it's a random process. By chance atoms and molecules come together and after billions of years we appear and Beethoven's Ninth Symphony suddenly appears out of nowhere <laughs> through the coming together of atoms and molecules, accidental coming together of atoms and molecules. It's all meaningless, absolutely meaningless. Or as the Old Testament prophet said in the book of Ecclesiastes, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Vanity, the old meaning of the word is pointlessness. It's all pointless. That, that book somehow got into the Bible, I don't know how, but <laughs> it's wonderful literature, but not particularly inspiring, but great to read. <clears throat> so that's nihilism. The, the idea that there's no purpose behind, there's nothing, nothing behind the, the phenomena that we see, there, there's, there's no deeper intelligence. That's probably what Nietzsche was talking about when he talked in the 19th century, God is dead, that insight, and then he wrote about what that means, what repercussions it have. Um, the, and he saw, he saw that at an early stage, he saw that it would result in widespread nihilism. <clears throat> so the dysfunctional states then, fear, anxiety, anger, nihilism. <clears throat> that means there's still you don't see things clearly and deeply enough, then you, and you haven't gone deep enough within yourself, then you experience a, a fear, you experience anxiety, and all those things. It's, it's strange that I've observed in this country and some other countries, uh, the reaction to the pandemic, one could almost divide it, the collective reaction into two camps. One camp says, this is so very, really dangerous, we need to be very, very careful and to everything. We're anxious and fearful. Oh, this is, of course it is dangerous, but fearful. The other camp says, you're overblowing the whole thing, it's an overreaction, we should, all these things, uh, they just want to control us, all these things, be brave, just step out, go outside, all this, is, the mandates are pointless and, and controlling, and uh, you have these, so they, and they get angry about it. The others are fearful. <laughs> and then the two camps dislike each other very much. <laughs> And the fearful ones then get angry on top because the others are the others are not fearful, they're angry and they're angry with them. It's <laughs> so you represent, you embody the sanity in this world, you have to, and it's a challenge, but that, uh, 
That is the purpose of your life, so talking about nihilism, that's the opposite is the realization of how important you are, not conceptually, don't go there, how important your consciousness is in this world, how important it is for this world, for human beings to be sane and connected to the deeper or higher intelligence in this world. That is your purpose in life, no matter what, that's your deeper purpose. Your outer purpose is whatever you do in your work situation, in your life situation. It, it's, it, it matters to some extent, but it does not matter absolutely. It matters, but not absolutely. There's only one thing that matters absolutely, that is your state of consciousness, your connectedness with being, present, embodying presence. So in other words, what you do is secondary, but how you do what you do is primary. The how refers to the state of consciousness that underlies what you do. The what is secondary, the how is primary. So there is an intelligence, a vast intelligence that underlies the phenomenal world that we perceive with our senses. Even Einstein said that very strongly. He could sense that very strongly. Uh, I don't have the actual quote in my head. I wish I did, but he said, he was aware of that, he acknowledged that, that's why he had a connectedness with it and why deep inspiration came to him. He, yeah, he, he was a great thinker, but the, the realizations of theory and relativity, and so on, they came to him, that came to him. <clears throat> so there is a vast intelligence underneath it all that is also the, the intelligence that is, uh, operates in you, there's only one, not many. There's not my consciousness or your consciousness. We are manifestations of the one consciousness. St like rays of sunlight. And with that, let's just have a brief silence, stillness. If you have any questions in your mind, put them aside for the, for the time being. Tonight we will have a question and answer, well maybe answer session. <laughs> uh, just in case some questions have survived in you. Perhaps they have dissolved, that's possible too. Or the answer has come, not through me, but through consciousness your consciousness, not consciousness. <laughs> <laughs> mm. So the vital thing is to find the balance in your life between being and doing. Here we focus on being because most humans are suffering from a dreadful affliction which we may call forgetfulness of being. And because there's forgetfulness of being, they are lost in doing. They lose themselves in their doing. Or if they are not doing anything, Maybe they're hanging around at the street corners, 
then they are lost in semi-consciousness. They have moving below thinking, or they're trapped in very dysfunctional mind patterns. And even the thinking we could even categorize as that's also a kind of doing. That doing is not just activities that you're engaged in in daily life, but underlying this external doing, there's the doing of thinking. The thinking is happening and that's a, that belongs to the realm of doing. Although, in most cases, it's not you who does the thinking, you are not doing it, it is a doing, but really thinking is something that happens to most people. It's not something they do voluntarily as a choice. <clears throat> so you, thinking happens to you, one could say. So I sometimes say you don't think you are being thought, you are being created by the involuntary and compulsive movement of thought that is conditioned by the past and this involuntary compulsive movement creates a mind-made kind of entity, a sense of self, uh, uh, and this entity is the ego, and for most people that's who they perceive themselves to be. And so the, you live with this entity, you are, one, there's a good analogy one could use, that is that um, you as the deeper consciousness, are asleep and you're dreaming the dream of your life. <laughs> Occasionally you might wake up briefly and then you fall back into the dream state which is the whatever drama is happening in your life, whatever situations are happening in your life so there's a personality or a person that's a dreamlike entity. From the point of view of the awakened consciousness, you can clearly see that when you retrospectively, perhaps, as you awaken, you look back on your life and you can see how many unconscious things happened that you were involved in, that you participate in, and so on. And there was a, a whole drama unfolding, sometimes not so bad, and at other times really dreadful, and a kind of nightmare in some cases. And so if you go back in all traditions, whether you go to Western philosophy or Eastern spiritual traditions, there's often the comparison of unawakened existence with a dream state. Many Western philosophers also have questioned it, and this, is life a dream? And famous play by Spanish playwright Calderón de la Barca is La Vida is when your life is a dream. It's an ancient play. <clears throat> so the extent to which you are still identified with you as a person, you may still be trapped in the dream. 
It is possible that as you sit here, or wherever you sit, on stand or lie, uh, the awakened being is emerging, has emerged, partially or maybe f fully, <clears throat> and so there's a, you might be a hybrid between the the, the dream, the dreamt entity and the one who is doing the dream, which is the consciousness. You've probably heard of lucid dreaming, which means this is actual dreaming when you're asleep and you dream. It can sometimes happen you in the middle of the dream, you suddenly realize that you're dreaming. It's a very interesting point. Oh, it's all a dream. And then you might think, okay, I could do anything now. Let's, what can I create in this dream? In most cases, this doesn't last very long because the, the, con the awakened, the, wake, the state of wakefulness in conventional terms is not really compatible with dreams, so it's very brief. If you become aware in the dream, it's most likely that very quickly you wake up out of the dream, then it's gone. And then you wake up into normal wakefulness, which is another, spiritually speaking, another kind of dream. <laughs> now let's assume that this Right now, this room here, a man speaking, you sitting there with your history, with your person, conditioned, created by your history, and we could perhaps assume, could this be a dream? Could, could, it, could, could you be dreaming this? Where you, in the middle of the dream, you're dreaming of a man who says, you may be dreaming. Oh. And let's assume for a moment that that is the case, that you're actually dreaming this very place, situation, everything is, is your part of your dream. Uh, We don't know. It could be the case. It depends how you look at it. From a certain perspective, it is. From another perspective, it's not. Let's assume that it is for a moment. But even if it is a dream, there must be something that is more real than the dream, without which the dream could not be taking place, could not be. And this prerequisite is, of course, there must be a consciousness in which the dream happens. So it becomes of secondary importance whether you're dreaming this moment or not. Even if you are dreaming this moment, there must be an essence within that dream that is real. And that essence is the light of consciousness in which the dream images appear. And that light of consciousness is creating the dream but the moment you realize that light of consciousness within you, that's the same thing as awakening within the conventional the dream, the normal kind of dream that I just talked about, right here now, 
It, let's assume this is a dream, a dream-like thing. In many ways it is, because dreams evaporate very quickly. They, they come, and then something else happens. After this retreat, you might wake up the morning after and say, did I just dream of this retreat? Or did it actually happen? So let's assume it is, and suddenly you are become aware of something within this dream, if that's what it is, of something beyond, that something that transcends the dream, is not separate from it, but without which the dream could not exist, and that is the sense of beingness or presence of I am, of consciousness the realization that you are conscious, or rather, that's not, the language is very uh, deceptive, the mistakes can easily creep in the moment you verbalize something. When I say you are conscious, <coughs> it's not quite right. You are consciousness. The, es the, the, the essence of who you are is consciousness. If I say you are conscious and there's two of you, the you and the, and the consciousness, <laughs> So in the dream, you, if you suddenly realize that which is beyond the dream, by becoming aware, not becoming aware of something that arises, because everything that arises would be part of the dream, not becoming aware of any new f a form that arises as, in, as a thought or a sensory perception or an emotion, but becoming aware of awareness, which is not something. It's not, you can't say, there it is, I got the awareness, there it is. Oh no, it's over there. I just had it, but it's gone now. <laughs> so, awareness or consciousness cannot become an object of consciousness. Everything else is an object that arises in consciousness. But if, if you attempt to make consciousness into an object, then you're lost again. It's, that's, the, you cannot make consciousness into an object because consciousness is the very thing. If you're looking for, if you, let's say you're looking for yourself beyond the person, where is the real, the real me? Where is the real I want the being behind the person that I'm looking for it. If you're looking for it, waiting for an experience in which this thing happens, that would be very misleading, because you would be waiting for some experience. Fireworks, spiritual fireworks. <laughs> the ultimate vision, as you see in some ancient paintings of Christian mystics, and they go... <laughs> and you, you can't have that for that long. I mean, the vision is there. How long is it going to last? <laughs> so if you're looking for yourself, in the realm of experience or in the realm of manifestation, phenomena, object of consciousness, you can't find it there because the very thing or no thing that's looking for yourself is you. It's like a flashlight. You use a flashlight to find the flashlight. I'm looking for the flashlight. <laughs> <laughs> and this would also apply to God. You have to be careful when you use that word. <clears throat> You're looking for God. Again, can you find God as an object? in consciousness, an object that arises in consciousness. 
if God is an object that arises in consciousness, God must have a location in space or time somewhere. It must be, if it's an object, it must arise somewhere at some point. There it is. He is. She is. Whatever. But could it be that you are an emanation, an extension of what is conventionally called God, a bit like a ray of sunlight is an emanation that originates in this unbelievable thing in the sense-perceived world that we call the sun, there's a ray of sunlight that can reach down here. It emanates from, the, it's not the sun, it's connected to the sun, it's part of the sun, yes, but it's not the sun. How do you describe it? And that's an analogy here. Could it be that you, the consciousness that you are, is an emanation from a transcendent source? into this dimension and if that's the case then you can become aware as you become aware of yourself as the awareness you become aware of your deeper connectedness it extends in into infinity, one could almost say, there's a depth to who you are that extends to the very source. And you can sense your connectedness to a vast power that transcends who you are as a person infinitely, and yet is not really separate from you, transcends who you are but is not separate from who you are. And there is an evolution of consciousness in this dimension of space and time. What is evolving is the... can observe that the universe that we seem to inhabit is gradually exhibiting increasing, increasingly complex manifestations of consciousness. Even on this planet, you can see there's an evolution started from very simple life forms. And before that, there was just minerals or fire. It was a gradual evolution. Consciousness, more consciousness was coming in to this dimension. And more consciousness is coming in still. Humans are not finished. It's, humans are not a finished product yet. Because if they were, if human evolution had already come to an end, that would be bad news. then you could say there's something wrong with the universe. <clears throat> Consciousness, the universe is here to grow in consciousness. Why the whole thing nobody knows. You couldn't possibly understand conceptually, but you can only, you can sense that this is the case especially by looking within yourself. Many, the most important answers concerning the universe you can find if you look deeply within yourself because you are a microcosm of the macrocosm. So in this dream of this room, 
you become aware suddenly that you're dreaming. If it's a dream, let, or it, you become aware that it might be a dream, that it might all be insubstantial, which I kind of it is. It's all insubstantial. There's nothing that lasts very long. All the bodies here, <coughs> within a few years, and by, an, by a few I mean, let's give it, there may be some very young people here, but on, let's be generous and say um, 80 years. Let's be even more generous and say 90 years. Within 90 years, at the most, definitely less in the case of the, the man sitting on this chair. <laughs> Within that, all the seemingly so real and solid bodies and personalities attached to the bodies, or the bodies attached to the personalities, whatever, will have popped like soap bubbles and dissolved. And this is called, in Buddhist terms, impermanence. Important term used by the Buddha. Everything is subject to impermanence. It's fleeting, very much like a dream. So these seemingly solid bodies and seemingly solid personalities and everything seems so solid and important, and suddenly the thing pops. All the things that were so important. So if we could see a speeded up version of, on camera, if we could uh, speed up the time the movement of time and put 90 years into two minutes and these bodies you would see one body after another would pop out of existence and this one gone yeah. And then after two minutes, which is 90 years compressed, there's nobody left. Nobody. <laughs> where are they all? Where have they gone? Now, so in that sense, everything is insubstantial in this physical universe, the physical part of it. And so you become aware within this dream of yourself, not as the participant in the dream, but as the awareness in which the dream happens. That means it's a very significant thing that far of great importance that transcends who you are as a person. When you become aware of that suddenly, you are not separate from the universe. The consciousness of you is the consciousness that underlies the entire universe. And that suddenly becomes self-aware in you, through you. It be there's a point, suddenly at this point, the, view the universe obtains self-awareness. That's an amazing, amazing thing. It's nothing to do anymore with you as a person. The person was helpful. The person was the, one could say, the, the if you have a seed, the, 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 it was the, the person was the seed, and then suddenly the seed sprouts. Or another analogy, the person was the caterpillar, and the caterpillar was attached to its existence as caterpillar for a long time until it got more and more painful. Uh, it became more painful because the caterpillar was destined for something beyond, something else.
But for, for the life of the caterpillar, it became really unpleasant. I can't stand it anymore, the caterpillar said. Oh, I can't even walk anymore, crawl, whatever they do. And, and, and there's something very wrong. And then the caterpillar becomes interested in this, those last moments of transform, imminent transformation, becomes interested in spirituality. And, 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 Maybe I'm, I'm more than a caterpillar. And then suddenly the transformation happens and something opens up and this incredible thing comes out, this beautiful butterfly. But this analogy is not to be taken literally. It's an inner realization so that your identity suddenly shifts. You're no longer identified with a dream character, although the dream continues for a while, but you are rooted in a deeper dimension, which we could call the, the I am, the being of you, the human being. Remember what I said, the human is the temporary, the person, the being is the transcendent consciousness that then awakens in the person. So the universe, one could say, this is a, has been engaged in this dream and still is, but its destiny is to awaken and that doesn't necessarily mean that it's the end of the world. There's eventually th that comes too, but we don't need to go there. There's a, in the same way that you can awaken in a conventional dream, as you, the universe awakens in you, the consciousness of the universe awakens in you, then you, you can continue, continue in your dream, but no longer totally attached to the dream and whatever happens in the dream. You, you, the dream no longer determines your identity. That's the liberation. You continue, the dream continues. It may even continue beyond the death, so-called, of this physical form because underneath the physical form you are still there as a thought entity and an emotional entity that is invisible that is not physical, Every, uh, the thoughts within you are not actually f physical. Nobody can find them in the realm of physicality. No scientist would be able to detect any of your memories, for example. <laughs> the greatest surgeon could open your brain looking for you, but wouldn't find nothing that makes you you would this surgeon be able to find, including the memory of your grandmother that's been living there, and hundreds of thousands of other memories, that where do they live? Do they even live in the brain, or is, do they live in the cloud? <laughs> and then you, the brain downloads them when they're needed, That's amazing. <laughs> so this entity may well, especially if you've been very much identified with the, the dream character, then the physical form dissolves, but the psychological form, the, this entity, the, the, with the, this mental emotional conditioning, still has a form. And this form is still there. It hasn't realized anything beyond the dream. It hasn't gone deep enough beyond the conditioned consciousness that makes up the dream character. And then there would be an, this entity, according to many ancient teachings, and if you look deeply enough within yourself, you can kind of sense that that is the case. The entity 
seeks another physical body because it needs more drama. I haven't had enough yet. I want more sensory experience. There's a thirst, there's a Buddhist term for it, there's a thirst for sensory experience. It's not just on every level. And so you get involved in another, another dream happens. Now there are some people, there may be quite a few here, and if you ask, would you like to reincarnate again after, would you want to go through another one, another lifetime? Some people might say, yes, because I don't want to disappear. Well, and others might say, no way. I can't go through this again. <laughs> Just imagine another childhood. Oh. Oh. And so some, I definitely don't want to come back. I don't want to come back. But is that really, do you really not want to come back? Because uh, the next day, after making that statement, the phone rings and somebody says there's a problematic situation with your uh, stock investments and you get very, very upset. But yesterday, the day before, you said, I'm done with this world. It doesn't attract me anymore. I don't want, I don't need it anymore. I'm done with it. And then the next thing happens the next day and the, the world draws you in completely. You're not done at all. You get very upset about the slightest situations. That means you want to continue the drama. You're still at attached, attached, attached. So, so if you awaken in this lifetime, as you are, then the dream continues, of course, and for as long as the, the, this particular dream, as long as the physical body is here, it continues. <clears throat> and then there's a consciousness there, the, the awakening, the, there's an awakened, con the consciousness has awakened in you, through you. And that means the compulsion to reincarnate will not be there. You know that. How do you know whether the compulsion to reincarnate will not be there in you after the physical form dissolves? You can know that by, by self-observation in this lifetime, while you're still here. Is there in you the compulsion still to identify with every thought that arises? Now, that means you reincarnate, reincarnate means to take, to take a new form into your identity reincarnates into each form that arises. This is a compulsion to identify with rising forms, thought forms and emotional forms. So the Buddhists um, strive towards the end of the cycle of compulsive reincarnation and some say some say I think I may need another at least 25 lifetimes and then I'll awaken then okay that's you've got plenty of time then uh, perhaps not realizing that the reincarnation happens every moment in your life. The, the, which, because what is reincarnation? Consciousness identified with form. <laughs> so you are born into, every time you are completely identified with the arising thoughts and emotions, you are born, your consciousness is asleep and is born into these forms, thought forms. That's the compulsion to reincarnate. So if you're not free of these thought of 
identification, complete identification with thought forms, then there's a guarantee <laughs> after you, your body dissolves that the compulsion to reincarnate will still be there. And you have to go through it again. Another problematic lifetime of drama and suffering. <clears throat> So the answer, of course, to the end of reincarnation, the, the compulsion to reincarnate, is, must be here now. That's, you, you cannot file the end to this compulsion at some future point. It's, you're by observing yourself, whether, are you attached to every form, that are, every thought form that arises, every emotion that arises, or is there an aware space in which they arise? And you are that. That's the awakening. And then, this, as according to Buddhist teachings and others, uh, then as this physical form dissolves, the compulsion to reincarnate is no longer there. So you don't have to if you don't want to. <laughs> oh. But it could be that so the story goes, out of compassion for humans, you do reincarnate. You voluntarily accept the sacrifice and you incarnate in order to bring more consciousness to humans, to, to free them from the dream state, from suffering. Uh, not that you do it, but you bring, you're a bringer of consciousness and so you sacrifice yourself and accept another. And that would be, I believe the Buddhists have the term bodhisattva, is the term for those who voluntarily reincarnate to help others. <clears throat> and then there are others in Buddhism who are arahats, who say, no, I've had enough. They are free, but they disappear into other dimensions. Uh, they don't want to reincarnate as humans. They are a bit more. They said, "I can't. No, not again. I can't do it. <laughs> don't want to do it. I'm done with that. I'm done." Right? <laughs> so that's the the awakening within the dream. Then your life continues, but the attachment lessons more and more. The attachment, not just attachment to thoughts and emotions, they're still there, it's fine, identification with thoughts and emotions, but also t attachment to all the things that arise, life situations and so on. There is a spaciousness th that um, makes your life easier. You relate to things in a more spacious way, without the grasping, that you don't need really any form in order to make your sense of identity more complete, because you're no longer looking for a more complete sense of identity on that level, on the level of form. And then the world of form becomes a more benign and some quite often quite enjoyable place because you don't grasping, you don't need to hold on to particular forms, whatever they may be, situations, possessions, achievements, people, you don't need to hang on and incorporate them into your sense of identity, that's me, you identify with the possessions, you identify with the whatever it may be, and it's never enough, and things very quickly, the identity with something and suddenly it leaves you, and that leaves, brings more suffering. But primarily what you always identify with, yes, you could say, you, you, let's say you identify with a possession, it means you have more than most other people, then, then, then it works. Uh, so depending where you live, if you live in a very wealthy place, and you need more to, to give you a heightened sense of identity. Um, 
let's say you have a, okay, now you drive your um, Lamborghini, um, what are they, let's see what they're called, uh, Lamborghini, Ferrari, number, um, Ferrari, testosterone, no, testarossa. <laughs> Uh, test, testa rossa, testa rossa it's called. Uh, it's a very powerful Italian car. So you identify with that, but, or, or, or you have a private jet, even better. Uh, or it could be, um, you have a, a, a beautiful body better looking than most, and then you can easily identify, but that's me. <laughs> <laughs> and you live, you live with an image of, in your mind, and you call it, that's me, and it's projected outward. But whatever you, ultimately everything becomes a thought form, because even the Lamborghini, or the private jet, or whatever situation you identify with, like social recognition, or whatever it is, maybe you get, every time you, you tweet something, you get thousands of likes, and that gives you an enhanced sense of, of me. You have thousands of Facebook friends. I have thousands, nobody knows you, but they <laughs> And everybody likes you, you get the, these likes. And, uh, <laughs> but whatever you identify with, they're all, you experience them as thought forms. So in ultimate terms, you're not really identified with a car, because the car, you experience the car as a thought form, my car. You don't really know, that's another philosophical question. <laughs> what, is, what is actually out, what I experience as the external world, what is actually out there, how, to what extent does this correspond to the way in which yeah, I perceive what's out there? Is there a thing in itself, we lot of us ask, beyond our interpretation of our perception? Uh, so perhaps I'm dreaming up the whole thing, perhaps I'm, there is no, there is no Lamborghini, maybe I'm dreaming it, it doesn't make any difference. Even if there is a Lamborghini, it becomes a thought form, and ultimately you don't, or, or don't identify with a possession or anything, they are all experienced in your mind as thought forms. So the ultimate identification is always thought. <laughs> and then thought is imbued with a sense of self. And that is the delusion, when you're seeking for yourself in and through thought. Self-seeking. And that's what most humans who are unawakened, that's where they're looking for themselves, in some enhanced thought form of me. <laughs> Identity. They're looking for an identity in thought, a thought form. It might be perceived as possessions, status, or whatever it may be, but it's all, really, it's all experienced in your mind. That is the unawakened state. And we have technology available to us to amplify the unawakened state, to amplify the human ego. That's a, yeah, all these platforms amplify what was already there before we came up with Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, uh, many other names. Um, before we came up with that, there was already the human ego, had already existed for many thousands of years, and 
it all started, of course, with a moment of self, of re the arising of thought, the arising of image making in the mind through thought. That oh, that's me. That's me. The uh, the first selfie ever taken was happened in a mythological past in ancient Greece when a man called Narcissus, which is where, of course where the word, the word narcissism comes from, a, a mythological figure, Narcissus, a beautiful young man. It was a time before iPhones, of course, a long time ago. <laughs> it was also a time before the mirrors. They hadn't made mirrors yet. So one day this beautiful young man saw him, his image in a pool of water. And he saw he fell in love with himself. I am so beautiful, he said. Oh, and that mythological tale is really has a deeper significance. It speaks of the arising of a egoic consciousness, which is an image of yourself that you live with and through. You, you live with and through a mentally created image of yourself. And so the, the mythological story of Narcissus is that reflection, a reflected me. And then um, that is really part the beginning of ego. And, that's if the, and now we have um, selfies, so this pool of water, we don't need that anymore. We can continuously amplify our delusion by taking these photos and posting them into the world, and then that's me. And then other people confirm your existence as, a, as an important figure called Instagram influencer. <laughs> And then you, you have the power then to make thousands of people or hundreds of thousands of people as unconscious as you are. <laughs> Identity, uh, the delusion of identity. Often people ask you, oh, what do you do? So you have to give an answer. They want some kind of identity. I often say, I'm a writer. Because if I say other things, it gets too complicated. <laughs> I'm a teacher of being. That's, that's a very strange identity. <laughs> or e even worse, I am nobody. <laughs> and if you say that, and you mean it, because th there's some truth in this, but if you say that, and there's probably some spiritual pride behind it, when you affirm your essential no-bodylessness <laughs> with a sense of unconscious pride, because you're so spiritual, they no longer you no longer identify. And then I am no, I am nobody. I was never born, and I will never die. And what you have done, all this might be true, but you have, you identify with another image of yourself. It's a very spiritual one, but it's just as egoic as, as the one who identifies with the Lamborghini Testa Rossa, or whatever. <laughs> uh. 
souls you simplify I say I'm a writer and sometimes to make it even more simple then people don't ask any more questions uh, they, I say I'm retired I can do that now I'm old enough <laughs> And it's not untrue because I retired many decades ago f f from this externalized existence, so that's fine. I'm retired. Oh, okay. No further questions asked. <laughs> uh, I was walking not long ago uh, on my daily walk um, on a forest trail and a couple were coming in the opposite direction, the young man and his girlfriend, wife. Yeah. And he, as they were walking past me, he stopped and said, I know you from somewhere. <laughs> Where do I know you from? What's your name? I said, Eckhart. Oh, yes, YouTube. I'm watching you on YouTube all the time. And then he said to his girlfriend, he's a famous YouTuber. <laughs> <laughs> so I have a new identity now. <laughs> and now my ambition is all to I have perhaps I too can become an Instagram influencer. <laughs> All I need is wait for a different body. So hold your form identity loosely, because obviously everybody has a form identity that consists of many different things. It depends where you, what importance you give certain aspects of your particular physical, psychological form. Obviously you have a form identity. It always starts with the the body, of course, the, uh, to some extent, you can't get away from that. This form identity begins with the body. <clears throat> As you may remember when I talk about form identity, this, you have the dif uh, differentiate between form identity, which is physical form and psychological form, and essence identity, which is who or what you are beyond you, beyond the physical and beyond the psychological, you as the consciousness, the transcendent consciousness, which is there the moment you become still and you're still awake, you haven't fallen asleep, stillness remains. That is the beginning of realizing your form identity, but your, your, your essence identity. But your form identity, yes, it, uh, it varies from person to person. What, what importance to, to, could you give certain aspects of your form? Be, as I said, it begins with the physical body. And for some people, that's already a huge chunk of their form identity, is your, the, their physical appearance. And in some cases, it's a source of pride. So it, it's, it makes you feel special because relative to others, your body is better looking or stronger. <clears throat> or for many others, it's a source of suffering and shame because the body isn't good enough. It's not, it doesn't look good enough. It's, it's not, you compare, the ego always com it comparative in its, its, it compares its identity with others. So, and then you look at other, and many people, some people are made um, temporarily happy by their bodies, by identifying with it, and others are made unhappy by their bodies. <laughs> but in either case, it's egoic identity. You might think that if you have a beautiful or strong body, obviously only for a few years, 
then you begin to, if you are really identified with the beauty or strength of your body, then you're in for a lot of suffering when that beauty or, or strength diminishes, then you begin, begin to really suffer. Your, your sense of identity begins to crumble, no matter how hard you try to repair the decaying form, you can't really, well, you can spend a lot of money trying to patch up the streaks, <laughs> but you can't go on forever. And then, and then eventually, as it sometimes this happens with some very beautiful actors, actresses, actors, um, they, when they get really old and even the repair jobs don't work anymore, then they will, you never see them again. They live, live in hiding. It's very sad. They live withdrawn, don't want to be seen by anybody anymore. It's a very sad end to their lives. So the identification, now you might think it's particularly egoic if you have, take pride in your by the way, there's nothing wrong with if you be very happy if you have a strong and beautiful body. Enjoy it while you can, is my recommendation. But uh, it's not to be despised. It's, it's lovely, wonderful. It's not essentially who you are, obviously. So find who you are beyond that as soon as possible before it starts to decay. Find who you are beyond that, that's important. So, but it's not only the ego, it's not only amplified by identification with a strong or beautiful body, it's equally, the e ego is equally ampli amplified if you have a shame or unhappiness attached to what you, what you consider to be an undesirable looking body that's also of strong egoic thought form. It's just as strong as the one that takes pride in your appearance. Sometimes people think ego always refers to somebody who feels better and bigger than others. Big ego seems to be like a triumphant sense of identity that can be the case. But the, the ego is equally strong in the opposite of that, uh, um, regarding yourself as inferior and suffering because of that, comparing yourself unfavorably to, with other people uh, on whatever level, uh, seeing yourself as a, as a victim of life, that's an equally strong egoic identity, a thought form. So it's not just the ego, it's not necessarily and always a triumphant sense of identity. It, it can be just as strong as the opposite of that. Uh, so, identification with the body, which can be, ultimately it will bring you suffering. Even if, as I said, even if your body is strong and beautiful and you identify with that, you move towards suffering. And if your body is not, you're not happy with it, you're suffering already. <laughs> so in either case, go deeper go deeper, don't, and then that's one identification. The other identification may be other external things to your body. Uh, now, obviously, to some extent, the things the, that you put on your body become an extension of the body. <laughs> so you look for, if you want to create a certain image, to, uh, or to reinforce the image that you've already created for yourself, the way you dress becomes an extension of, you identify with that uh, as much as you identify with the actual physical body, it becomes an extension of the physical body. So that can become important too. What you put on becomes part of your identity and all the advertisers, the manufacturers of clothes and um, brands, they all know that, that ultimately you're not buying a piece of clothing, but you're buying an identity, and they all know that, and that's what they advertise. They advertise an enhanced sense of identity. 
And again, it does not mean there's anything wrong with enjoying something beautiful to put on your body. The question is, d does, that, does that give you your sense of identity, or is it simply something that you enjoy? Very big difference. In the same way with a possession. Of, uh, you, there's no need to let go of all possessions because if you radically, as some spiritual people have done and still do in the past, it, sometimes it may work, but the danger is, if you, let's say you, you're so spiritual that you say, I, I, I don't want any more possessions, nothing. And that still exists in, in some countries, there's an, in India, there's an unbroken tradition going back thousands of years of humans who have done that, and they still, some still do it. So they walk, some of them are actually totally naked, some well, are still loincloths, they live on, they, they, they are support, supported because it's, this is valued there as, as um, to, to relinquish all attachments completely in your attempt to find the deeper dimension where, where you, the being of you, that is the, where you are connected with the divine, with God, source. Um, the danger is when you do that, in, that you create a substitute identity for, or you, for yourself as a thought form of me, the one who has let go of everything. Therefore, the me that is superior to all those who are still attached to all those things. And that's the spiritual ego, it's, and that's very subtle and can be very deceptive. You can spend the rest of your life, if let go of everything, and then you have this huge spiritual ego walking around and you don't know it. <laughs> and so, you, uh, it's much more helpful, except in some exceptional cases, if, if that is your calling to relinquish everything, if you very strongly feel that is your calling, then that's the way you have to go. But be careful that you don't create another identity for yourself, a, ma a mind-made identity out of that. Then you're trapped again without knowing it. <laughs> uh, but if you do, my recommendation is first of all, don't, because if, you probably have to let go of your, most of your clothes too, um, don't go and live in North Dakota or Canada. <laughs> uh, uh, move to Florida or here. <laughs> then at least your body is relatively comfortable. Uh, but even then, you would still encounter problems. Uh, so m well, my first recommendation would be to move to India. And there you will be looked after by people who, appreci who, who kind of recognize that uh, there's, there's, a, 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 there's a spiritual seeker there. Or uh, India is still many of these people. Uh, unfortunately, a significant percentage of them, the renunciates, the sadhus, some are genuine, wonderful beings, and others do it for a living. It's great, you don't have to work, people give you food, you can just sit around all day and, and be respected. <laughs> so you have, it's a, for some it's, it, it's a, a genuine, and others uh, are fake. Uh, so identity then, for some people, gender is an identity. The um, uh, Traditionally, being either a man or a woman was always an important part of your sense of self. How important varies from person to person. In some countries where genders are still clearly def defined, and separate it, your gender identity can make up an important part of your sense of who you are. For example, in some countries, if you're a man, it gives you some, 
you immediately uh, have a certain superiority over, over the other 50% of humanity, or well, the, well, the women, that I'm a man. <laughs> and then the woman is also pushed into identification with their role, and uh, and so the woman says, I'm a woman. <laughs> <laughs> and so, and you're trapped in that kind of identification. I'm not going into gender because it's a big topic these days. <laughs> but is the are you seeking some ultimate identity, no matter what you, uh, what gender you are? There's all these things these days: LGBTQ, etc., etc. Okay, that's fine, but are you seeking some ultimate identity in that? That's an illusion again. Anything in, in form, uh, uh, you're, you're seeking for some kind of ultimate completion of yourself that only the essence identity can give you. It does not mean that you cannot honor your form identity. It could also be racial, what color is my skin? Fine, you can you can be happy with it. You can or whatever you, you can honor that, but not not make, making that into the, your main identity. Then you're trapped in on the, the surface of life. So there's a difference between honoring your form identity and being trapped in your form identity. And also the importance is mistaking your form identity with the essence of who you are. You're staking that for the essence of who you are. That's a, that is a delusion. So there's a, a, a subtle a way of dealing with the forms in your life and being able to differentiate between form identity and essence identity. Then you can enjoy the life of forms. You can enjoy also a possession that you have, or some possessions that you have, an object that you have. Um, enjoy it because perhaps it's well made or it's beautiful. Does that necessarily mean that you are psychologically attached to it? Not necessarily. You, you simply, it's lovely. And, but you may not know whether or not there is a clinging, and if there's a clinging, means you have incorporated into your sense of self. But you may not know whether there is a clinging to, 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 until perhaps it disappears, or somebody takes it away, or it gets damaged. <laughs> so you might say, "Okay, I'm not. A, I have a, I have a f Ferrari, but I'm not attached to it whatsoever." And the next day you go to your car and somebody has scratched it with a dress. Oh, who the hell did it? <laughs> and you're upset for several hours. You were touched. So the the object, the the, um, to be excessively concerned with accumulation of objects, that's of course a sign that every, you're, you're seeking yourself in objects again. And so there's an addiction which some people suffer from, which is called shopping. And uh, this is the, they want to acquire. They, the, the happiest moments in their life is when they go into a shop and they choose something, and then they they get to the cash register and they pull out their credit card, and the shop assistant puts it into this shiny luxury bag. They put this. It has a name on it that shows how how exclusive it is. The name, and they put it, in, and then you walk home with the. Uh, 
And sometimes the first moment of dissatisfaction comes when you arrive home and you take it out of the bag. Do I really want this? <laughs> or you wear it once or twice, but then you need something else. But you, and then comes the compulsion to, to for more, more, more. That's part of when you're trapped in essence identity, you're always seeking for more, but not, not necessarily ob objects, it could be possessions, but it could also be more of um, even r relationships. It's never, ne never good enough, it's never, especially these days, when so many potential partners are available to you on your phone. So you're in a re relationship, but maybe the first little disagreement said, no, that wasn't right, he, he wasn't the right person. And you start looking again, even while the person is going to the bathroom. Um, <laughs> and you're already looking, you're getting it out, and you hmm. The more can also be experienced as needing, eating excessively or excessive consumption of alcohol, excessive consumption of food, that also the underlying that can be the psychological need for not being complete enough, not needed to absorb, feel it, feeling a, something missing in myself, something important missing. You're looking for yourself in all kinds of things, in all kinds of places. And there, of course, the famous song from the, was it from the 60s or 70s, Rolling Stones, I can't get no satisfaction, I can't get no... And, of course, that is the ego song, this is the song of the ego, <clears throat> and it's sad, it's very sad. Uh, just before we finish, I'll tell you a little story that happened. I don't know if it's in so interesting, but uh, let's see. Um, I met a man, whenever it was, before, before the time when you had to stop meeting people. Uh, so it was years ago. <laughs> And he's asked, what do you do, he said, as the people do, and I gave the most convenient answer, I'm a writer, and what do you write about? Said, well, now it was getting difficult, because, <laughs> uh, said, being present, present, uh, can you explain that? Um, well, I just can't really be explained, in order to evade getting out of having to answer it, I said, what do you do? And he said, I am a food critic, food and wine critic. I have a big website, and that's my profession, food and wine critic. That's not a bad life. He goes around to the best restaurants, eating the best food and drinking the best wines. And he said, I'm on my way to a wine tasting in the Napa Valley for the whole weekend. And I just had this image, this is what they do, they taste a little bit of wine and then they spit it out and then they talk about it, they find incredible words to describe each wine. <laughs> so uh, I thought me this my opportunity to sh explain to him or to show him what this presence is all about. I said, when you, when you s taste wine, if you're very, very uh, observant, you will notice that in the first moments when the wine reaches your, your tongue, it is, you squish it around in your mouth, in the, this moment, you may notice before you say something about it, you're not thinking. You're purely experiencing it in the, just, just a few seconds. And he thought that. Yeah, that's right. And that's presence. 
Oh. So even there, this, um, he, he realized that in order to fully experience that liquid, in order to fully experience it, he had to temporarily, briefly, set aside any conceptualization. And then he could truly, because his consciousness was needed fully for the sensual, sensory experience of it. And then his mind kicks in. And then the mind interprets the sensory experience and starts talking about it in ways that I could never do. Uh, it, it then, it, the mind then begins to differentiate. It talks. It has a there's a butterscotchy taste and this and that. Well, the strangest things a, 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 a taste of of blueberries in the background and whatever. Uh, 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 <laughs> very poetic sometimes. But before he could do that, he had to fully be there in the experience, they had to be present to it. And that is something that actually applies to many other situations. You may find that in the first moments of experiencing something new, uh, you're not thinking because you have to take it, you have to be present with it. Let's say a bird suddenly comes, it lands on a ledge or in a, on a branch in, in front of you. A bird suddenly lands and there it is. For the first few seconds, you take it in, three seconds maybe, for you're not calling it anything. And then the mind may kick in and say something about it. Either it says, I don't know what bird it is, or it knows what bird it is, whatever it is, or it, I wonder what about it. Uh, or where's my phone? I need to take a picture. <laughs> uh, and in the first moments, when you're first, uh, uh, there is a complete experiencing before you name it. If you can catch the first moments, you're entering a room that uh, perhaps you haven't been to it before, uh, or you're walking around the street of an unknown city that you haven't been to before, you're walking along the street and uh, you're, you're turning a corner and there a new vista suddenly opens up, here's another street. And you look, and you take it in, and there's always a gap before naming happens. And that's interesting, if you can be aware of that gap, th then it can actually get longer. When you're aware of the gap of not naming, when you first experience something, and of course, food and drink also, it's a, it's a good one. It, it doesn't have to be wine, it could be orange juice, it could be anything, and you taste it, and you, uh, your attention is fully in the, in the perception of it. And the, if you become aware of that stillness behind the sensory perception, then it gets longer. And that's a beautiful way of experiencing things by being more of the stillness that's experiencing, the awareness, than the person that immediately names it or finds some kind of, personalizes it in some way, finds some kind of personal relationship to it, wants it or doesn't want it or wishes this or all kinds of things. So more, be more, uh, this is a, um, in any given moment, you can experience this moment predominantly as a, as a person with, that's a normal, so-called so normal way of living. So you, you're not the, the um, you're very much absorbed in continuous um, mental creations involuntary. 
or you can experience the any given moment as as a presence, not as a person anymore. When then, when you don't name it in any way, you're just aware. Then you are just the awareness behind the perception, a walking awareness. That's a. I recommend that you practice that, especially here, but in your daily life, if, if you can. So what happens then is the the person somehow diminishes in its importance and something else arises that still shines through the person but is transcendent to the person that is, that is con unconditioned consciousness, awareness, presence, whatever you want to call it that arises. So you diminish and something else grows. Something more real than the person. That is also the beginning of awakening. In esoteric Christianity, the Jesus Christ, in esoteric and in sub mystics have said, um, Jesus is the historical person who realized its, its essential connectedness with the divine and the, the transcendent dimension therefore was shining through him and that's called the Christ. This even in St. Paul in the New Testament says something like, I'm not good at quoting, but I must diminish and Christ in me must grow. That's the realization. That is, Buddha could be something similar. There was a man called Gautama Siddhartha Sakyamuni or something like that. I don't pronounce it correctly. And this was a historical person. And then the historical person at, I suppose at one point, he was asked, who are you? Or something like that. And he said, I'm awake instead of hearing his name, and that is Buddha, the, the root of the word Buddha means to be awake. And then the historical person became the awakened consciousness. And if you, interestingly for several hundred years, I think five or six hundred years after the death of the Buddha, there were no Buddha images yet, they came much later. And so later then, perhaps the power was decreasing, they needed more images to remind themselves. And so then the famous Buddha images, Buddha Rupas were created, and some of them are very beautiful. And again, it's important to realize when you look at a Buddha image, ultimately, it's, this is not the representation of an historical person. Obviously, nobody knows what he looked like, so it's not a representation of a historical person, it's a representation of a state of consciousness. And, so in, and then it can be, when you know that, you can be, it's beautiful to look at, and the, and the, 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 the Buddha rupas, Buddha images that are made by great craftsmen, they have also, they have a, an almost imperceptible smile on their face. Very, very slight, you can hardly see it. And the ones that are not so good, they look really serious. They... <laughs> and if they have the, the, the good ones that have this hint of a smile, you might say, well, what's he smiling about? If all is emptiness, what's he smiling about? Well, he's smiling because he has transcended the egoic self and is rooted 
in spacious awareness. In the past, when I saw, did counseling sessions with people, uh, which often means you're just listening to their drama, usually it's a drama, <laughs> and uh, I didn't know it, but I unknowingly and perhaps stupidly, while I was listening, uh, I was smiling slightly. <laughs> and, and a few times they st people stop and say, what are you smiling about? <laughs> I'm, I'm telling you my, my suffering. It was hard at that point. I didn't have that many words yet to explain things. Um, I can't remember how I explained why I was smiling, but I can't do it now. It's because I could sense the reality that was beyond the drama in that person. Through my own realization, I could sense the ultimate uh, delusional, delusional, delusion, delusional nat nature of the su of their story, and I could sense beyond the, st the suffering entity there was a being that was tra completely beyond suffering. I could, in other words, I could sense the sanity beyond the surface craziness. In many cases, I could sense their essential beingness. I connected with their essential beingness, and that is very pleasant, and that's why I smiled, not because of the story. I wish I could have explained it, could have explained it to them like that, but I have a, these my bells here. I haven't used them yet to um, signal the end of our afternoon sessions. I will now ring the bells. Lovely Tibetan bells. Welcome back to a live event. Also welcome to other people joining us in different parts of the world. It's good to start with stillness and it's even better not to lose stillness even when speaking happens. So that stillness remains in the background. And when there's no speaking, stillness can be in the foreground. Another reason why it's good with, to start with stillness is that usually, I haven't prepared anything and I don't know what to say. which could be a very uncomfortable thing if I thought that I needed to know what I'm going to say. If I'm comfortable, however, with not knowing what to say, it's quite a pleasant state. But it implies a trust, a trust in something deeper than the personal mind and the trust that, that the words will come from the deeper dimension out of the present moment. So we are here to access or deepen that transcendent dimension 
of consciousness. It begins when the mind ceases to create thought, if only for a moment, and yet you haven't fallen asleep. I will make allowances for people who have only just got here from other parts of the planet and are suffering from jet lag. The mind stops just for a moment, but there's no decrease in consciousness. In fact, there's an increase in consciousness. A certain alertness, a gentle, alert presence. And one could say you sense that presence both within and without. Although ultimately, although I'm not going to go into that right now, I'll just throw it out there, Ultimately, there isn't within and without, there's only within. It's all within. This entire space is within you. <laughs> Not let's try to work that out by thinking about it. <laughs> The moment you start trying to figure it out by thinking about it, it's gone. <laughs> so the essence of our retreat is no different from the essence of your life, your so-called life, there is no your life, we just use those words. until you awaken to this dimension or into this dimension which we may call stillness your mind is full of clutter some of it may be useful a lot of it is useless and a lot of it is actually harmful, destroys your happiness, a lot of what goes on in your mind. The mind is full of clutter, the clutter of one thought after another, plus the emotions that reflect thoughts and also amplify the thoughts. Most people only know their own life consists of that clutter of thought. The entire sense of identity is derived from the clutter of thought. Me. Not a pleasant sense of identity. And everybody's looking, everybody feels in the background or sometimes in the foreground a sense of insufficiency or dissatisfaction with their with who they are no matter what they have achieved there's a, always in the back of a sense of something missing a dissatisfaction an unease sometimes more pronounced that it's not just unease anxieties heaviness of regrets and feelings of guilt and undoubtedly the person if you derive your sense of identity from the continuous movement of thought and then as some kind of narrative emerges out of that continuous movement of thought and this narrative that emerges out of a, a repetitive narrative that emerges out of this movement of thought thoughts which consist of memories and so on, 
reactions to past events and so on. Out of this clutter emerges a more <clears throat> a persistent repetitive narrative and this is the, this becomes the the main that the core of the person or personality, the narrative of me. So people call it me and my life, my life. And of course, I don't know any life that's not problematic. You're not the only one. That may come as a surprise if you spend a lot of time on Facebook. <laughs> because everybody else's life seems to be so perfect. They even look perfect through the infinite power of technology, they all look perfect. Even I, they did it to me a few times. <laughs> Even I can look perfect. <laughs> if you apply the right filters. <laughs> but every person is a problem, a walking problem. <laughs> Seeking for a solution. But, of course, as every therapist knows, there is an identification with the mind-created entity the self, the problematic self, yes, I want to be free of it, but also there's a feeling that's me, I don't want to let go of that. It's an unconscious reluctance to let go of this thing that is so problematic, that is me. And then when moments arrive when you there's a possibility of transcendence appears suddenly on the horizon, <laughs> so to speak, and immediately say, oh no, I don't want to go there. I want to hang on to this because what uh, is too uncertain. I don't want to step into the unknown. I'd rather be with my problematic self. And so you, every therapist uh, has experienced that many times that people there's a point where people don't want to, they want to hang on to that problematic identity. <laughs> and then, okay, then you suffer a bit more. And perhaps a few years pass and then perhaps you just can't stand it anymore. And then finally there's a readiness. Now, since we are talking about the clutter of thought, this may be a good moment to just introduce very briefly a few things that may be helpful while you're here. It's most, mostly about things that, that you, I recommend that you refrain from doing rather than recommend that you're doing something, that you do something. First of all, there's a television in your room, please don't turn it on. Because in the moment you turn it on, it, it amplifies and adds to the clutter of your mind. It's, it's uncertain that you will miss anything. It is, it is very unlikely that you will miss anything important. It's very unlikely. Okay, it's, it's a recommendation. There's no built-in camera in your room just to control that you actually don't. <laughs> now the next recommendation may be a little bit more problematic for some people because of the addictive nature of this thing you hold in your hand. 
My recommendation is to use it as little as possible while you're here. And only use it if there's a specific purpose. Perhaps there is an important message. But not to randomly go there. As that's very normal. Whenever there's a moment of you're waiting for something, automatically the hand goes into your pocket or your handbag. Everybody seems to be doing that and you get that thing out. You don't know why, but everybody else is doing it. And then it appears that you're engaged in some important activity. <laughs> and you feel that's, that's a, it's clutter. What it prevents is, is the arising of even the slightest glimpse of inner spaciousness. At least before the clever human mind invented these things, when you were waiting for something, there was nothing to do. And you just had to stand or sit there, unless that's, well, if you were in a waiting room somewhere, they had magazines. But in other cases, you were waiting somewhere, there wasn't much to do if you didn't have any a book or magazine, and so you were just left with yourself. And there was a possibility of at least having a glimpse of Ah, briefly emerging out of this sea of thought and briefly coming into the present moment and then you go, oh. That happens very rarely though, because the moment you, you stop, you get this thing out. So, it's addictive. My recommendation is then to, if you can, not use it at all while you're here. It's not that long. But if you have to, once a day or twice a day, if you have to check it, okay. For Because we are here in order to access, this is another way of putting it, we, we call it stillness, to access the dimension of inner spaciousness, which is an enormous step forward in the evolution of human consciousness, the transcendent dimension. This is why we're here. So it's good to refrain from doing things that prevent that. Another thing that is to be recommended is not to indulge in the consumption of substances. Okay, if you cannot enjoy your dinner without a glass of wine, that's fine. But if you, if you know yourself and you know that if you drink one glass of wine, your determination to only drink one glass of wine after you've finished drinking that one glass of wine, so if the original determination to only have one glass of wine goes out of the window, and then you're it's in the second and the third and the fourth. Or be, so, uh, alcohol can lower your consciousness and prevent the rising of presence, although I myself enjoy a glass of wine occasionally, it doesn't matter. Or a nice cool beer in this heat, hot weather is actually quite nice. <laughs> but beyond that, you have to be careful, especially if you know yourself. If you can refrain altogether, that's great while you're here. And one last thing, not to indulge in excessive intake of food, especially before uh, our sessions. So, eat in moderation. So these are just some very basic practical, but they are Im important. Oh, another one is wear a hat if you go out in the t during the daytime. <laughs> <laughs> mm. 
because if you uh, through excessive heat you could suddenly become unconscious, not just in a spiritual sense. <laughs> oh, and now I will add something else to this. <laughs> uh, this is a wonderful spiritual practice, especially while you're here, and you might even want to extend it when you leave here. You might want to also practice it in your daily life. Now, self-observation is very important, which requires some awareness, and awareness is presence, and presence is the dimension of stillness that arises. Awareness, stillness, presence, it's all different pointers pointing to the one reality. So, a certain amount of awareness is needed for self-observation. Self-observation means to know what's going on in your mind and in your emotional field rather than being what's going on in your mind and your emotional field, rather than being the thought and the emotion that takes a hold of you, being able to be the presence behind it, whether it's anxiety, anger, whatever it may be, be the presence behind the emotion, rather than being totally in the grip of the emotion, or the narrative, the story that you're telling yourself in any particular moment. And so my recommendation is that while you're here, to be so aligned with the present moment that you don't complain about it. Of course, if there's something wrong, really wrong, and not just in your mind, if something is wrong and you need to tell somebody about it because this person may be able to rectify it, it's not complaining, it's you conveying information. But I'm talking about the very, one of the favorite activities of the ego, actually that for many, many people, they don't even know it, is to have to argue, continuously argue with reality, with what is. Some people are so deeply trapped in this mind pattern that they could be described as grievances looking for a cause and of course easy to find. So if you refrain from complaining internally, first of all, you have to become more aligned with the present moment, the isness of whatever is. And the mind might say, it's so hot here, why, I just can't stand it anymore. I can't stand it, it's awful. How can we do a retreat here in this heat? Don't you agree? The more people you can talk to, the better about it. <laughs> and if you're lucky, you find one or two that totally agree, and then the thing gets amplified. <laughs> now, of course, there's always something wrong. Wherever you go, you will find some certain things that are not right, according to what the mind expects. Only in your imagination could you think of a retreat place where there's absolutely nothing wrong. Nothing. Everything is perfect for your spiritual practice. 100% perfect. Even if that existed, it would not be very helpful. The strange thing is, spiritual the potential for spiritual awakening arises the moment something goes wrong. <laughs> of course, it's not wrong at all, but it's just a mental in an interpretation. This shouldn't be happening, but it is, well, it, but it shouldn't. It's, they shouldn't do that, but they do. 
They should have done that one, well, they didn't. <laughs> but you can have continuous narratives running through your mind of that, of that kind. And the more you can argue with reality, the stronger the egoic sense of self, the delusion, the, the, the delusional self, the fiction, the, the, the fictional entity, the stronger it gets. <laughs> So the letting go of any kind of complaining, unless something can be done and you talk to somebody about it, and, and again, then not in a complaining way, but in a factual way, that's already a huge shift. And then continuous self-observation is part of that also. What are the thoughts that go through your mind? And be the awareness of what is happening in your emotional field. Are you, as you're sitting here, are you carrying something in your emotional field that is a residue of something that happened an hour ago? This morning, while you were come traveling here, Yesterday, some imaginary situation your mind is creating and your, it, the motion reflects that as if it were reality. And again, without the awareness, it takes you over. You don't need to get rid of anything. You don't need to get rid of the emotion. Without the awareness, you don't have an emotion. The emotion has you. And the emotion is an energy form, an energy field. A thought is an energy formation. Everything is energy, and this is emotion and thought are non-physical energy formations. So the thought then has you, you don't have it, you're not even there, you are, spiritually speaking, asleep. And you're being run by the conditioned emotions, the mental, you're run by the, the mental emotional conditioning. The mental emotional conditioning says, I, and it refers to all that stuff, that accumulated stuff. I, everybody says I continuously. <laughs> Everybody's favorite pronoun is I. And what they refer to usually is that entity, the problematic entity, the ego, that's the word, the egoic self, I. There's a deeper I that is not the egoic self. And that deeper eye, this is why we're here, to access that, to deepen that, most of you already have access to it, but it may periodically become obscured in this world, not surprisingly. When things go wrong, that's a moment of becoming more conscious. It's every even the smallest things. If you don't react out of the conditioning, the mental emotional conditioning, but be the awareness, and then, oh. And you observe, if emotions arise, you are there, and you can say, oh, there's the anxiety again. And then you know that there's anxiety without calling it anything. That is a huge difference to know that anxiety is in you, anger is in you right now, for example, or anxiety, whatever else it may be, or some mood that suddenly gets a hold of you, and you're suddenly in a bad mood. Don't talk to me. Don't see. I'm grumpy. Well, to say I'm grumpy is already a little bit step forward, because at least you know that you're grumpy. If you're totally calm conscious, the grumpiness is you. 
And you don't even know that you're grumpy. To say, don't talk to me, I'm grumpy, that already means there's a little bit of awareness there. It's great. <laughs> so there's a huge difference between saying, I'm angry and slightly different. I feel angry or there's anger in me. I feel that there's anger in me. I feel angry. There's a somewhat a, a difference between I am angry because then you equate identity with the emotion. So it's not I am angry, that's a huge, you've fallen into a huge trap if you equate emotion with your identity, or if you equate a thought with your identity, or a story in your mind, you equate that with your identity, or an opinion which is thought. The world is full of people who don't know the difference between their opinion and their identity. Their opinion becomes their identity. <laughs> and then they have lots of fights with other people, because they are, they are totally confused about who they are. They derive their identity from a set of opinions. Politics, for example, you derive, it doesn't mean you cannot have opinions, everybody has opinions. But where does your sense of identity come from? Does it come from the opinions or do you realize that you have certain opinions which may be valid or not? You're, you're on a human level, you have opinions or viewpoints or perspective mental positions, you have them, they are there, but do, you, do these give you your sense of self? Or if they do, then you're continuously arguing with other people, making other people into enemies, because when you contradict somebody, who equates opinion with identity, unconsciously they believe that you are attack attacking their very self because there's a confusion about who they are. They don't know who they are. So you, you attack the opinion of somebody who's totally identified with their opinion and you become their mortal enemy. They might even try to kill you in an extreme form of unconsciousness. So, this is why it's so important to transcend that. Transcend doesn't mean it, you exclude it. It doesn't mean no more opinions. I'm now, I'm, I have no opinion about anything or anyone. No, <laughs> that's, that's not going to work. <laughs> what do you think of? Uh, the Republican Party, the Democratic Party, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> but there is a deeper level, if you can go to a deeper level and your, your sense of I is not the, does not come from the movement of thought, it comes from a deeper place, your identity, who you, who you feel or sense you are, does not come from the emotional field or from the mental formations. And that is the awakening. That is to be awakened is to discover, first of all, it is to discover that dimension. It, for some people, at first, it comes in little glimpses, some, perhaps sometimes in protected settings, environments like here, and, so, and I say, are you able to, to, this moment, are you able to let go of thinking without falling asleep, but remaining alert? in a gentle way, not through willpower, just relinquish conceptualization. No need to interpret compulsively this moment. What could you add to it? 
interpret as you like it. You dis I like this, I don't like that. And yes, likes and dislikes still exist on the surface of your being, but as you, when you become rooted in the deeper presence, the being of you, then you're suddenly free. And you can sense that in that stillness, if we want to call it that, stillness just means the absence of thought, and what remains when thought goes but you don't fall asleep is conscious presence. Pure consciousness remains. And that is the deeper I, the deeper I am. So a moment of presence or stillness. You, in that moment you have transcended the person, the personal self. Of course you go back into it after a while. And the question is, are you going to lose yourself in it again, perhaps? And then you come out of it again. And after a while, this is your, the aim of spiritual practice, that your connectedness with the deeper dimension is not lost, even when you're engaged in daily activities or discussions or whatever it may be, there is, there is a, that connectedness remains in the background, which may be the case with you now, as you listen to this, and it's not this, something in you recognizes what the words are pointing to, and that's not the conceptual mind that which recognizes it as true is the immediate realization of, it, of, its, of the truth of it. You don't have to think about it. You can't think about it. So it's, you know immediately, yes, I know there's a direct knowing, not conceptual knowing. Conceptual means knowing through thinking. Most people live through a conceptual reality. They, their identity is a conceptual identity. And they conceptualize every, everybody else they meet. They immediately form judgments. They come very quickly. And you form a conceptual identity for the other. You, you trap the other person in, in this mental concept. But you've done, you do that because you've already done it to yourself. So you live through a conceptual identity, me. And so we step, we go to a deeper place, or you could call it higher or deeper, it doesn't matter. I prefer deeper. Somehow. You go to a deeper place where the movement of thought ceases, and you immediately you have transcended the self, the egoic self, if only for a few seconds or a minute. And everybody is longing to be free of this problematic entity. Unconsciously, they want to be free, but they don't want to let go. There's a, parado a paradox here. They don't want to let go, and yet they can't stand it. They want to be free. So, so much drug taking in this world is they all they want to transcend this heaviness of the life as a, experiencing life as this heavy burden, and their their identity is very unsatisfying. <coughs> so they're longing to be free but they're going below thinking. The road that takes you below, you, you fall below thought, and to some extent, yes, you have become free of the self. Before you go to sleep, there's a transitional moment when you're in bed, and you're halfway to sleep already, and that moment feels really good. 
you feel ah oh, it feels you can feel the pull of sleep and you can feel you can't think about your problems anymore. Your entire sense of identity isn't there because you, it's, you're too tired. <laughs> and then you're pulled into sleep. Same with many substances that you take. They'll pull you below thought. At first it feels liberating, at least even the smoking of, of this dried leaf that people like. <laughs> they they smoke and it it slows you down, it slows down the mind. I tried it once. I tried another thing too, but this was... Uh, uh, I tried it in a hotel room in Amsterdam. It's true. <laughs> it's not that great, but... I can see what it does. It it's kind of creates a fogginess in your mind, a kind of fog, and you go, oh. <laughs> and it it you fall below thought, and that is why f for many people that's so liberating. They for one they experience a kind of freedom. Oh, I can let go. Oh, I need a bit more. Oh, right. As an, okay, uh, for some people, it, it gives them a glimpse of something, it's fine. It's not a permanent solution at all to the human problem. <laughs> it's not a permanent solution at all. Because it, it takes you below thought. Here, it's rising above thought. Transcending thought by rising above thought. That is the most fundamental thing in human life because that's the next step in human evolution, the evolution of consciousness for humanity, which has been trapped in thought, ego, egoic thought, complete identification with thought for thousands of years. <coughs> and now we've reached a, a crisis point where we have created a world that is, that amplifies the dysfunction of the egoic mind through technology and science. The dysfunctions which before were already there a thousand, two thousand, five thousand years ago. The technology amplifies the dysfunction and then there is the possibility of destruction. So our entire gathering here, the retreat, is only really about one thing. Well, it's not a thing, but that is discover in yourself this possibility of shifting from being a person to being the awareness. Then you can, in some situations you may find you are completely the person again. You, you might lose the awareness. Eventually you won't lose it, but you have a person you prefer. Especially when you talk to others. You can see when people talk how they are in the grip of a mind stream. They, they are not talking their mind is talking through them. The conditioned mind is talking through them. They can't stop it. They don't even know they're there. They're basically, they are asleep while the mind is talking. And the, the talking mind says, I, I, I. <laughs> it's easier to observe this state of being lost in the mind it's easier to observe it in others than in yourself, by the way. Because the moment you observe it, you're no longer lost. The moment you know there's an, that the light of awareness is suddenly there. That's the light which I believe is in the title of our retreat. This light is the light of consciousness, is the light of awareness. It's a light that in the mythological 
account of creation, which is actually quite inspired and quite deep in the beginning of the Bible, the, 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 the entire thing starts with, this entire, the entire thing, creation starts with, with the words, let there be light. And that is uttered by God. We'll, we may explore what that means later. This is uttered before God creates even the sun and the stars. So it's, it's more than that. So it points to something else. Let there be light. That's the very foundation, the light of the consciousness that underlies the phenomenal existence. Phenomenal means consisting of phenomena. Everything that happens, everything that manifested, are phenomena. They come and go. They are all ripples on the surface of the ocean. As you are and I am as this physical form and the psychological form. So you experience the world either through the conditioned mind or through the awareness behind it. And this is why I, I won't need to mention another important spiritual practice, especially while you're here but hopefully also when you leave here, when, after the retreat, for the rest of your life, the spiritual practice of perceiving the world around you directly through awareness instead of through the mental faculty of compulsive naming, interpreting, and so on. Which is quite normal for many people. In, uh, the moment they perceive something, they call it something, classify it, name it. But the spiritual practice is to, to perceive something visually, through visual perception, auditory perception, or other perceptions, and be so present as that the perception arises in the space of awareness, the light of consciousness. The light, in the light of consciousness, whatever it is that you see or hear or feel or touch or taste or smell, that, that you are the awareness for the perception. For example, you look at a flower, let go of needing to name it, relate it to something, wanting something from it, remembering something that reminds you of something, this or that. What is it called? I must know. These, all these things can be helpful and are sometimes necessary, of course, to, to be able to manipulate concepts. is necessary in this world, but I'm not I'm not teaching the manipulation of concepts because you already, everyone is a master of manipulation of concepts already. That's not what I need to teach about here. The, the teaching, if we want to even call it that, is not to be trapped in conceptualization. To transcend also means you no longer use it. The ability to use it is actually enhanced when there is a deeper dimension. So you're not trapped in conceptualization, and when you don't want it, you, you let it go. And there's a deeper connectedness to whatever it is that you are perceiving. For example, the flower, or many other beautiful things in nature. It's a kind of desert, but the desert is intensely alive. Uh, and so you're looking at something, and you hold the perception, let go of the compulsive naming, 
And then there is a deeper knowing. You can know this flower without calling it anything, but at a deep non-conceptual level. That's awareness. You become the light of consciousness rather than a person. There's a shift. So you can either look at or listen one thing, like a flower, a tree, a cactus, incredible formations here. Or you can take in the totality of where, wherever you are and take it all in and be the aware presence behind the perception. Stillness, again, we can use that word. You become, you're still. Then whatever it is being perceived arises in the light of consciousness. You are the light of the world, as that's a quote from Jesus in the New Testament. You are the light of the world. You, in other words, you are the consciousness in which this world appears. You're not really a person. You're not really a person. You are consciousness. A manifestation of the one consciousness. That's an incredible liberation, the liberation from yourself. <laughs> but you can still operate as a person. You still, all these things still happen. Even, as I said before, your opinions, everything, you still have your opinions, etc., etc. You're not entrapped in them anymore. You even have likes and dislikes, but you're not, they don't, you're not all consuming. You're not trapped in them. They don't, they don't have a hold on you. You're not the prisoner of your mind anymore. So you, as a practice here, come to your senses, perceive through the light of consciousness, let go of the naming. If a name arises, don't give it any importance, and you drop it. And you bring your attention back to the perception. Something lovely you can do here at night time, the The temperature goes down a bit, not a lot, <laughs> and you can you sit outside and you can the warm air surrounds your body like velvet. It's, you can feel it like velvet on your skin. Sometimes there's a slight warm breeze. There's a wonderful opportunity for sense of sense perception through tactile sense perception. Feel that, that air without, and, and be the, the presence for it. Or certain noises that you might hear in the, at the same time at night, in the night. There's an alert presence. You are there as an alert presence, not as a person. The person is still there somewhere in the background, but uh, has receded. The person has receded, and something else has arisen. And that is another of my favorite ways of describing it, is to say when you are only a person, the conditioned self, the conditioned entity, you operate exclusively on the human level. You are a human. They are all you, of course you are human. They're all they're humans, but you're not a human being. The being is the transcendent dimension that needs to awaken. When the human has suffered enough, the being begins to awaken through the human. Your destiny is to become a human being, and you're already you are here because the beingness, the transcendent presence, that says, I am, without attaching anything to it, the bare, naked beingness, you can sense that, and that is the fulfillment of your life here, which is brief for everyone. The realization of being. The connectedness with the being dimension that humans 
most likely had before the arising of thinking was there, but not in a fully conscious way. When you are, when you, when something is your natural state and has always been your natural state, then you have nothing to compare it to. But it was probably the natural state of humans, and then the thinking began to happen. It was necessary, a necessary stage in the evolution. Our destiny, though, is not to continue to think, to be trapped in thinking, but to transcend thinking and then actually be able to use thought as a helpful, wonderful, creative tool. But it doesn't give you your identity anymore. So the observation of phenomena without naming sense perception without naming. It's a wonderful practice. You can do it when you're, whether you're in your room or outside. Be an alert presence. So what happens then? Let's again do it here. You perceive the totality of this room without naming. Now, what is there? You perceive the totality of this room, people in it, lights. But you're also aware, you're not just aware of what's arising in the light of consciousness, what manifests in the light of consciousness. You're aware of yourself as the consciousness that is perceiving. And that you cannot define it. It's very hard to describe it. We can use, I'm trying to use words as pointers, silent presence. So there's not only what you perceive, there's also awareness of the awareness that is perceiving, the consciousness that is perceiving. So you have these, the, these two worlds, the manifested world of things and the world of no thing. And I sometimes call that space consciousness is the awareness itself, awareness of awareness. I am. That's another way of saying it. I am. All you know is there is a beingness there. There is a presence there. At first it may seem like little and not important. It's what is there, something. At first it may seem just like an absence of something. But then you begin to realize this absence, in this absence, <laughs> there is a presence. <laughs> and there's a power, that is, there's a silent power that is in you that far transcends who or what you are as a person. And when you sense that silent power that underlies everything, then you suddenly have <laughs> what's in, what is conventionally called self-confidence. <laughs> now, conventionally that means you have confidence in your person, that you, the, your, your person is good enough or knows enough, or is beautiful enough, or is strong enough, whatever it is, you have that self, I am self-confident. No, this is something, this is the, the Buddha would say, that's the no-self-confidence, the, the confidence in the no-self, <laughs> or the confidence in the transcendent self. So when you sense, as, Habitual thinking subsides for a moment, 
And what's left is, at first, an absence. And some people become uncomfortable because the first, first they notice it as an absence and then they immediately say, oh, I, I don't want that. And then immediately if they, they go back into thinking. But if you stay with that, what seems like an absence, it seems like you have disappeared. And it seems like you don't know anything anymore because when you're not naming anything, what do you know? <laughs> Well, there's no concept in your mind, what do you know on the level of concept? You don't know anything. And so the, the habitual egoic mind is afraid of that. And so many people jump immediately jump back into the habitual mind. And yet, if you stay with that, what seems like an absence, there's a subtleness to it. It takes a while to, to, to notice that fully. The, for the awareness to fully arise, whenever I talk, one talks about it, one creates a duality. And, and then you know, begin to notice it's not just what the Buddha described as emptiness, it's this is one way of looking at it, but which is the, the very secret of life, is that the emptiness that underlies everything, but emptiness really a better translation would be spaciousness. And Jesus talked about it as, he called it fullness, the fullness of life. I want you to have the fullness of life. Same thing, seems the opposite, but that is life prior to manifestation. You can become still, it's not really becoming still, it's discovering the stillness that's already, always already there. So it's nothing to achieve. It's not an achievement, it's a discovery. And somehow the state transmits itself to some extent and that is why it's helpful to be here. There's a transmission of that consciousness beyond words, especially in between the words. And it arises in many of you, and that is very helpful in this as an energy field of arising presence. And we don't even you don't need to call it meditation because meditation is fine if you have a meditation practice. It's a good thing, but this is the arising of a natural state without necessarily going to say, okay, now let's meditate. Let's do a meditation. But meditation is, can be very helpful as long as you have, do not have in your mind the thought that is something that you're doing. Because the moment you, you, you believe meditation is something that you do, You've created time, because all doing requires time. So if you're doing a meditation, you require time. You require a future. You will have a, a state that you want to achieve through time in future. <laughs> and that's the, that's the obstacle to the realization. So there's nothing to achieve, there's only a discovery of what already is there within you. So the realization of being cannot really come with doing, <laughs> because it's already there. This wonderful the liberation from the person that you thought you were is 
This is why the word liberation is trad in many t in spiritual traditions. They use that word liberation. <laughs> and it's inherently even joyful to know yourself as consciousness is joyful. It does not depend on your life circumstances. If your happiness depends on life circumstances, then you're dependent on what's happening around you. You're at the mercy of what happens or fails to happen. So we have the, for, while you're here, the practice of as much as possible not naming sense perceptions, but just be the awareness. One practice. Refrain from complaining internally and externally. And another, I would add, notice that you are breathing. A very breathing is always a very powerful portal into awakening. Just notice that you're breathing as much as possible, where, no matter where you are. Why is that important? You cannot notice that you're breathing and think at the same time. The Buddha never said, stop thinking. He said, be aware of your breath. That's a cunning way of saying stop thinking, but it's, a, it's an easy approach. So our, there's only one thing that's the essence of this retreat, well, the essence of everything, there's only one secret. It's more, well, this can't be a secret, I'm talking about it. <laughs> and that is the arising of awareness, cessation of thinking, arising of awareness. Then you drift back into thinking. And then you notice, and you, now, if you are able voluntarily to step out of thinking, that's an enormous achievement. <laughs> it's not, the, the achievement is to stop thinking. The realization is, in itself is not an achievement. People sometimes People, I have been asked, what's your greatest achievement in life? And I, I, I don't have to think when I don't want to think. Is that all? <laughs> <laughs> that would be... Now, fortunately, I will never have to apply for another job again. <laughs> <laughs> Not that anybody would, somebody who says, I don't need to think. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, you could add, though, if you add, it's, and it would be true, I'm quite good at thinking, but I don't need to think. Maybe then you would get a job, I don't know. <clears throat> but the, that is the, the transcendence of the compulsive thinking. And only then can thinking become a wonderful tool. But you have to free yourself from your mind and discover who, or we can say what you are, beyond the mind. Some, in some meditations, you ask, people ask the question, who am I? It's a 
Some recommend this as a meditation to ask yourself, who am I? But then not look for an answer on the level of concepts. It might even be better to ask yourself, what am I? Because who probably implies that you're still a person. Who is the inquiry after a person? Now what, you might say, well, that what, what would be a thing? Well, it's not a thing, but it's not a person either. What am I? Who or what am I? <laughs> <laughs> and the answer is in the silence after the question. So there's no conceptual answer to the question, who or what am I? So that's all. The, if you, maybe some of you get it completely now, that what the secret is. Uh, now it's only a question of living it. The, everything changes with that. The way in which you deal with things, with situations, changes when you're no longer trapped in the egoic self, in the reactive mode of the egoic self that amplifies every problem that arises, gets amplified through the reactivity of the egoic self. This is why the world is full of drama continuously in people's personal lives and collectively. Every challenge Every re reaction to the child, to uh, an arising challenge, just usually makes it worse. It, you amplify it, and then drama arises, which the ego loves. It loves its drama and talks about it. So the the way in which you deal with situations changes because you, you no longer oppose. Reality, you no longer internally and externally oppose the isness of things. You're aligned with what is. That's why this practice of not complaining is also very important to become aligned with the experience of this moment, the way in which you experience this moment. You're aligned with that. Even if it's far too hot in the, during the daytime, it's just so hot. Well, that's your experience of this moment. You don't need to just be with it. You go in the shade or in the air-conditioned environment until nighttime, and then you go out and, ah. Your experience of this moment, you don't resist your experience of this moment. So the way in which you deal with things becomes more effective, but the key word here is what arises is wisdom, which is different from intelligence. Wisdom arises from awareness. Intelligence can be the conceptual mind has been trained to classify, to memorize, to dissect, and to talk about things. This is the intelligence, this thing you, perhaps you can measure in IQ tests, whatever. But the much more important, a deeper faculty, is the wisdom that arises, can only arise in those humans who have become human beings, and thereby have accessed the dimension of awareness. That's where wisdom arises. Wisdom doesn't attack one problem. It sees the totality of the situation. Then whatever solution uh, it comes up with will take into account the totality. Intelligence is a focus. It attacks the problem here. This is what we need to do but it disregards all the things around it that will be affected by whatever action you take. Wisdom always sees the totality of things, and wisdom is inseparable from presence or awareness. 
is, is not conditioned. We don't need to, the world is not going to be saved by humans becoming more knowledgeable in more information. You know, aren't you drowning in information? So it's not, we don't need to become more intelligent. The world is full of intelligent people who are creating havoc. <coughs> They have all. They probably have all university degrees, and they're crazy. <laughs> <laughs> so, but what is needed is the arising of wisdom, which is inseparable from the awakening to who or what you are beyond the person, the conditioned entity, and the, because that is where. Intuition arises, where uh, insights arise, where creativity arises, all, come f all from that deeper level. Every creative person has some access to it, usually in a, only in the area of their creativity, they have some access to that transcendent dimension. And usually most of them in the rest of their lives they are just as crazy as everybody else, and sometimes even more crazy. <laughs> so there, for any creative thing to arise, you need to have some access, whether it doesn't matter what your activity is, whether you're an artist or a musician, or even a scientist, to have a creative insight, a really creative insight that comes from a deeper place, as a realization, you go, ah. That's how Einstein's theory of relativity came to him. Yes, he was thinking, 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 but he also had the ability to be still. He was famous for kind of drifting off into stillness. He already did it as a child. He was always very slow, but there was stillness. Nowadays at schools, they want a quick reaction. The people who say, I know, I know, here, yeah, here. Yeah. What's the, I know the answer. Yeah. And Einstein was not like that. He was always, hmm. well, hmm. any creative endeavor comes from there. So, the important thing, what to use this time uh, that you are here, not just the sessions that we are having, but every moment make it part of the retreat practice. Every moment bring awareness into whatever it is that goes on within you and around you. Be the step out as much as you can out of the habitual mind. Be the alert presence. And when you, are, when you go to sleep tonight, hopefully you're not going to look at your... And then you drift off from there, and then you wake up in the morning and you still have it in your hands. <laughs> and then you, you need to know what's the latest thing that's happened. So when you go to sleep, let go of your devices. Line bed, breathe, bring consciousness into the body, which begins with your breath, and then inhabit the body with your consciousness. This is what I call, as you may know, inner body awareness, takes attention away from thinking. And every cell is becomes feel is filled with life and aliveness. But what you sense is inner body is beyond the physical body. That's a good practice of going into sleep without thinking. You you go into and if you wake up in the night, which is problematic for many people because that's where often despair arises and fear arises, anxiety arises. You wake up at three or four. In the morning, oh my God, what am I doing here? 
what's going to happen to me, what was going to happen when I get home, all that, all and the bad things that happened last month and the last two years, that was horrible. It's, it's all going to end. Are we going to have a nuclear holocaust? It's already happened. It may happen. But it's not happening right now. <laughs> it's not happening now, okay. And my problematic situation, am I going to get another job? I lost mine. Is, is that a problem now? Or do I really need to think about this now? Is there anything I can solve now by thinking about it? No, but I can't stop thinking about it. Because you can. Don't believe your mind when it says you cannot stop thinking about it. Just choose to take your attention away from thinking. Become aware of your breathing. Then the inner body. Hold your attention in the totality of the inner body. Many years ago, this inner body, I, I liked it so much. I don't recommend it. I'm just saying what I did. Uh, before in the past when, when I woke up in bed with all the most terrible depressions and feelings of alienation arose whenever I, I woke up in the middle of the night and I could see the, the surrounding room and it all seemed alien to me it's this horrible feeling described by the way in a not very well known novel anymore by the fair, famous French philosopher Jean-Paul Sartre, and the novel is called Nausea, <laughs> and it's about how you experience life in an alienate, from an alienated consciousness. So you feel the, the alienator, everything is horrible, alien. Um, um, and that was for many years until one night I woke up, I mean, really, uh, and then it was so lovely to feel the inner body which was new to me to feel the inner body instead of thinking I wanted to feel it longer so I had two cups of coffee before going to bed <laughs> <laughs> so that I could stay in this beautiful inner body for longer not to be recommended. <laughs> so this is our first evening, but I have already conveyed to you the secret of life, so if you want to go home, that's okay. <laughs> or we go again into it in tomorrow, which doesn't exist, but you just call it that. <laughs> and so we return to it in the present moment tomorrow. Uh, that's a contradiction. <laughs> <laughs> but it is true, of course, that tomorrow does not exist, the future does not exist, obviously. It, it only exists as thought in your mind. If it existed, you would have experienced it at some point. But nobody has ever experienced the future because it becomes the present. It's a mental protection, necessary for our practical purposes, but ultimately illusory. There's only the present moment, it's only this ever, only this, only this, only this. Oh. That's not so bad. If this is only this, I thought the whole th there was so much. What is all that stuff? No, but it's only this. There the only ever was this. Only ever will be this. And the, the, and usually this is not problematic. Occasionally an emergency may happen. Yes, but it's not a, an emergency. It's not a problem. If it's an emergency, you, you do something. You deal with it. But the, the Life is not as heavy when you, when you are present. You realize it's actually not that bad at all. 
because this, this moment. Wow. And then what, there's a book, I think it's a novel called The, the Unbearable Lightness of Being. <laughs> so so the, it's only unbearable to the ego, but so the lightness of being suddenly is there. You can enjoy life without the heaviness of a, being just the person, the, the heaviness of this personality, this, the burden of yourself. You can enjoy life without that. That's the secret. The rest, now of course, is this is not, it needs to be lived. And before we finish, just one more thing. It seems that life is full of obstacles to this realization. Life is full of hindrances and uh, limitations that suddenly arise, problems of one kind or another, losses, difficult people, that's one of the worst. They're everywhere, they're everywhere. <laughs> difficult. <laughs> And this, it seems that life is kind of sabotaging. It seems some people have this feeling that life is attempting to sabotage uh, your life. Or God, maybe God isn't doing it. And you feel, if, if only life left me alone and I could really practice. No, it doesn't work like that. But the thing is, you need the obstacles because without them, consciousness would not awaken. It awakens through that which seems to, to prevent its awakening. <laughs> A sudden loss, the onset, an accident, an illness, a breakup, in a mental problems, whatever it may be. Pandemic. Why is life doing this to me? Consciousness evolves when confronted with difficulties. Even the simple thing of wanting a stronger body, you need to practice weightlifting and jogging, etc., which is very difficult for the body. I haven't done this in a long time. <laughs> you might have guessed, but... <laughs> weightlifting is hard. What are you doing to your body? You're making life difficult for your body. Yes. But it's only when life gets difficult on the body there is a need for what, an influx of energy. On a physical, that kind of energy, different vibrational frequencies, not necessarily consciousness itself, well, consciousness in a lower vibrational frequency, which is physical energy. The body cries out, says, I need more. And then suddenly energy comes, muscles develop. And suddenly you feel what before was hard and difficult is now wonderful. But life had to become difficult first for the body. If you had stayed on this, on this sofa watching Netflix with a beer, <laughs> nothing would have happened. The body would not have become stronger, but it would have been your comfort zone. Great. So if little things, this is a final thought for tonight, if, if little things here take you out of your comfort zone, welcome them, welcome them. They're all important. But know the difference between little thing that arises externally and other things arise only internally. So often 
your mind takes you out of your comfort zone, there's nothing much happening, but it's thinking that something might be happening. <laughs> so be the awareness, know what's going on in your mind and in your emotional field. It's all. This, the, what else could be the purpose of your life but this, this evolution, this awakening? People are looking for their life purpose. This is it. <laughs> Everything else is secondary. What you do, but is how conscious are you in the doing? That's the question. Doesn't so matter so much what you do, how much how conscious are you while you do what you do? It's only this matters. Thank you, thank you, thank you for sharing presence. Some of you are having a session movement tomorrow morning with Kim, and I will see you again in the present moment, when the present moment is two o'clock or something like that. <laughs> Thank you, thank you. Uh, <laughs> I've forgotten what it's like to be sharing this space with so many awakening and awakened beings like yourselves. It's been two and a half years or so. It's wonderful to be with you again. My voice isn't doing very well, but uh, It'll be fine. So here we are again in the present moment. It's always good to start by acknowledging the present moment. The outside of it sense perceptions and internally whatever it is you're feeling at this moment. It sounds a little strange but it's actually possible to become aware of the present moment as a sense of beingness or presence. That is within you and without. If there's anything that you feel right now, <clears throat> even if it's not the most wonderful feeling, or that might be remnants of anger or sadness or anxiety or fear that may be lurking somewhere within your inner space, that is possible. Um, perhaps something happened today and you're carrying, still carrying it, something happened over the last two years, or whatever it may be, or a few minutes ago. The simple fact of acknowledging the, the, your experience of this moment, even if it's anxiety right now, or sadness, or what, anger, or maybe not, but even to just acknowledging it, there it is, there's the anxiety, for example. That is the arising of awareness. And that's, that's with the arising of awareness, you have a space around the anxiety or the sadness or whatever. That is the a space around it. You're aware of it. You are not it. It temporarily lives in you as an energy field 
it is not you, it lives in you. You don't suppress it, it's just there. That's the acceptance of the present moment that frees you from being taken over by whatever it is that inhabits your inner space. It could be emotion, it could also be thoughts, certain thoughts. <clears throat> Thoughts live in you, they have a, they are energetic little entities, emotion too, different kind of energetic entities. And so these thoughts live in your mind. The question is, are you able to be aware that these are thoughts that live in your mind, or are you being taken over by the thoughts? Are you the thought? Do you become it? That is the un that is we call that unconsciousness for human beings. It is the state of spiritually speaking, unconsciousness. You become whatever emotion arises. It takes you over, so be completely that you become it. Thoughts that arise, including opinions and viewpoints and judgments and dislike and this is good, this is bad, this is that. Is thoughts arise in your mind that you often you absorb them through the internet and, and social media thoughts, they flood your mind and some get stuck in there and then you have, an, you have a very strong opinion but you don't really have an opinion, the opinion has you <laughs> so if you, the great danger is, and this is replies to still millions of people on the planet are still at that De developmental stage of r relative unconsciousness. The, when, when an opinion becomes your identity, that's another way of putting it, I just said the opinion has you, or the opinion becomes your, is equal, your identity, that is the state of unconsciousness, because what it indicates is lack of awareness. Awareness is beyond thought and beyond emotion, it's a dimension of consciousness <laughs> that is arising in human beings now, as I call it, the next stage in the evolution of humanity, the arising of awareness, which is desperately needed now, because so many humans are possessed by toxic and dysfunctional mental, mental emotional patterns. They are, po they, they are in the grip of them. This is why the world looks so crazy, especially, especially at this time. <laughs> There are time periods when the underlying dysfunction in the human consciousness uh, manifests itself more strongly collectively. And uh, I see signs that this is happening again now. It happened many times in human history. One could almost say that it's a, a, like a, a mental pandemic rather than a physical pandemic um, to to be to, to be infected for millions of people by mental viruses so to speak you can't get these thoughts are lodged in your mind they take up your identity your sense of self that's unconsciousness our here we are here to I wouldn't say to awaken, because most of you are awakened or awakening already. This has brought you here. But we are here to deepen or intensify this awakening of that dimension that we sometimes call awareness or presence. And that's the essence of our gathering here, although I'm speaking. The essence is not in the words or the concepts, although they may be helpful, the words or concepts point somewhere that's beyond them, they may be helpful, but that's not, the, the core of this gathering is not there to be found there, it's to be found in <laughs> the arising of presence, of that state of something wants to awaken us even more <laughs> so for there may be some of you here who came 
reluctantly because your friend or relative said you must come and listen to this man. Uh, uh, I, I welcome you if that's the case. Uh, I cannot predict what your um, re reaction or response will be to this gathering. It could be a wonderful beginning of discovery of a deeper state of consciousness, or it could be that you are finding this gathering and this talk incredibly boring or irritating. I can't, what is he talking about? I can't stand it anymore. <laughs> and then the mind goes on. Help is coming. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> so this is all about what we might call the awakening of consciousness. So just, I'll be coming back to it again and again, this terminology. But just to summarize what that means for those of you who are new to it is when you discover in yourself the ability to know what's happening in your inner space, either on the level of emotion or on the level of mind, so that you are you're beginning to find there is an observing presence there. The observing presence can observe whatever happens in your mind, the movement of thought, instead of being totally drawn into it, totally identified, identified with it. That is the awakening, the disidentification from thought plus emotion. The disidentification from thought. So that's what it's all about. We can approach it from many different angles and directions but the core of this is always that. So as a little exercise in awareness or presence, let's do this. I call it do, but it's not really a doing. Becoming aware of sense perceptions, because that is part of your experience of the present moment. Sense perceptions, visual, Auditory are the main sense perceptions, but the others may come in too. So there's the totality of this room. There's a man sitting on a chair. You see him on the chair, you see him on the screen, stage, people. So you take that in, the voice. You're becoming aware of that. You're giving it attention without any strain or effort. You're just directing your attention to sense perceptions rather than thinking. So there's a shift from being absorbed in interpreting sense perceptions and just noticing the sense perceptions. Huge shift. And that's already an enormously wonderful and empowering and important spiritual teaching to become aware of sense perceptions, sensory perceptions, and remove the interpretation of the sensory perceptions. A very fundamental, deep spiritual uh, practice. It's, uh, it may sound a little strange, but to, to be aware of something, you could either direct your sense perception towards a particular noise that you hear in the background, whatever it may be, a bird singing or the engine noise of cars or whatever, or visually a flower or a tree or the sky or the totality of whatever surrounds you and take in the various sense perceptions and just be with it, be alert, there, be it an alert presence for the sense perception, like now. There's no need to interpret. So what can you add to it? You let go of the 
sometimes one should say compulsive need to immediately find some kind of interpretation for it, naming it, con the continuous naming every moment has to be immediately classified <laughs> and personalized and named in some way. I like it, I don't like it, or this question is not quite right. <laughs> And a lot of the naming is of a negative kind. You might notice when you name, there's a difficult person around, <clears throat> or you observe an unconscious person behaving in an unconscious way, because what else can an unconscious person do? You can't ask them to behave in a conscious way. <laughs> so you're looking at an unconscious, be unconscious behavior and uh, say, awful person. Uh, and you, then you let go of that. It's, uh, it's easier with trees and flowers and with people, of course. Uh, with people it's a more advanced stage, but I'm just pointing it out already, because you have ample opportunity in this world, in your life, to practice with people continuously. You may have noticed people are not easy. They're difficult. And some some are quite crazy, but we'll go, go to them. <laughs> and they they got the moments of craziness and relative sanity, and then they got crazy again. That's another story. You might remember your ex-husband or wife. Uh, <clears throat> so, sense perception, bringing just awareness to sense perception, like now. Hmm. You can do it in your room. You sit in your room alone and look around the room. Let go of the mind wanting to say something, but you don't need it. So instead of naming, there's just an awareness behind the sense perception. That's a spiritual practice. You can do it anywhere. I recommend it that you do it whenever you're waiting for something to happen. Even a simple thing like waiting for the elevator to come or while you're riding in the elevator, or you're waiting at the traffic light, or you're waiting for, the, on, the, on the phone, you're waiting for your bank to, 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 to speak to a human being. Half an hour, an hour. But that may be too much for this spiritual practice to start with. So you, 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 whenever you're waiting, and you might be surprised how, how much, how many times of your day you are waiting for something. <laughs> now, most of the time, unfortunately, these days, when humans are waiting for something, even at the elevator or in the lineup to, in the supermarket, whatever it may be, airport, oh, there's a lot of waiting at airports these days. So wherever they are, unfortunately, most humans Oh, immediately get hold of this device. I, even I have one. Here it is. In, they can't wait. They, they cannot give themselves even a half a minute without needing to fill this half a minute with something. Now, before they invented this, it was a little bit more difficult. Uh, you had to fill it with something. Uh, you had to think of something or you became restless waiting, the elevator is still not coming, it's only been 20 seconds. Uh, <laughs> but now, of course, you have this, you can immediately go, because everybody else is doing it too, so you have to do it too. So you pull this out, there's nothing in particular happening, but everybody's doing it, so you do it too. <laughs> and you're, you're adding to the clutter of your mind, and you're adding to the unawareness of the present moment. And um, even worse it is when you're out, let's say you're out in nature, and then you, even there you, you're on a bench, you're sitting on, a, on, a, or on the, the beach or somewhere where it may be, on the, going up. even there some people cannot let go of this because this is an extension of the thinking mind. The thinking mind was already uh, a huge challenge and a problem for thousands of years. It's, and it grew and grew and grew, and then the thinking mind was so clever that it came up with an extension of itself <laughs> in the form of this. 
and now it's even more challenging because it, it amplifies the thinking mind. It amplifies and adds to the clutter of your mind. Clutter meaning useless thinking, just going around in circles, ruminating and at night even when you can't sleep. And a lot of the thinking is not pleasant for most people. You don't think for very long about a wonderful sunset that you saw last night or two days ago. That was such a wonderful sunset. The, <laughs> You can't do a lot of thinking. The mind, the mind needs something else. It needs a difficult person to think about, somebody who was rude to you last week. And you cannot let go of the memory of that and what you should have said to him, but you didn't. But now you can do it in your mind. <laughs> or what, it, what may happen tomorrow or the, the next week. You have to think about that now because otherwise it will all fall apart if I don't think about this now. <laughs> and so people don't realize that live, they live with a burden of unconscious thinking. I'm not talking about useful thinking when there's something to, to apply your mind to. There's a problem that needs to be solved and what can we do, what can I do about it? Let's look at this and that and that. Let's the mind is a very wonderful thing when it's not when you are not the slave of your mind so a lot of that thinking is actually destructive and unpleasant uh, people don't realize that the burden they carry in their minds uh, the burden of enough for many people an unhappy story they carry in their minds and they think about it. And what is that unhappy narrative they carry in their mind? What do they call it? They call it my life. <laughs> oh, my life. So, why did it go wrong so many times there? <laughs> and that shouldn't have happened. I had imagined it when I was 17 and 18, I met it something really very different, but that didn't happen. And then, of course, there are good things too. Some, some. It's for many people. It's the the narrative of my life is a mixed bag of good and bad. And from, but for many others, my life is very problematic, and I cannot stop thinking about it. And the story. I have to tell myself this the story of me and my life. And, and anybody who wants to listen, I'll tell the, them the story too, of me and my life. To, are you ready to listen to my life? Uh, okay, and then I'll tell you mine, okay. <laughs> that is the narrative, the narrative in your mind that you confuse with who you are which is all your memories, accumulated memories, not necessarily objectively true, some may be, but many of the memories are colored by f uh, faulty interpretations of what people did or say, said or did. Or, or you, can, you, have, you can verify this if you have siblings and you're grown up and then you talk about events that happened in your childhood when we were six years old. You talk to your brother or your sister, do you remember this event when, we, when I was six and you were eight or you were seven? Do you remember what happened? And then your sibling says, no, that's not what happened. So this is what happened. It's completely different. But each one thinks that's ex exactly how it is. And in some cases it may well be, but whatever it is, it's a memory in your mind. You replay it, old, an old movie, it replays itself and often involving people, what somebody did to you, undoubtedly they did do that to you, and they shouldn't have done it, this is very true. Many people have had relatively unconscious parents, they did their best, but nobody can act, act beyond their level of consciousness. I realized that it was a wonderful liberation when I realized I was ready later in my life I realized that my parents could not have 
acted differently because that would have been beyond their level of consciousness at that particular time. And so I was able to accept the mistakes they made, the craziness of my, my childhood. <laughs> um, I was able to accept that as just like a natural phenomenon, like bad weather or thunderstorm. <laughs> So in my childhood, for a lot of the time, the weather was bad, but at least that's not a, there's nothing personal in bad weather. So if you personalize the unconsciousness of other humans, then you create an identity for them, and, and that amplifies your own concept-based identity as the victim of those people. That's a, even if you were a victim, the danger is to have a victim identity, to do, in other words, to derive your sense of self from the fact of having been a victim, at least as you, as you see it. It might be an illusion too, we don't know. So many people these days, victim has become very fashionable these days, you might have noticed. So many people, egos, it's, it's the, the, oh, I haven't used the word ego yet tonight, that's what, 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 uh, we're to, that's what we're talking about, the ego, the unconscious mind, that, that is what we're talking about. So let's get back to the, this, the, the fundamental practice of not always falling into the trap of naming. For that you have to sometimes let go of your compulsive need to look at your device whenever you're waiting for something. It has enormous repercussions, just this little practice. Just be there as a, as a presence. Let's take the, most, the simplest thing, um, supermarket, line up, okay, there you are. <coughs> there are four or five people ahead of you. The lineup always looks longer than it really is these days because people still keep their distance. <laughs> so even just five people seems incredibly long. And there you are, and you're observing, and let's, you're not taking out your phone. And you observe the cashier, and you observe that the cashier is not very efficient <laughs> and spends too much time talking to people. So why can't they? She should hurry up, we're all waiting here. Why can't they do that more efficiently? Can't they train people properly here? What is this? I can't stand this anymore. Why is di mental dialogue going on? And then you feel an emotion that reflects what your mind is saying. And then you might even say something. Well, well get on with it. Come on. And you can argue, you talk to the person in front of you. Do you see how slow she is? <laughs> yes, yes, you're right. Oh, okay. So we can all complain and feel better about it. Now, that's a compulsion, it's unconscious. And what you're actually experiencing is unpleasantness. It's, you're experiencing, one could even say, it's a, obviously, it's a form of unhappiness but you don't, it's not usually recognized as a form of unhappiness, or the Buddha would probably call it suffering. It's a form of unhappiness that arises in that you're not happy with this moment, obviously. And then, of course, <laughs> you might notice that there are many, many moments that you're not happy with. Many moments you're not happy with, in one form or another, one way or another, you're not happy with it. There are many human beings alive today who are virtually never happy with any moment. That's a terrible fate. Never happy with any, always carrying a residue in the background or in the foreground, a residue of unhappiness. It has, it has taken hold of them. It occupies their mind and the, the emotional field, and they have become it. They don't know it because they are it. It's a terrible fate. This is the unconscious state. 
So you're in the lineup in the supermarket and you notice that you're becoming unhappy. Ah, that's a big gain in consciousness. Instead of just being unhappy, <laughs> you notice that you're unhappy. There's, you notice the unhappy thoughts, the narrative. You notice the unhappy, contracted, probably, emotion that goes with the thought. It's a reflection of the thought. And you notice that that noticing is a gain in consciousness because there's a slight stepping out of it. And the noticing is the rising of awareness or presence. That's a huge gain. So I, right now, I'm here. And you notice I've been unhappy for the past three minutes and telling myself things about this moment. Okay, that's a huge gain. And then at this moment, the possibility arises for you to try something else. And what you try is, what I have described here as our basic spiritual practice, what you try is not to add any unnecessary baggage to this moment. By unnecessary baggage, I mean thoughts. You don't add the baggage of thought to your experience of this moment. So instead of experiencing this moment through the veil of thinking, you experience this moment through your awareness, the field of awareness. Wow. Okay, let's this imaginary person standing in the lineup at the supermarket then says, Okay, how would I experience this moment if I did not add any thought to it or any label or any interpretation? How would I experience this moment with, without this adding on of the, the, I call it baggage? Okay, let's try this. Okay, you let go of interpretation and there you are standing there's still three, four people ahead of you. There's a lovely cashier being kind to everybody. A little slow, yes, but kind. But even that, you're not even saying that in your mind. You're just allowing your experience of this moment to be as it is without the, inter the compulsive interpretation, compulsively imposing narratives. You experience... Okay, what do you experience then? You experience your sense perception, you see these human beings. They are all human beings like yourself, doing things, standing. And you might also experience as part of the your direct experience of the present moment, you might also experience that you're breathing. You didn't, hadn't noticed that before. Of course you're breathing, but you hadn't noticed it. But to notice that you're breathing is actually quite very pleasant because you're noticing, it's the beginning of noticing that you're actually alive beyond the thinking mind. That there's a life in you that's beyond the thinking mind. So you're noticing your breathing. And you're observing your surroundings. Okay. Now how the same situation, exactly the same situation, you then notice the falling away of unhappiness. Completely, exact. Nothing has changed externally. So wow. And then you, you're breathing, and if you're consciously, if you're conscious of the, your breathing, which happens when you're in the present, you may also feel what I describe the inner body, which is an awareness that your body is pervaded by a sense of aliveness which most people don't notice except when perhaps maybe they notice it when they're getting a massage or something, I don't know. But most of the time people are trapped in the, the upper story of the, the if the body is a building, <coughs> it likes you, that most people inhabit most of the time the, the loft of the building, which is the thinking mind. I don't know what's going on down there. All kinds of weird things are going on down there all kinds of dramas and stuff. So you notice your body is pervaded by a sense of aliveness. I'm talking about it now, but these are words and concepts. As I'm talking about it, I can feel 
that this body is pervaded by a sense of aliveness. It's, so it's very subtle at first. It's in your hands, it's in your feet, it's in your legs. It's in the entire global, this entire global sense of aliveness. Every cell is alive. It's alive. Oh. And you don't need to think of that. I'm just describing it in words. But this is not an experience that is verbal at all. So you're breathing. So yeah, coming back to the supermarket, you're in the line. You let go of interpretations of this moment. Allow yourself to the experience of this moment without resisting the experience of this moment. And you become aware of sense perceptions and you become aware of breathing, become aware of perhaps a little bit of the aliveness that inhabits the inhabiting presence in your body. Whatever that may be, we don't need to talk about that right now. Whatever that may be, the, there is a, con a, a consciousness that is, pervades the body that keeps it going. The countless complicated, highly complex function need to be coordinated con continuously. It's unbelievable, unbelievable complexity of intelligence that is operating continuously in and through your body uh, <coughs> until it doesn't. And then the body immediately <laughs> dissolves. The, the animating presence within and that so the, here's this man or woman or whatever tender standing in the lineup in the supermarket and the entire ex has changed the entire experience of this moment has changed by dropping letting go of the narrative and all unhappiness has dissolved around that moment you have allowed that moment to be as it is in, in some cases you can take action or you need to take action. That's a different thing. That's again, if, there's, if action is called for, you take action. But you're waiting in line at the supermarket or airport, there isn't much you can do except be. So here you are, you have to notice the shift and then underlying all this is the realization that most of the time what makes you unhappy are your mental interpretations, not the actual situation. That is a very interesting uh, realization. Most of the time, the unhappiness is created by narratives that arise in your mind in certain situations. And this applies even to complex, more complex situations. You start with simple things. And for simple things, when small forms of unhappiness arise, but you need to recognize them. Uh, if you're really unconscious, you love that unhappiness. If you're really unconscious, you love the anger, you love the irritation, you want more of it, but not you, the ego, the mental, the mental the image of you. The ego loves it, it wants more of it, it mistakes good for bad. What is good, it calls bad, what is bad, it calls good. <laughs> so when you're an anger, in the grip of anger or irritation, the ego, you think about it more, you want to, and if you can, you talk to somebody about it, you, you want feedback, you either you want to make them angry too, or you get some feedback that you're, total, you're totally justified in being angry. You know what he said, and then why can't they do this? Don't you agree? Yeah, you're right. You're, you're, you're sorry. Yeah. I'm unhappy too. We can both enjoy our unhappiness <laughs> and, and, and indulge in it. Or the anger. How dare they? How dare they? How dare you? My God. Uh, shame on you. Shame on you. Oh. The ego loves that. Because when it can accuse somebody, make somebody really wrong, it feels amplified. It feels it has grown. It has it gets in, in, it gets inflated. It gets bigger. The more you can show others are wrong and you are right, then the ego grows in that. But what is it that grows? It's the a fictitious sense of self becomes even more, even bigger. <laughs> And it feels good to the ego, but it doesn't feel good to you. If you looked 
at your, the inside of your body when you're in a, in a toxic state of consciousness, or unconsciousness is the best word, then you would notice that the body, it affects the body in unpleasant ways. There was a, 200 years ago or something, that was a, um, a man got injured, he got a, a hole in his stomach, <clears throat> and for the first time doctors were able to look into the person's stomach, in, uh, <laughs> I don't know all the details of the story, but they discovered that when this person got angry, the lining of this, the stomach changed in color, color, became more dark, more dark red. <laughs> so every, every emotion every thought affects the body, in, in not in a good way. It, it, it disrupts the energy flow in the body and so on and so on. Even mainstream medicine is beginning to realize that stress is a... Uh, greatly diminishes your immune system. It makes you more susceptible to disease. It doesn't mean that every disease arises to that, but in often, in many cases, it, it does. Not, there are many other causes for disease. So, letting go of interpretation, then you see what 2,000 years ago, um, there was an ancient philosopher in Greece who already said that. He's not very well known these days. His name was Epictetus. And he said, what makes you unhappy is not the situation, but the story you're telling yourself about the situation. Oh, that's so interesting. The story you're telling yourself makes you unhappy, but not the situation. <clears throat> now, if you have an, if your life is, if you're not happy with your life, really what you call your life is, a, is again the story of your life. Your life, I call it your life situation. In the power of now, uh, I don't remember a lot of it, but I remember that I wrote, <laughs> <laughs> you have your life situation, which most people call their la my life, but that's not your life. Your life situation is a story in your mind. Okay, of course you have memories, but do you derive your entire sense of self from that dimension? That is uh, not pleasant. Your life situation, but your life is always inseparable from the present moment. That's where your life happens. Your life situation has a past and, of course, also a future because you're thinking what's going to happen for, for the future, which is a, also a mental creation. It's fine. We need it for practical purposes. But beyond that, the future does not exist. Is that true? Let me think. Well, yes, well, I have never experienced it because when you experience the so-called future, it's the present moment. There is nothing other than the present moment. So the future is inseparable from thought. It's fine, we need it to operate here on this level. We couldn't have, this meeting would have been impossible without, without uh, believing in future to some extent. I, we, we, we could not have said at some point we will meet somewhere in the present moment. <laughs> <laughs> so we, for practical purposes it, it works. But when it, it takes over your mind and then your, it, it involves your entire sense of identity, then you have not only the burden of your past, but then you also have the burden of your future, which contains the two seemingly contradictory elements of hope, maybe it's going to get better, my life is going to get better at some point, it's nice to have hope, it's going to get better, one day it'll get better, I'm going to make it, one day I will make it whatever that is. I don't know what, how you're going to make it. 
one day. And then, of course, you have the other element that part of future is the fear of the future. You have the two, the, the hope and fear are always associated with future. The hope is there. Some people have a lot of hope, which is not better than to have fear. But it's still, to, to have too much hope, you're never present. You're, if you live through hope, you lose the ability to appreciate life now. You lose the ability to acknowledge the beauty and wonder of the present moment because you're hoping your life situation will get better. So that you can hope is not necessarily bad, but if there's too much of it, you lose this. And this is all there ever is. So you lose a lot. <laughs> you lose your whole life. By looking for your life in the future, you lose your life, which is now. <laughs> and, and then you have the fear, because not only does the future hold the promise of some kind of ultimate fulfillment, one day I will have, I will have arrived. Fulfillment. Sometimes when you can be fully yourself, you can relax, you, you've made it, you, every, you, uh, you have a totally secure life situation. One point, you, you, have a, you have a house, you have a good income, you have a wonderful relationship, family, all, a career. You want all that. It's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. But life is messy for everybody. And no matter how much positive thinking you do, which is a wonderful thing, but no matter if you practice positive thinking, it will have a positive impact on your life. However, you will still experience that life is full of challenges. And there's the future. The future has, holds the promise of fulfillment, which will, by the way, never come. Because if you haven't learned to find fulfillment in the present moment, you have lost, you lose the ability to acknowledge being. That's where fulfillment lies. If you lose the ability to acknowledge the goodness of the present moment, then you will never find that in the future. But yes, it holds the, sometimes things do get better in the future, obviously until they get worse again. And so the hope is the promise of future fulfillment. But then you have the fear also, because future is not only going to hopefully give you what you want, future is also going to take away what it has given you, because it's going to kill you. So the thing you're always looking towards to give you fulfillment, that thing is going to kill you too. Oh my God. <laughs> Time. It's a, from moment of birth you are infected with this dreadful incurable disease called time. And Sooner or later, it kills you. <laughs> but time, of course, is ultimately inseparable from thought. You have a life situation that exists in time, past and future. That's fine, everybody has that. But more vitally, beyond your life situation, which is your past and your future, so-called your... Uh, beyond that, there is the immediacy of the present moment. The only thing there ever ultimately is, is this moment. Your life unfolds in and as the present moment. And so, that's the, the key to all spirituality and the key to awakening is to awaken to the present moment. And so I'm going to take up again the practice that I mentioned a little earlier in the past. The practice 
there's always a contradiction where this is this gathering is here is to become more present of the present moment uh, it, it sounds like a paradox we're spending two hours here to go more deeply into the present moment because time doesn't exist <laughs> it's a paradox but we're talking at this one level one dimension of existence and a deeper level that is timeless we're approaching the timeless level from the dimension of time that's why it, it seem, it's seemingly paradoxical so you remember we talked about being not adding thought unnecessary interpretations sometimes interpretations are needed of, the, of whatever arises sometimes they are helpful but a lot of the time they are compulsive and unnecessary they take away from your the immediacy of the present moment the ability to, to deeply acknowledge the aliveness of this moment so we talked about the person in the supermarket how he or she was able to become free of the narrative and then experience the same situation free of unhappiness i asked you earlier to be aware of your sense perceptions here without needing to add anything any narrative just be with it in other words the word that I haven't used so far is stillness there's a stillness in the background of your perceptions when you're not adding a narrative a mental interpretation a thought when you when you're not adding a thought there is an inner stillness behind your sense perception that's very for example now Now, the next step is this, is to become aware not only of sense perceptions, but also become aware of that stillness that's behind the sense perceptions. S aware of the stillness, but the stillness is the awareness. <laughs> so it sounds, when I talk about it, it sounds like two, it sounds like I am aware of the stillness but that's only when I put it into words because that's how language operates as a subject and an object in the sentence there's a duality that's created when I talk about it that is not there in actuality now this means the stillness that you sense behind sense perceptions is the awareness itself so when I say become aware of the stillness one could almost say that the stillness becomes aware of itself the awareness becomes aware of itself so again let's practice here you're conscious of sense perceptions the room person on a chair but you're also conscious you you can sense that behind your sense perceptions there is a you can't define it very easily just a sense of presence or beingness without which you would not be able to perceive anything it, it is a requisite you cannot without the consciousness there's no perception <laughs> there must be a perception behind the organs of perception there must be a consciousness behind the organs of perception the, and that consciousness is the essence of who you are it's the presence it's it's the transcendent dimension is that will that is deeper than the personality that is deeper than your far deeper than your personal history the personal history is insig insignificant temporary fragment f compared to the depth and the power of that stillness or presence whatever word you want to use that is so to be aware of that dimension in yourself 
And that's why I said it's so important whenever you're waiting for something, that's what you practice. You're not only aware of your surroundings, that's, that's step one. And then the next step is you're aware of being aware. <laughs> that's the deeper step. And then you can simultaneously be aware of your surroundings through sensory perception and be aware that you are aware. You sense your own, it's not your own, but we just call it that, because there, there's ultimately only, there's only one consciousness, it manifests through this form temporarily. So you're, you're aware of the, the presence that you are, the I am, the I am that, uh, as you may remember from the Old Testament, God is asked, I can't remember by whom, Moses or Abraham, ask God, who are you? What's your name? <laughs> and God says, I am. I am that I am. That's a very profound statement. That is, it is pointing to the, the being that underlies all existence. Now, existence is whatever manifests in this universe. It has a form. It manifests as some form. And we are only aware of uh, certain forms that manifest, the so-called physical forms. There are, no doubt, many other forms that life can take that we are not aware of. So, Existence manifests through life forms. It exists. I exist as this body. Ex, this means, ex means out. Ist comes from the Latin to, to stand. It stands out. It exists. Whatever exists stands out. It, it is manifested. Every human being exists as a form a manifested form, but beyond existence there is an essence that animates and expresses itself through all forms. There is a deeper essence. That deeper essence we could call being. So we could have being and existence. Being is an, is an intelligence that underlies beyond the physical universe or any f universe that is consists of manifested forms underlying the the organizing principle behind this wondrous universe there is a vast intelligence that operates underneath <coughs> now is that something you don't need to believe in that i'm just through my own in intuition tells me that that there's a there's a vast intelligence that underlies the phenomenal world. This vast intelligence, is that vast intelligence God? Well, I would suggest that it is, now we're going to very deep territory, <laughs> talking about God, not easy. You have to be really careful because whatever you say is probably wrong. Or what, whatever you say can only be an approxim a distant approximation to what it is because language is so limited. But ultimately, I'm just producing sounds here. I mean, they're just five vowels. A, A, whatever they are, A, E, I, O, U. The vowels are produced by the vocal cords. Then there are the others, are they called diphthongs? I can't remember what they're called. The, 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 sound, the sounds that are produced by friction of air through the mouth. <laughs> now, every word consists of these and the vowels. So you, it's a mixture of five basic sounds produced by the vocal cords and air pressure produced in the mouth. And how can that explain the universe? I mean, it's absurd. <laughs> 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 and nevertheless we try <laughs> knowing that it's it's a very inadequate 
it's not an explanation, it's an, like a poem that hints at something. It's not, it's not it, uh, as a, some of you have probably read the famous Tao Te Ching, the ancient Chinese wonderful book of uh, spiritual, uh, one of the great spiritual books, and the first sentence is the Tao, which is, we're just talking about, the Tao that can be spoken of is not the true Tao. That's the beginning of the book, and then he starts, speaks about it. Uh, so, all oh, that reminds me, I, I, I found in my uh, jacket a note um, that I never used, I had it in my, for a talk, must have been for a talk or something, that is relevant here, what I'm saying. <laughs> I don't usually use notes. This is a quote from Albert Einstein, the, the uh, famous, the world's most famous scientist, uh, who had also a, a deep, he was also a mystic, he, was, uh, he had a deep connectedness with, with being, he was very, uh, very different from the, the ordinary uh, intellectual scientist, uh, he, he had many moments of stillness, he was a very slow developer, he was a child, he learned to speak very late in life. His parents thought he was perhaps a little retarded because he was so slow, he was just deep. And people asked him about religion, are you religious, do you believe in God? And uh, this is what he said. Um, so he talks, he said, well, the scientist's religious feeling is perhaps like this. He's talking about his own religious feeling. The, the, his religious feeling is, it, this, my religious feeling takes the form of a rapturous amazement of natural law, which reveals an intelligence of such superiority that compared with it, all the systematic thinking and acting of human beings is an utterly insignificant reflection. That was his religion. He could see wondrous amazement at the underlying intelligence that is behind the world of phenomena. And the, this is interesting, rapturous amazement, this, this implies that he was able to look at, at phenomena without immediately interpreting and calling it something, and by calling it something, falling into the de delusion that he knows what it is. Because that's, uh, many times this happens in our uh, world, when we call it something, we, th we think we know what it is. When you call a tree, that's an oak tree, okay, now I know what it is. And you haven't seen the the amazement of that that being that's been there, let's say, for 500 years. It's been standing there, and the magnificence and the, the aliveness that's behind it and in it, because you've called it something, and then you think you know what it is. There's a mystery there that gets completely dismissed the moment you impose a conceptual interpretation on the tree. And so that's a danger that many humans fall into through the thinking mind, which means the lack of awareness. They, by attaching a name to something, they think that's what it is. No, it's just oak tree. It's a few sounds. <laughs> and, and then you know, you know what? Uh, and a, 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 a bird is singing. Night, oh, that's a nightingale. Oh, okay. No, I don't have to listen anymore. It's a nightingale. Now I know it is. <laughs> so the mystery of life is only, to get a sense of mystery, you know, to have to be able to look at something without immediately imposing interpretation. I believe that Einstein was able to do that because otherwise he would not have been in rapturous amazement of natural law that reveals an intelligence of such superiority that compared with it all the systematic thinking and acting of human beings is an utterly insignificant reflection. That is also wonderful modesty and 
he was not in the grip of ego, I know, I am the great one, no. He knew uh, the, the great mystery, you cannot know the great mystery, not, certainly not intellectually. So there's underlying this world, phenomenal world, as it's sometimes called in philosophy, the world of phenomena, uh, a, a vast intelligence. Is now is that that this is something that, of course, before we go more deeply, is of course denied to a large extent by mainstream science. Is still it doesn't. A few great scientists have recognized there's more, much more to this world than the matter, the physical matter. But but in main, for mainstream science still mostly still believes that the, the ground of all existence is physical matter and there's nothing beyond physical matter. That's, the, that's still the belief and not only that, also the belief that still it's reflected everywhere in life, it, it's, it's in the mainstream, the belief that that unfortunately started with Darwin, 19th century, he made a wonderful discovery the discovery was that there is an evolution of life on the planet. Life forms evolve through time, become more complex. But behind that real wonderful discovery was the belief that it, this evolution is totally random. It is a random coming together of atoms and molecules. Just accidentally they're coming together. There's nothing beyond that. It's the entire universe is a random event, is the belief, that has ultimately, there's no, obviously no purpose in a random event, it's just, uh, that's, this belief has seeped into the popular culture, even people who've never heard of Darwin or the theory of evolution, uh, got affected by that over, uh, into the, for, from the beginning of the late 19th century to the beginning of 20th century, it seeped into the popular culture the a kind of ni nihilism, nihilism, that is all ulti because ultimately, if, if everything is totally random, everything is ultimately pointless, and all you can do is ne hedonistic pursuits, get as much pleasure as you can out of life, because the, there's nothing else. So you might as well eat and drink and have sex and experience as much as you can because you better hang on to this. Oh, and it's horrible. It's, oh. <laughs> so the random coming together, how this is, I don't want to go too much into this, but uh, they have, it's virtually impossible for this, the magnificence of this to, to be a random random events. The famous story, have you heard of the monkey and the typewriter? Well, typewriter, maybe nowadays we would use a different uh, keyboard. Uh, so if you, if you put a monkey in front of a keyboard, then the monkey starts typing. And so if it's, the whole universe is random, it means at some point, if you just give the monkey enough time, like a billion years or two billion years, if you give the monkey enough time, he will eventually produce a, a, a great work of Shakespeare, like it's one of Hamlet or something, King Lear. He's just giving him enough time, just random letters. And at some point, a great work of literature will emerge after a billion years. And it, I don't think it will. <laughs> now, this intelligence that underlies why, why do I talk about this and how can you know this? You can know this in yourself. That's where, if you want to learn the secrets of the universe, most of it, or all of it, you can actually find if you go deeply enough into yourself. If you realize that beyond the thinking mind and beyond sense perceptions, beyond all that, there is in you a silent presence. 
it's just words, we call it that for a moment. There's a silent presence. And that presence is beyond the personality. It's nothing to do with your personal history or your age or your gender or your race. Sorry about all the people who are so concerned with gender and race and race. That's all form identity, fine. It's your form identity. Those are form identity. Your gender is your form identity. Your race is your form. Your physical body is your form identity. Uh, your past is your form identity. Psychological form identity. But beyond form identity, there is essence identity. And that is the, that is the liberation, as it's sometimes called in Indian spiritual Hinduism, the, the liberation. The liberation is the liberation from only knowing yourself as a form identity. And that's all there is to you. That means you only know yourself as this body and the psychological form, which is a narrative of you, which is your and your person, the conditioning of your mind and your personality, the, the personality that you are. That's me. Uh, and you only know yourself as that. You do not, there is no depth to who you are. There is, but you don't know it. The, and if you don't know it, it is as if there were no depths. So in other words, humans then exist on the surface of life only, uh, the, uh, which we may call the horizontal dimension, not knowing that there's not only the horizontal, there's a vertical dimension to life. That's the cross, which one of the meaning, the deeper mystical meaning of the cross is the intersection of the horizontal dimension, which is past and future and involves doing, doing this, that, future, the intersection of that with the vertical dimension of being, which is present moment, which is presence. So and here you have humans do not awaken spiritually until they awaken to this, the vertical dimension of life, which is inseparable from the present moment. And then you have both, you have, then you become a true human being. This is my terminology for human beings. As you know, the English language does not have a word that, that encompasses men and women. You have to say, in the past, often in books you read man, you're supposed to include women, but it doesn't work very well. So you have to, in German you have mensch, which means human being. It doesn't, you do. But in English you have to put two words together, human being. But I like that now because it can be quite, if you understand, it's uh, the meaning I give it is very deep. You are, until you realize the being dimension, which is inseparable from the being of you, the, the I am. I am is the first person singular of the verb to be, by the way, if you forgot about that. It sounds totally different word, but to be is the infinitive, to talk about grammar. I am is the first person singular, the same verb. I am, is I, I be, one should really say. I am being. This is the being dimension. The human dimension is who you are as a person or personality. You're human. We're all humans. But are we human beings? The being is the transcendent dimension, is the vertical. The two, they have, to, your purpose in life, as I see it, is to become aware, to bring together the vertical and the horizontal. In fact, to use the horizontal as, because the, when, you're, when you're operating on the horizontal level only, you, in, you encounter more and more suffering and unhappiness because of the lack of the vertical dimension, the lack of being. So even if you do well initially in life, you might have be successful and make money and whatever, uh, enter relationships and then they, then they fail and the and maybe the whatever you, you, you encounter unhappiness if you do if you have not even a glimpse 
even having a glimpse of the vertical dimension can to some extent free you from excessive unhappiness. But if you have no, not even a glimpse of, we could also call it spiritual dimension, if you don't even have a glimpse of that, you, your, your life is, becomes really frustrating, or only moving on the horizontal dimension. Then with one damn thing after another, then everything seems to be, uh, everything turns into, turns into suffering. I'm quoting the Buddha now because that's what he said. He said, no matter what you do and where you go, you will encounter suffering the truth of suffering. This is the one of the foundations of the teaching of Buddha is dukkha, which is the Pali word for suffering. Dukkha, no matter, so basically, wherever you go, whatever you do, sooner or later you will, found, you will find suffering. Suffering can also be translated as just unhappiness or misery or uh, unsatisfactoriness. Any, any situation you go into after a while, uh, mm, relationships, you get married, Mm. One <laughs> wonderful person at first, and then you discover there are other there are other people in that person too, and they're not wonderful. <laughs> and sometimes they come out, and you say, well, "How could I've married this person? It's so awful." Of course, every human carries many ent like thought made entities, emotional, mental entities inside. They are not integrated because of lack of awareness. So you can have a, a wonderful human being who is wonderful one day and extremely obnoxious the next day, and, and then they're wonderful again. Uh, there's no, no integration of the various mental, emotional streams, but that's another story. So here we have the integration of vertical and horizontal. In fact, the horizontal is there to challenge you and to ultimately um, make life difficult for you, and it will. Life is challenging and the world, what you experience as the world, Life, your life, surprisingly, contrary to popular belief, your life and the world, your world, is not here to make you happy. <laughs> no, it isn't. That, that means I've lived under the wrong assumption all my life. And I've been always angry and irritated and complaining if the world didn't make me unhappy and it very rarely did and when it did me un make me un make me happy make me happy only for short periods of time <coughs> the world is not here to make you happy hmm so what is it here for to make me unhappy well it can do that easily but it's here to awaken you that really is the, the function of the horizontal dimension. It, to frustrate you enough to provide the impetus, the motivating force for the awakening of consciousness. Wow. That means all the so-called bad things that happen to you were actually good things. <laughs> From a deeper perspective, they were still bad on, 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 on one level, on the purely horizontal level, they were bad. But when you enter the vertical dimension, you realize that you were brought to it by the force of many of you most of you, or all of you, I don't know, but what did, by the force of dissatisfaction with unhappiness, with, with a regular, regular existence, because you've had perhaps experienced successes, but then after a while it didn't turn out that great either. So 
what awakens you is the obstacles that life puts in your path. <coughs> which is another way of putting it. The challenges, the obstacles, the bad things. Because only then there's the possibility of transcendence. You, you need a higher consciousness in order to transcend your unhappiness, and in order to transcend your sense of identity, which is connected to the stream of thinking only. And you, that sense of identity brings unhappiness. Every ego brings unhappiness. So the world is here to awaken you. And that applies on all levels of existence. It's only when things get difficult, you come up against difficulty, an obstacle, that new energy is generated. It begins even with a little thing, on a, even on a level of physical energy. Everything is energy, even just... That's another story, I don't want to go there. Uh, <laughs> even on the, on the physical, if you want to get stronger on the physical level, you have to exercise, do something. You cannot get stronger if you lie on your sofa every day and watch television or whatever on your device. Okay, I really want to get stronger. <clears throat> now, if you want to get stronger, you have to start doing something. You can might maybe jogging or weightlifting. Now, weightlifting is at first not pleasant at all. I I haven't done any in a very long time, as you might have guessed. But you, you, weightlifting is what are you doing when you're wasting weight? You are making life difficult for your body, obviously. And nothing will happen if you do not make life difficult for your body. And then your body sort of almost cries out internally for more energy. I need more energy. And then you start jogging. And at first it's, oh my God, <laughs> not enjoyable at all. And then your body after a while needs to be I need more energy. And this need of the body is then suddenly met by an influx of more, on the purely physical level, by an influx of more strength and more power. It would never have come if life for the body had not become difficult. So you make your life difficult, then there's a need for more energy. And this is just on the physical level, but it operates on all levels. And then, the, the jogging, once the energy comes, the jogging becomes actually very enjoyable because there's an increased energy flow, so much so that some people get addicted to, to their jogging practice. <laughs> so when the, an obstacle is met, there's a call for more energy on every level. That goes even from the, from the physical energy, Every, even consciousness is uh, the higher f vibrational frequency of the one energy, and the lowest frequency we know is matter. The solid physical matter is energy too, as we all know from physics. Even those who know very little about physics, like myself, I know that this table, seemingly solid, is energy, just energy, and it is, consists of atoms and molecules and incessant motion. <laughs> And in between, vast spaces of just emptiness. Just 99%, more than 99% empty space is this solid table here. Well, but it's, this is, I'd, I would suggest that this one energy that pervades the cosmos is, can, it expresses itself in different vibrational frequencies, just like like water can have different can express itself as as ice, which is solid. It can express it as as water, which is fluid and soft, and it and it can express it as vapor, in which it rises it, it like a mist. So, so it can exist different different frequencies. And matter is is the lower frequency of consciousness. One could say consciousness totally asleep totally asleep and then 
consciousness begins to awaken in a plant. And then there's a the next level, an animal. And then there's the next level, the human, which is still closely related to animal, but there's a possibility of a further awakening in the human. So, then you can put a plant, the gardener sometimes, I talked to a gardener once, he, he, he had planted some seeds, and then when the plant, the little, it sprouted, he put more soil on top of the sprouting small plant, a bit more soil, and he said, why are you doing this? He said, the plant will get stronger if it encounters this resistance. <laughs> it gets stronger if it encounters that resistance. It needs to force itself through it, and then it gains in strength. So the, um, the, all the, the challenges that we meet in life, we can find a, a very different attitude towards them if you recognize them, that they are opportunities for a deepening of consciousness instead of reactivity and complaining and believing that the universe is treating you unfairly, which many people have. The entire universe is engaged in a process of awakening. This is the evolution the entire context for our gathering here, the wider context for our gathering is the evolution of consciousness in the universe. It looks like just human beings meeting in a room. That's the surface appearance of what's happening here. But on a deeper level, this is a manifestation of the, the growth in consciousness in the universe because you're not you're not in the universe you are the universe the universe that is expressing itself through and as you and when I say universe I don't mean just the phenomenal universe that you perceive with your senses yes that also but that deeper intelligence that underlies all manifestations all, all this is what Einstein talked about and now we come back to the question that I've been avoiding because we're going to say something about God is this when you sense that stillness that alive presence in you like now is that God? Is that a, you can, do you touch God there? Is it what the Bible says somewhere? It says, I believe it in, in one of the Psalms, be still and know that I am God. That's be still and know that I am God. That's in the Bible somewhere. Now well, that's very interesting. <clears throat> These words, be still, know I am God. Those words are all aspects of the one truth. Because the stillness is the stillness of being itself, not existence. Existence comes and goes. Underlying existence is being. You are a human, but you're also, or more fundamentally, more essentially, you are the being underneath the human. So the, the being is there, and it expresses itself as the phenomenal universe. Be still. Still is the ultimately the absence of thinking for a moment and just awareness stillness stillness means absence of thinking in the inner realm the word for outer things is silence when there's an absence of noise in the outer world you call it silence the inner world when there's an absence of thought activity but you haven't gone to sleep you're very awake you're very alert but yet there's no narratives that is stillness and stillness is the being 
know that I am God, there is a knowing in that stillness, which is totally non-conceptual knowing. In, in that knowing, the being knows itself as God. However, and again, please remember, I'm just using words. So, it's not the, the ultimate truth cannot be expressed in words, it's only a distant approximation. That which you sense when thinking subsides, if only for a moment, and you can sense the beingness that is always there underneath it, the timeless presence, you, can, you sense that. Is that, and then as you can sense that, and you, you become more rooted in it, even in your daily life, you begin to be able to sense that in the background through the simple fact that, that you are aware that you are aware, even when you're doing things. You're aware that you're aware when you're looking at something, there's not only what you're looking at, there's only the awareness that you're aware of. So that's there. The awareness of awareness. And that, what now, is that God? I would suggest not quite. It is, I'm speaking purely in intuitively, and, but some mystics and others have had similar realizations. It's the emanation of God. In, this, in other words, the consciousness that inhabits you and temporarily disguises itself as a person is an emanation of the source of all life. And that source which cannot be named, which does not exist, because exist means to have a location in space and time, everything exists is somewhere. <laughs> so in that sense, God does not exist, because God does not have a, God is <coughs> beyond this dimension where existence unfolds. But like the sun emanating light, God, or the source of all life, which cannot be named or understood at all, emanates consciousness into this dimension. And gradually, this dimension evolves. Gradually, it expresses more of that light that emanates from the transcendent source of all life. Gradually, this, this, because this universe, this was important discovery of Darwin, that there is an evolution of life. It becomes increasingly complex. What he didn't realize is there's an intelligence that expresses itself through that. So there's a, there's a source of all life beyond the transcendent source, which is God. And God shines like the sun shines. And the, what, uh, the, the light of the sun you can feel it on your skin. Now, whether you say, this is the sun, <laughs> in some sense, the light of the sun is the sun, because there's no separation. But in another sense, the sun is uh, not different, but infinitely vaster than the light that you feel on your skin. Uh, in the same way that the emanation of God, which is consciousness, uh, yes, it's God in the sense of it is an emanation of God. And so this is what you are. You're an emanation from source, source emanation. And the, the consciousness in you is the light. As Jesus said to his disciples, but he meant really every human being because his disciples were not that special. You are the light of the world, he said. And he said it of himself in another gospel. He said, I am the light of the world. He said both things. He told others, you are the light of the world. And he said, I am the light of the world. What could that possibly be except that because his, the people he was talking to were not special, particularly important VIPs in this world. 
but you are the light of the world. The light in you is the consciousness in you. And, and without the consciousness, you are the consciousness of the world. <laughs> you are the light of the world. Without the consciousness, the world would not even be. <clears throat> and that is when you realize that, that your essential identity is being consciousness, which is an emanation of source, whatever you want to call that. And your essential identity is that, the being. And then that then that is where you derive your sense of identity from, who you are. It's no longer the memory of your past it becomes relatively insignificant. Yes, you remember it, but the wonderful thing about your past, it has brought you to this point of awakening. No matter how senseless it seemed at the time, because every life is kind of messy in, in, in one way or another, and many things seem, why did this happen to me? Why did I do that? That was so stupid. Or, or why did th this have to happen to me? My childhood c could have been happy. It was so unhappy. Why did this? But all your past did, it, it brings you to this point of awakening. So it fulfilled its function. But it no longer gives you an identity. You, re you recognize it. It's, you acknowledge it. You know it. But you no longer derive your sense of who you are from your past that comes from a deeper place ah the you can sense the the presence that you are the being that you are not conditioned by your past whatsoever and this is especially liberating if you have a very heavy past if you if dreadful things happened in your past it is especially liberating to sense that and it's often people who have had a very difficult life that come to this realization. They have had their crucifixion, and then there comes the transcendence of suffering. As it's pointed out, even for non-Christians, even if you're not a Christian, you don't have to be a Christian to understand the deeper significance of the cross, which is no different from the Buddha's teachings. Buddha said, I teach suffering and the end of suffering. And in uh, the Christian cross, it's there as an image. The, the teaching is, the suffering is the cross is the instrument of suffering Jesus is nailed to the cross this the deepest image of suffering but the cross is also the symbol for transcendence of suffering the cross is also symbol for the divine it's both it's a torture instrument and it's a symbol for the divine that's amazing the two together this is this can be a, a teaching can be transmitted in this way even to people who would not never understand it conceptually, as I'm talking about it conceptually. There's a deep truth embedded in that archetypal image. Jesus is the archetypal human, and the, the cross and this is the archetypal journey of every human being. So be thankful for all the the suffering that has brought you to this point. It's brought you here. That's amazing. Uh, awakening. Does it mean that from now on life will not be challenging anymore? No. The challenges continue. and But they may be of a somewhat different kind, no longer produced by the dysfunction of the egoic mind as is often the case with many humans say, but still challenges come in many forms. The difference is, as you become increasingly rooted in the being of yourself, the, the transcendent self, not the, the being, the challenges are no longer converted into suffering. So the, there's no longer a personality that complains about what's happening to me, the challenges are simply accepted for what they are. Action is taken if action is necessary or possible. No action is taken, a simple surrender happens when a challenge comes and there isn't really anything you can do. Then That's what it is. And then once you reach this point, 
every challenge can deepen, if it's a real challenge, it deepens your state of consciousness. It makes you more present. And that is a wonderful thing when you've reached that point. I have noticed with the so-called pandemic the last couple of years, uh, some people have become very, very, um, become less, less conscious than they were before the pandemic, some. <laughs> Um, this is the same with any, also the challenge that happens to, to you individually, anything going wrong in your life, a breakup, loss of a job, loss of home, a desk, someone close to you, um, a court case or whatever threat. Um, some people become more unconscious when they're being challenged by life, more reactive, more deeply entrenched in their conditioning, in the, the ego. <laughs> Every divorce lawyer meets people at their most unconscious, usually, unless they're already evolving, in which case it's, it's fine. And even realtors and people like that find people that are so, why are people, as, they get so attached to, to the outcome, result, it really pulls them down. A challenge can make you unconscious or more conscious, depending where you are at. And some people through the pandemic have become more present. They've accepted, they have had perhaps been affected in different ways, financially or jobs or life situation or relationships have been affected by it. All kinds of things have happened. And some people have been able to use that and become more, go more into being. Uh, sometimes there, there wasn't that much doing anymore. You had to go more into being. And others have become more reactive and more angry and more fearful. Fear has been a big thing. More fearful of the fear of, ultimately, the fear of death, what could happen to me. Fearful. Oh my God. That's ultimately, fear is always ultimately the fear of death, the fear, the greatest loss of myself. And, uh, that tends to go away when you are rooted in the being. Uh, I, it's hard to explain why it goes away and how it goes away, but it does. The fear of death seems to disappear. Um, I have to, I'll just mention um, the challenges c continue to come. I've had my entire life, I've, I had uh, virtually no health challenge until last, late last year, early this year, late last year. Um, I'd never been in a hospital as an inpatient, hardly ever see a doctor, and, and suddenly I was hit by a, just a few months ago, a huge challenge, what normally people would consider a, a huge life challenge to a medical condition. Oh, and they immediately comes the possibility, okay, well, well, I may only be here for another few more months or not, who knows? And after the initial um, diagnosis, I just went, okay, I became even even more empty than I normally am. I'm normally fairly empty, but <laughs> I mean, I'm just just like that. And there wasn't any no fear. I was basically dead already. There was no, I'm, but there was a presence left. The person didn't matter very much. And then I spent many hours in, in just complete presence. And then I was operated on, and then I, they looked at it again, and for the time being, the challenge seems to have dissolved completely. Will it come back? Who knows? <laughs> So that's it. They continue to come, but just the greater the challenge, the greater the intensity of presence. I've often found that 
in other situations in my life too, and the challenge has come, you go more. So there's no longer a, a person that reacts to what's happening. There's just the being, there's just the presence, just the consciousness. So in this moment of stillness, that really this moment of stillness contains the entire essence of not only what we've been talking about, but it contains the essence of who you are. And ultimately and gradually, the personality becomes less and the being becomes stronger. The, the personality becomes kind of more transparent to the light of consciousness. To use a weird analogy, is the, the, the personality is a lampshade. You as the personality, you are the lampshade. The lamp is the light of consciousness. And some lampshades are so dense that very little, little light gets through. <laughs> And then it, it happens that gradually, through the evolution of spiritual dimension, the opening up of the spiritual dimension, the personality becomes more transparent, less dense. The lampshade becomes less and less dense. And then more and more of the light of the unconditioned consciousness comes through. And that's your purpose here, is the diminishment of the self in the egoic self and the influx, the growth of consciousness where before there was a density, there's now an opening for the light to come through. So this is why you're here and all of you are bringers of that light into this world. One way or another, just your mere existence or the beingness behind your existence brings that into this world. That is the purpose, to bring more light, more consciousness into this world. It's not yours, it's never yours, it's, it comes through you. There's only one consciousness, it emanates through you. So that, that is the core message for humanity and for us becoming especially important at the present time because I have a feeling that we are moving into an, a, a, a time period of, in, of uh, turbulence. <laughs> and that is good if that's what's happening and it seems to be that is maybe bad from a perspective from the purely horizontal perspective it may be called bad and it will be bad <laughs> but but ultimately from a higher perspective whatever happens is part of the evolution of hum human consciousness and ultimately one could say there's only one of us here there's only one every human is an expression of the the human consciousness that is an emanation of the, the universal consciousness. So you, we're, we're also, if you look at humanity as one being that's evolving, then perhaps it's easier to look beyond the dreadful suffering that, is, that humans are often inflicting on each other, even more than natural events, dysfunctional humans inflicting suffering on other humans is even more common. And then you can see what looks totally nonsensical and but really bad on the purely horizontal level remains bad on the purely horizontal level, but when you see for a higher level, the, the vertical, is, whether you call it deep or higher, doesn't matter, then you realize it's part of the evolving human consciousness. And ultimately, what the essence of who you are does not die. It, it is the light of consciousness itself, the light that emanates from God. And when you know that, 
not intellectually, but even experientially, to some extent, you know that within yourself, that that's the liberation from the liberation from the person, the liberation from fear, the liberation from dysfunction, egoic dysfunction, and you are here to embody that beyond personal purposes that you may have in your life. That need they need to be aligned with universal purpose, which is bring more consciousness. No matter where you are, what you do, it's always more important how you do what you do, what you do than what you do. But the how means the underlying consciousness that is behind whatever you say or do. That be the you. Be who you, who or what you already are, which is the light of the world. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Beautiful venue here. Good energy field emanating from you. I don't know why it's taken me so long to come to this city, but I'm finally here. Thank you, I love you too. The city also has a good energy field compared to many other cities. I walked around a little yesterday. So we'll start slowly because we are not in a hurry, I assume. Not trying to get anywhere. As you may notice, although presumably I will be speaking for most of the time, there is a meditative dimension also to this gathering. Which you can sense when you become aware of, let's say, the gaps in between the words and just notice them. Normally, nobody would notice the gaps between words. In a, a conventional sense, it would be absurd. But what actually happens when you notice a gap between words or sentences, just, just notice. In that moment of noticing, your mind becomes still. Just a few seconds, one second, two seconds. So you have two dimensions here for our gathering. One is the conceptual level, words are being spoken. They come from thought, but ultimately from a deeper level. And then there is that which is beyond the words, but the relationship in, between that which is beyond the words, which is this energy field of presence, we could call it, the relationship is that the, the words are, are pointers towards that. So we can be in that meditative state without needing to say, now let's go to do a meditation. And now the meditation is finished. Okay, what's the next thing I can worry about? <laughs> Having compartments in your life, the spiritual compartment, 
and the rest of your life. Now, most of you are here because you are awakening spiritually. Now, this may not be the words that you would use, and it could be that these words, the term awakening spiritually, may not mean very much to you and may sound a little weird. And I'm not going to define right now what is meant by awakening spiritually. This will reveal itself um, organically as we speak. Another way of putting it is becoming aware of a, it sounds a little philosophical, transcendent dimension within yourself. Something that transcends who or what you are as a person. So most of you are here because that process of, one could say, evolutionary process of human consciousness, because humanity is involved in an evolutionary process of consciousness, the entire universe is evolving in the direction of greater consciousness. So the context for our gathering here is the evolution of not only human consciousness, but universal consciousness. So most of you are here because this shift has already happened or is happening in you or is beginning to happen or is already quite advanced. There may be some others here who uh, came here um, almost involuntarily because somebody else invited them <laughs> or you couldn't say no. I'm sure there are some of you here who perhaps already thinking, what is this man talking about? <laughs> and somebody might have said to you, you really need to listen to this person. Now, what may happen in your case is either this evening will be of a, in a minor way or in a big way, of a revelatory nature, you suddenly say, wow, isn't that amazing? Or it could happen that it makes no sense whatsoever. It depends on your degree of readiness. This does not depend on intelligence or education. It does not depend on IQ. Many years ago, Time magazine reviewed The Power of Now, and the reviewer described the content of The Power of Now as mumbo jumbo. <laughs> of course, I was deeply offended <laughs> and couldn't sleep for many nights. Now, this is interesting, or the, uh, I know that correlation and causation should not, causation should not be confused, but uh, Time magazine went downhill soon after that. The question is, how is it that a undoubtedly intel a person who reviews books for a magazine like that undoubtedly must have a certain degree of intelligence and education, probably one or, one or more university degrees. So what is it then that prevents this person from seeing something there that many other people find deeply meaningful and somebody else finds it totally meaningless. 
So there is a faculty in human beings that in many humans is still dormant and in others it's awakening. That's one way of describing it. And so this faculty is in everyone, or one could, another word one could use is a, a, a dimension of consciousness, a potential different level of consciousness is dormant in many humans and awakening in others. So it does not mean that these humans don't have it, it's there in everyone, but they are not ready for it, one could say, they are not ready to awaken spiritually. So that's fine, but it usually means they need to go through more suffering because in most cases it is suffering that provides the motivation, the force that is behind human awakening, awakening of consciousness. So you've all had your share of suffering, unhappiness in whatever form, turmoil, tribulation, to use a biblic, somewhat biblical term, tribulation of, of a personal nature or collective nature. So what is arising as you awaken spiritually is a level of, a dimension of consciousness that is above thinking not below thinking. Now, thinking is essentially what defines most humans and has done so for many thousands of years. Most humans derive their sense of self, identity, their sense of who they are from the movement of thought. This movement of thought creates a thought-made image or entity that you regard as who you are. There is a narrative attached to it that's an essential part of it, and this narrative you call my life. That's my life. There's the, the past, things, the main memories from the past, accumulations of that, and then you have a bundle of memories that you identify with, events, achievements, failures, sufferings, your childhood, what was done to you, what you did to others, all kinds of things. Everybody has a narrative that they call my life. And I call that, it's not really your life, it, is, it describes perhaps your life situation. It is something that you identify with, you derive your sense of self from it, and it, you don't realize when, it, when you completely identify with it that it is, a, it is a story that you tell yourself. Oh, in many cases, it's, it's not all that pleasant because my life is so problematic and so many things have happened that really shouldn't have happened. I didn't expect them to happen when I was 18, but they did. For some people, the narrative of my life is predominantly miserable and very unhappy, and for others, it's a mixed bag of good and bad. And this consists of the past, the recollections that I identify with, and then there's the future. The future, of course, you look towards the future because the narrative of me and my life may get better in the future. That's called hope. There is hope that my life will improve. And perhaps even it will all 
work itself out beautifully. Perhaps it will no longer be as messy as it is now. That's the hope for fulfillment in the future. And sometimes things do get better in the future, no doubt. And after a little while, they get worse again. So you have, you look to the future as some kind of ultimate answer or solution. And some people are so much focused on future, they're hardly here. They're focused on future, not the big future, where I'm going to be in two years, five years, ten years' time, but they continuously look to the future, even if it's the next minute, the next hour where they want to be. They're always not here. <laughs> they're always not here. They're always mentally projected into some future moment. And, of course, you need the future in practical terms. It's necessary for this world to function. You need to make plans for the future. We could not, not have met here without future because it would have been difficult to say, let's, let's meet at some point here together somewhere in Boston. At some point, we will all come together here in the present moment. But there's no future, so we don't know when. <laughs> So that doesn't work. So on a practical level, we need future. On a practical level, you can't do without it. Even I have a watch, and and I look at it. I don't like to be late, although I had to be late here tonight. So, but there is a future that's connected with a deeper sense of fulfillment, a sense of being more completely yourself, not not feeling good enough, full enough, complete enough in this moment, always needing the next moment which is regarded to be potentially better than this one. That's the hope or the striving towards there. Or, that's the, uh, on the other hand, the future is also a very threatening thing. It has this ambivalent quality it gives you hope, but it also induces fear because you don't know what it's going to do to you. <laughs> Maybe the hope is not going to work out. Maybe the future is going to do something bad to you. And sometimes it does. Well, good and hope and fear, the two the faces of future. Then you, you live with that. So many people live through hope and fear. For, for some it's predominantly hope, for others it's predominantly fear, a terrible way to live, and for others it's mixed. So the future is an, un, it's an unconscious mind pattern that lives in humans. They've been conditioned from early childhood to be trapped in this mind pattern that habitually ignores the present moment and always looks to the future with the implication that the next moment is going more is more important than this one that's an underlying dysfunction this does not pre to, to realize that the next moment the future actually what i'm going to say now may sound surprising or weird the future actually does not exist. Is that true? Uh, well, let me see. If it existed, some intrepid explorer would have found it and said, I found the future, it's here. But the moment you say, I found the future, it's the present moment. So the future, although necessary for practical purposes, to, in order to f find the, a deeper level of who you are, you cannot look to the future for that kind of realization or fulfillment. For that, the future is a great hindrance, as is the past. So the future, ultimately, is inseparable from thought. 
You have never experienced the future, nor have you experienced the past. You can only experience the past as a memory in the present moment. And you experience the future as some kind of mental image you create of what's going to happen, but you create it now. In other words, there's only the present moment ever. And this is something that if you don't realize that deeply, then you are always running after some kind of goal that is impossible to reach. That realization that there's only ever this moment is potentially life-changing. And so you need to realize most humans have this inbuilt dysfunction. They cannot acknowledge the present moment. Unconsciously, they regard the next moment, whether it's a minute from now, or an hour from now, or two years from now, always regard it as more important. Whenever you are impatient, trying to get somewhere, waiting for something impatiently, what's the next thing I have to do, and I have to do that, and you're pulled in all kinds of directions, what's now, oh, now I have to do that, and that, and that. And there's always the pull to the what's the next thing. Uh, that is, I call that sometimes, you lose yourself in doing. Doing is necessary, obviously, you need to do, but to lose yourself in continuous doing is a serious dysfunction, but it's so normal that nobody realizes it. So what, if you lose yourself in the doing, there's always another, th and this is how stress arises. What's, stress is the gap, in the gap between now and later, the projected then, now and then, in that gap arises, the stress arises. So the mental projection towards future creates the, the stresses between you, where I'm here, but I want to be there. <laughs> and for many humans, that is their predominant state. They are always, they are here, but they, don't, they really want to be there, either there in space or time. Uh, it's amazing, and, and even you, awakening beings, may still, sometimes or often, find yourself in that state where you suddenly realize that the whole day you've been stressed about this, that, and that, and that. The world makes so many demands upon you need to deal with this and this and this, amplified by the gadgets that we now use, which is an amplification of the dysfunction through this, uh, and you lose yourself in the doing. You become completely uncentered and, and basically lost. There are many, uh, even, it happens even to children already at an early age these days. And many children are suffering from attention deficit disorder and so on, which means their, their, their mind is being pulled always away from the present moment. So lost in doing. Lost in doing really comes back to lost in thinking. Thinking underlies doing. So you are lost in your thoughts about the world. And then you engage in all kinds of activities propelled by thought that I now I need to do this, now I need to do that. So the basic condition still for most humans on the planet, so fundamentally, yes, they are lost in doing, they lose their nerves into, but basically it means they are lost in their mind, in the movement of thought. What now, you identify then, they identify with every thought that arises. And the th many thoughts are about future or the past. Not that many thoughts are about the present moment. And if they are about the present moment, then it is an interpretation of the present moment that is completely 
determined and colored by your past conditioning. So very interesting to observe in oneself this tendency to deny, devalue, disregard, reduce the present moment to a means to an end. It's always a means to an end, but it's never rec recognized for what it is in itself. And often it is not, it is more than a means to an end for many humans. This is a very dysfunctional way of being. For many humans, the present moment is actually regarded unconsciously as an obstacle that they need to get beyond. There's con a continuous underlying unease. And what's the next thing that's, that's going to go, go wrong? I know it's going to happen. Lost, lost in the mind, lost in thought. There was an Indian teacher who described the essential human condition as lost in thought. And of course, that's how it is. You, this is then, this movement of thought gives you your sense of identity. Then, then the, the unease, the, the uneasy narrative, the problematic narrative of me and my life. I have to think about this when I wake up in the middle of the night and I carry this heavy burden of my problematic life. For many humans, their identity is unconsciously regarded as a problem to be solved. I am a problem that I'm looking for a solution to this problem <laughs> that I am. And of course, then you go to a therapist. No, if the therapist is good, he might be able to take you beyond that. Depends. If he or she is not good, then you get more deeply entrenched. And 15 years later, you are still undergoing psychoanalysis and find ever deeper layers of complexity in your past. And there's no end to it. So, the present moment is devalued, not recognized, regarded either as a means to an end or an obstacle. That is the for many humans, that is a predominant state of mental emotional state. And there, as I said, the identity is derived from that. So it's the, the, the error lies in identification with thought. Now, the question arises, who or what is it that identifies with thought? If I am not the story that I tell myself about who I am, if I am not ultimately that, then who or what am I? And what is it in me that, that identifies with the story? What is it that creates this sense of identity that is mostly exists mostly in a state of unease or very often discontent because it, it cannot acknowledge the present moment. That is the ego, by the way, that's what we call it, the, the egoic sense of self. There's a very simple spiritual practice to get you to the realization of who or what it is that identifies I suggest at this moment that observe yourself internally right now to see if there's any lingering emotion in you perhaps from earlier today or an hour ago or yesterday or the past two years or the past 10 years, 
is there any and can you feel uh, for example if any is there an irritation somewhere is there some kind of uh, anxiety is there kind of uh, uh, heaviness a certain heavy mood a despondent mood perhaps is it lingering there is there anger anger big thing some residue of anger from what happened earlier is that in you and then normally humans would say I am angry or they would say I am anxious I'm fearful I am in a bad mood now there's already a delusion when the moment you say I am angry or I am anxious that indicates already that you have identified with the emotion of anger or the emotion of sadness or the emotion of fear you have identified you equate I with what arises in your field of consciousness so you say I'm angry it would be more correct to say there is anger in me right now. Now it may sound a trivial difference be between saying I am angry and there's anger in me but it, it, there's a significant difference which goes beyond mere syntax how you put words together because when you say I am you equate I with whatever condition is there in you. This applies to emotion and it also applies to thought when because anger is often it's not just the anger as emotion the anger also exists as angry thoughts and then they 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 reinforce each other as a vicious circle when you when, they, when you are trapped in irritation or anger the emotion feeds the thought and the thought feeds more energy to the emotion it's a vicious circle and you don't want to get out of it. You might notice when you observe an angry person or, or a despondent person or an anxious person, they don't really want to be free of the anger. They don't want their... Tr <laughs> if you suggest it to an angry person, you can be free, you will, will not get a, a pleasant answer. And you, you've seen angry people who they are in the grip of anger or irritation they cannot help it then they shout at you and then they leave the room and a minute later the door opens they come back because they sort of something else to insult you with <laughs> they, they, they are in the grip of it there is co complete identification with thought and emotion they are lost in thought they are lost in emotion but who or what is it that is lost if I'm not the thoughts and the emotion, who or what am I? Okay, I just asked you to just have a look inside yourself and see what it is, if there's anything there that's jarring and doesn't feel good but it's there. And I'm not saying try to get rid of it, no. Acknowledge the present moment. The present moment is what is, externally or internally. That's what is. But there's a huge difference now. You've already, by recognizing that there is, let's say, irritation, anger, or anxiety in you, an additional element or dimension has come in. And that dimension we could call awareness or we could call it presence. And the moment awareness comes in, you are no longer completely identified with it. One could say, I sometimes describe it as, let's say, there's the anger, and as your awareness of the anger comes in, there's a little bit of space around it. That's the awareness. The awareness knows that there's anger. The anger may still be there, it may not immediately disappear, but the awareness knows it's there. 
or whatever else it may be, the arising of awareness is spiritual awakening. The disidentification that happens when awareness arises, that is the spiritual awakening or the arising of the transcendent dimension of consciousness. Transcendent because it transcends who or what you are as a person. Yes, you are still a person. You have your personality, you have your memories that hasn't changed, you have, still have a narrative in your mind, what you call it, your life, but it's no longer, it be, there begins to be a shift, a shift from identifying with that which arises either on the level of thinking or on the level of the emotion to identifying with or being the observing conscious presence. That is, that is the awakening out of identification with form, thought forms, emotional forms. So there's, this is where, when you realize thought, thoughts that go through your mind, in the unconscious state, you, the thought has you in its grip. The thought, you don't think in the unconscious state. Thinking happens to you, <laughs> and you can't help it. The thinking, the, the thinking mind does what it wants to do and you don't even know that there's anything other than the movement of thought in you because you, you, you're so in the grip of it that there's nothing beyond that. So every thought that arises becomes the truth for you. It, it's, it's, it, it has you in its grasp. Every, you, uh, <laughs> one way of putting it is that you believe in every thought that, that comes into your head no matter how crazy, that suddenly that's how it is. And then you, if you look on the internet where people communicate with each other on social media and so on, you can easily see how a person's opinion becomes their identity. Now, an opinion is, is no more than a form of thought, a movement of thought a certain mental position. Opinion turns into identity. And then, because opinion has turned into identity, anybody who has a different opinion becomes threatening to you. Because you, you, it's, it's your identity, your sense of self. <laughs> it's a fiction, but it, this person becomes your enemy. <laughs> So when thought becomes identity, then anybody who questions the thought that you had identified with is the enemy. And that's a deeply unconscious thing for human beings to be trapped in, a very unconscious state, and it wreaks havoc on the planet because it also happens collectively. Identities, there's a collective identity too in groups of people, nations, tribes religions or movements within religions and so on. So the, to free yourself from that, that's the, that is spiritual awakening. It does not mean that people, when they hear the word spiritual, think you suddenly have to believe in this or that or the other. It's nothing to do with that. It's, uh, there's an awakening that happens and it frees you from being trapped in the mind. And now, this, what arises then, is a sense of an underlying presence, which we can, let's, let's do it experientially here and now. In this present, let's acknowledge the present moment. This is what is. Now, in the first instance, the present moment is perceived as sense perception. 
When you become aware of the present moment, usually you begin to become more aware of your sense perceptions. Because before that happens, when humans, so much consciousness is being absorbed by thinking, that many humans are only peripherally aware of sense perceptions. Just enough not to, not to uh, bump into furniture. So that they know what's there, but they're really up here. And then they're walking around. 90% of their consciousness is being absorbed by continuous thinking and thinking. They're not there. You can sometimes see them. You can realize they're not here. They're, their body is here, but they're, they're, their consciousness is continuously being absorbed by thought. And when you become aware of present moment, the first thing that happens, you come to your senses. <laughs> There's visual and auditory, those are the two main sense perceptions. The others are also there, secondary sense perceptions. Right here and now, your sense perceptions are the man sitting on the chair, the totality of this room is also there. And the voice, the words are happening. That's the beginning of the present moment. This is the present moment, is this. That's, now the moment you become acutely aware of sense perceptions, you very much notice a qualitative difference in your state of consciousness. That's the, old, the best word that occurs to me to describe it is qualitative difference from being absorbed in thinking to being present. And often it happens that you notice many things that before were complete, did, just didn't exist for you. For example, I'm sitting here and I notice how the light is reflected off the shiny floor surface here. I notice the lights there, I notice the ceiling, I notice the totality of this space. And there's a shift. There is a, so this is, there is a presence that arises I usually describe it as a sense of presence, the presence is within you. But one could also say that as you become present, you notice, if you allow, allow me to make a somewhat mystical statement, you notice the, the, the entire universe is pervaded by a a presence. Sorry, it's very mystical. But the, the space is pervaded by the press. The, the, some ancient um, old Christian mystics have described it as the, the presence of God that you become aware of. Not God as an entity, but God as a presence. But you don't have to use that terminology if, if that is not, if you are not comfortable with it. Sense perceptions. That's already, so there's a qualitative shift. You suddenly, the present moment is, you see things, you hear things that are actually beautiful in some way, that may be very insignificant, but every object has a presence when you give it attention. It's, it's there, it's, it's lovely. But an essential element of being present in this way is not naming that which you are perceiving. In other words, you let go of compulsive naming, which means attaching thoughts to things or whatever you perceive around you. The ability to perceive in the state of awareness, rather than perceive through the screen of 
conceptualization, of naming, of interpretation. It's a huge difference. You can look at a flower, a tree, natural things are particularly helpful with this. You can look, as you look, you could immediately name this flower if you know the name. Or you could say, I wish I knew what the name of this flower is. Uh, and then you start thinking about it. And then you get out your phone and <laughs> you can now get an app. You take a picture of a flower and it tells you the name of the flower. Wow. No, in some cases it may be helpful to name, to know the name, but for the purposes of our purposes here is for, in some cases, naming is necessary, obviously. In other cases, naming reduces the world that is intensely alive and it absolute miracle continuously. It reduces the world to dead concepts, mental concepts. And then you live through mental concepts. And you yourself, by living through the accumulated thoughts of your past, derive your identity from mental concepts. Your identity becomes a conceptual identity. And once you have created a conceptual identity for yourself that you describe as my life, that's a burden, then you impose it on other people too. The moment you meet somebody, you formulate an identity for them by naming and judging and immediately interpreting who or what they are. And it goes very, very quickly. Okay, now I know who you are. <laughs> and they, and you, you create, you, you put people in some kind of in a prison, a conceptual prison. They might lie to you one day. They say something bad and they, okay, he's a liar. Okay, now you know who he is. You've created, maybe he lied to you twice or three times. Maybe he lies a lot, it's possible. But nevertheless, that is a part of his conditioning, if that's the case. Is that who that person is? He's a liar. No, I know, don't need to deal with him anymore. I know who he is. And every time you meet this person, you're meeting a liar a conceptual identity. This is only one example of many possible conceptual identities, some are a bit more complex. Uh, and so you put people in that conceptual prison because you've done it to yourself already. <laughs> Trapped in conceptualization. Conceptualization is a wonderful tool that can be used to deal with things in this world. But beyond that, it becomes a prison. If you're not able to step out of it when you don't need it for practical purposes, it becomes a dysfunctional, a dysfunction and a prison. The compulsion to always conceptualize and live, relate to this world through the screen of conceptualization. Amazing, amazing. Let's come back to the flower. I'm looking at this flower, I can name it mentally or I can let go of it and simply be so present with it that I'm very much conscious of what I'm looking at but without naming it, naming it mentally. In other words, there's an awareness in the background of your sense perception instead of the person <laughs> Because the person is the one that names, because it's already named itself. So you look at a flower, and in the background of your sense perception, you can then sense something that cannot be described. We could say, perhaps, what you sense is a, an underlying presence that makes the sense perception possible. And the flower becomes more intensely alive suddenly and you no longer believe that you actually know what this is. Naming, although 
helpful in a practical level is also very limiting because we are under the illusion that when we name something we, we think we know what it is. We, all we've done is we attached a, a thought or a sound to it. <laughs> There's the oak tree. You look at a tree. Oh, beautiful tree. In the moment where you, just before you said what a beautiful tree, there were three seconds maybe or five when you were not naming. In that first moment of perception, that where you perceive the beauty there is, that is prior to naming it. The consciousness that's behind thinking, the awareness, perceives. And there, then you, you sense the, the beauty and depths of it. Then, after three, four, five seconds, the mind calls it something. And after you've called it something, you think that's what it is. You don't, you, the, there's, a, there's the old tree. Oh, yeah, okay. I've named it, so that's done. And now I know. And you don't realize, you don't really know what that is. There's a mystery there. There's a, it's a being, a mysterious, incredible being. And, but you can't sense it anymore. You've conceptualized it. The same thing if you go to a, uh, you go to a, an ancient building. In here, there's quite a few ancient buildings that we don't find on the west coast. Old buildings or churches or ancient cathedral. Let's go, let's say you're a tourist and you're traveling in Europe and you go into Chartres Cathedral or Notre Dame or whatever. Well, Notre Dame is probably full of tourists, but um, wherever. you go into an ancient cathedral and they, they, they have little things now that you can hire. That you put it in your ear, in dip, you can choose a language. It's a guide. It's a, virt, a virtual guide that you hire, and it takes you through the cathedral. It explains everything that you see. You, you can spend an hour walking to the cathedral with this guide talking to you. It's a, a digital work thing. And then after an hour you've come out and then a hand back, you've learned a lot about the cathedral. It's all conceptual. Who did that this when it was done? The, uh, who was the artist that did that? Who is that saint, picture of that saint and that? You've learned a lot. That's true. There's nothing wrong with that. But have you actually truly, deeply experienced that place? Have you, were you truly there? Probably not, because it was covered up by continuous conceptualization. On the other extreme, you, you approach the cathedral and you say, no, I don't want that thing, I'll just go by myself, I'm not. And then you walk into cathedral and you go, you look, Wow. And all your mind says is wow. And then you walk around, you can sense the, the entire space, the, the, the presence there. And you see the beauty in the architecture and so on. But you don't need to name, or maybe, uh, occasional naming may come and then subside again, but mostly you take it in beyond concepts. And you really, you experience that place very deeply. So what we are talking about is also a different way of knowing things. You can know through concepts, but you can also know through awareness. And the two do not necessarily need to be separate completely. Ideally, you, you could develop a hybrid consciousness that has the ability to both use concepts when you want or need them and be free of concepts 
when you don't. But what is neglected in our civilization is this second way of knowing, the deep knowing through awareness rather than through concepts. None of this is taught, I believe, at Harvard University, which is here somewhere, or MIT, or many other wonderful universities and colleges that exist here. I don't think you could do a PhD in awareness. <laughs> of course, you can do a PhD in probably some forms of relig spirituality, religion. Uh, you, I'm sure you could do a PhD about the Buddhist concept of emptiness and you could study it, what others have written about it over the centuries and millennia. The concept of sunyata, emptiness, and you become extremely learned and not erudite, knowledgeable. You spend three years and you become one of the world experts in the Buddhist concept of emptiness. Your PhD is about emptiness. But you've never experienced emptiness. That's the, the famous uh, analogy that's used in the East is honey, to know honey. Uh, honey is the same. You could do a PhD on honey, the structure of honey, what it com is composed of, the chemical structure, the molecular structure, highly complex subject. You become one of the world experts on honey but you've never tasted it. Do you know honey? Well, conceptually you know honey. Experientially, you have no idea. <laughs> so that's, we are being consumed in this world that we have created. We are being consumed by conceptualization, ultimately thought. Thought has become a huge burden to carry for us, for most humans, because thought also represents self, as the Buddha called it. Self is the, what the Buddha described as a delusion, ultimately. The delusion of self, it is created by thought. The, the me, the, my, as I described it earlier, my life. Oh, so it's, everybody carries this burden of the self. To become free of the self is the transcendent dimension of consciousness. To become free of compulsive naming, interpreting, conceptualizing, then you become, you gradually or suddenly, you become free of the self, it means your identity is derived from a deeper place within yourself than thoughts. When you become aware that certain thoughts arise in your mind, that is the deeper identity. When you look at a flower, when you look at this room, present moment, sense perceptions, so the sense perceptions are always the first important step in coming, in coming into the present moment, more acutely aware of sense perceptions. Then there is more to it though. This present moment consists of sense perceptions and possibly some feelings inside you Possibly occasional thoughts may come and go, or if you are lucky, there are spaces of no thought, just presence. And then in addition, being aware of sense perceptions, you're also aware of that which makes all sense perception possible, and that is consciousness or awareness. That which makes sense perception or thought possible. 
So this room here, we are aware of whatever we see or hear in this space. We are aware of the totality of this space. And the next step is we are also aware of the underlying awareness. <laughs> in other words, we are conscious that we are conscious. It sounds paradoxical. We are aware, I am aware that I'm aware. Uh, one could say, I'm aware of the awareness through which I perceive all this. But there, when I say that, a mistake has already crept in, which is there because of the nature of language. When I say, I am aware of the awareness, there's a duality there. <laughs> there's I, and there's the awareness that I'm aware of. But that duality does not really exist. It's only created when I speak about it. What really happens that you become self-aware because there is no difference between the I, the, the essential I of you, the pronoun I, first person, the essential I of you and the awareness. They are not two, they are one. The essence of I is consciousness, is awareness. The essence of who, when you say I, Usually, when you say I, which is most people's favorite word, well, probably the worst you use most frequently, uh, everybody's favorite pronoun is the I, and the I is usually equated with the personality that's based on, the, on your past, the, the narrative, the, the my life, that's I, I, do you want to... Uh, I am, and it, it's, it's equated with everything that arises in consciousness. I am angry, I am so anxious, I'm f completely fed up, there's no, uh, uh, etc. Whatever I identifies with. Usually I refers to this, uh, what is ultimately a very limited sense of self, described by the Buddha as an illusion, uh, but there is, a, there is a deeper sense in which you can use the word I, where it no longer refers to that which arises in consciousness, whatever forms arise in consciousness, but it refers to consciousness itself. That's the deeper I, that's the I from the Old Testament when Moses or Abraham, I don't remember, asked God, who are you, what's your name? And God replies, I am that I am, or I am the I am, I am, the essential I amness. The, now I am is the beingness, the beingness of it all, the being that underlies existence. The deepest I am of you, when you can sense the beingness of you, it's not yours, you can sense that is, when I say I've suddenly changed I am to beingness because it's the same word. You may, may not immediately realize that uh, I am is the first person singular of the verb to be. <laughs> you really should say I be. Uh, so when you, the I am is the deepest sense of, is the beingness, not only of you, it is the beingness uh, of the entire universe. It's not, sorry, it's another mystical statement. It is the beingness of life, is the, the, re, the, the realization of the I am, which is consciousness. That is what the Buddha calls the non-self or the emptiness. Emptiness is the traditional translation of that Sanskrit or Pali term but um, I offer an alternative translation, uh, although I'm not a Sanskrit scholar. The alternative translation for shunyata is uh, spaciousness. The, spa the, the spaciousness of 
consciousness itself, the formless space of consciousness, space, spaciousness, inner spaciousness, as opposed to clutter, the clutter of your mind, one thought after another and another and another that cannot stop thinking. And every thought is not, is, happens to me. It, I, I'm not thinking, I am being thought. In the same way people say, I think, but they, when they're unconscious, what happens to them? It's like you, you wouldn't say, I'm beating my heart, because the heartbeat happens to you. And in the same way, to most people, thinking just happens and there's nothing beyond it. Well, they don't know that there is a, a transcendent dimension within them. It's still dormant. I am that I am. So the spaciousness is described by the Buddha as the selfless the realization of non-self. Now the scholars that studied Buddhism, of course, because they were people who wrote like the analogy of people writing about honey, but they never tasted honey, they describe Buddhism as life-denying because it talks about this empty, so-called emptiness. But all it talks about, he, he points to a state of consciousness, of spaciousness. In the same, and Jesus did the same thing. People don't realize that he was talking about the same thing. The one, the, perhaps the main teaching of Jesus is the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven, which again, I offer a different translation that is more suitable for understanding what he's talking about. Uh, the kingdom of heaven, instead of kingdom, which is an ancient term that made sense at the time, my translation is dimension, the realm, the, king, the kingdom of heaven, the dimension, the realm of... And what is heaven? Heaven is there. Heaven, the English language has a word for, has two words for heaven. It's sky or heaven. Many other languages only have one word that means both heaven and sky. Also in, in Spanish and German and I think French, the sky and heaven are the same word. So why is, what is he talking about when he's, then Jesus says the kingdom of heaven? They actually asked him, his disciples, when is it going to come? <laughs> A sign that they hadn't understood the thing. <laughs> so <laughs> they asked, when is the kingdom of heaven going to come? And Jesus said, the kingdom of heaven does not come with signs to be perceived. You cannot say, Ah, it's over. Oh, look, it's over here. Oh, look, it's over there. For the kingdom of heaven is within you. He said it already all. It cannot come with, it does not come with signs to be perceived. You cannot say, there it is, or over there it is. What does that mean? What he describes as the kingdom of heaven, it, it is not an object that arises in your consciousness. Everything else is an object that arises temporarily in the space of consciousness. Sense perception is an object that arises in consciousness. A thought is an object that arises in consciousness. An emotion, whatever is, whatever has a form, is an object that arises in consciousness. But the kingdom of heaven cannot be perceived is not a sign that can, can, does not come, come as, something, as something that can be perceived because it, it is the very foundation for all perception. <laughs> so so he, now why did he say heaven? Because when you look at the sky, that's the closest you can get in this, as far as language is concerned, to this state of consciousness that, that is around form, because language, every word usually refers to a form. Every word itself is a form. <coughs> now, sky is formless. <coughs> Ultimately, sky doesn't even exist. 
we, we call it sky, it's a spaciousness, but it isn't a thing. You can't touch it. And even you went up in a balloon or, a balloon or rocket, you could never arrive at the sky. <laughs> you can't say, and I'm now, you can be in a cloud, but you cannot be in the sky. The sky isn't an object, ultimately. It just it describes spaciousness. And so this is why he cleverly used that word in order to point to a state of consciousness. And that is the state of, that the Buddha described as emptiness or spaciousness. And in the same way, Jesus also talks about uh, the self, this, the wonderful, just two words uh, in one of the Gospels. As you know, the Buddha talks about the delusional nature of the self, that the mind made self. Jesus says, deny thyself. Deny thyself. Oh, what does that mean? Deny thyself, does it mean, uh, yeah, people don't know. What, did, did, how can you deny yourself? You, this, if, this, if the self has a re, has, is an absolute reality, what sense would it make to deny it if it's a real thing? So really the meaning of deny the self is recognize the unreality of the self. That is the meaning of deny yourself, <clears throat> recognize the ultimate unreality of the self. So that's all teachings converge here. This, the burden of self, that is the egoic, the egoic sense of self that people carry throughout their lives are trapped in it without awakening out of it. And so, and that creates the world that we inhabit because when you are trapped in that limited sense of self, which can have both a personal nature and a collective nature, whatever you do, you create trouble. When you are trapped in a purely egoic sense of self, every relationship very quickly becomes problematic and very often dysfunctional, <laughs> you might have noticed. <laughs> and, and, when, and you can also have a, a collective identity, which is of a similar kind, and a collective ego, that is also dangerously dysfunctional. To, and so it creates havoc on the planet, this, this very limited, extremely limited sense of, so all the teachings say, all the ancient teachings point out that there, although there is something that is fundamentally dysfunctional in human beings. They all agree on that. So in Buddhism it's called the state of suffering. In Christianity it's called the um, state of sin. And sin, of course, is not the, the traditional meaning, it's a dysfunction. The original, if you translate the original term from the ancient Greek in which the New Testament was written, sin means missing the mark. You're missing the goal, when you, like an arrow, you miss the mark. You miss the mark of human existence. You miss the very purpose of human existence. Sin, in Hindu teachings, it's, uh, again, delusion, the, the, the delusion of Maya, the, the deluded state. And they all point to the possibility of going beyond. The Buddha talks about the possibility of the end of suffering. In, in Christianity, it's talking about salvation through the realization of the kingdom of heaven. Or in Hindu teaching, it's talking about liberation and, and other terms to, be, to become liberated. So, uh, so all, it's, all the, the, it's all there. It's, once you, you can look beyond the different concepts, you see the, reali the reality to which they point. So the, this, is the, this realization is the next step in human evolution. The human evolution is not finished. Because if it were finished, that would be dreadful news. I mean, wow, this is not possible. That would be a nightmare. We have come as far as we are going to go. Oh. <laughs> so humans are still being created. You, the, uh, we are, we are undergoing 
a process of evolution, evolutionary development, the evolution of consciousness. The entire planet is involved in evolving. It started with very simple life forms. And something is, something is evolving on this level. Now, there is great sense of nihilism or nihilism in many humans and that started in the early 20th century already when Darwin made the important discovery that there is an evolutionary process on the planet some one or two people had discovered it before him too there's an evol evolutionary process happening but according to what he saw is it is a random process of whatever life form is fittest will make it but it's random a random coming together of atoms and molecules and then eventually this incredible world including human beings randomly comes into being and this idea of the ultimate meaninglessness of all, th all life has seeped into the popular culture even people who have never even heard of Darwin or theory of evolution or randomness or anything like that. It, it has affected all human beings. It has gone into popular culture. The underlying idea that ultimately the entire universe is pretty pointless. It's not really going anywhere. It's, or Shakespeare, to use words of Shakespeare, full of sound and fury signifying nothing or even the Old Testament there's one book in the Old Testament is about that how it got into the Bible I don't know because it's not really a religious work it's written by probably an older person who got totally fed up with life <laughs> <laughs> and it's it's great literature but it basically says just have a good time because you're going to die soon if you want to reread that, it's the book of Ecclesiastes, and it starts with the famous words, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. Vanity is an older word for pointlessness. Vanity of, and then it's beautifully written, great literature, but it means just have a good time. Whether you are wise or stupid, you're going to die anyway. <laughs> And so it already, in certain individuals, that, that nihilistic uh, uh, sense was already there, in men, but now it's affected millions of humans. The, certainly, obviously, there is an evolutionary development, there is an evolution, you can't deny that. But is, the question is, is there an intelligence? Is there anything underneath the world of phenomena? Is there anything hidden? beyond that which we can perceive with the senses, like even the amplified senses through the subatomic particles, the particles. Is there anything beyond matter? Is there anything beyond that? Or is, there, is the entire universe a random uh, conglomeration of, of clumps of matter? And that's, that's the, the interesting question. And modern culture be, believes, ultimately believes that although there have been a few great scientists who didn't believe that, including Einstein, is there, no, and now you have to really look at yourself to find the answer to that, whether that's correct or not. Um, is there more to me, I'm talking for you, is, <laughs> is there more to me than meets the eye? Uh, that's an, it's an interesting English expression, more than meets the eye. Uh, that reminds me of a little f famous quote from the, the book, The Little Prince, uh, which said, what, 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 is in, what is essential is invisible to the eye. All the essential things, are this means what is essential cannot be perceived with the senses. Okay, let's go back to me, you, is there more to me than meets the eye? So what meets the eye, of course, is the physical form. 
that you perceive it with your senses. When you look at another person, what meets the eye is first the body, and then you can also get a little bit of a sense of what the psychological makeup is by the way in which they speak and look at you and behave. So you can, that also kind of meets the eye. You can see what's there behind the surface to some extent. Now look at a, imagine a, a surgeon wanting to find a hypothetical horror scenario a surgeon wanting to find you. Would a surgeon ever find you by cutting open your brain and looking for you? For example, he would be looking for your memories. Countless, countless, countless memories and thoughts. Looking for, you. let's say, I can say one thing now. Can you remember uh, your first teacher at school? And can you, right this moment, you hadn't thought about it for years probably. Can you remember your first teacher at school? And suddenly and this image pops up. Okay. Now, and this surgeon is, surgeon is now going to say, I'm going to for, look for that teacher, the memory of that teacher, in the atoms and molecules of the chemistry of the brain. Where? Can't find a teacher. Can't find any memory. We don't. He doesn't even know what a thought is. Yes, there are neurons that send signals that are related to consciousness, but what is a thought? What is? Where are you? What is? And and so you begin to realize, even on the level of thought, thought already exists in the realm of the invisible. Thought is not material. It, thought already exists in the realm of the invisible. And let alone the deeper levels of consciousness itself, the consciousness that you are, that's the essence of who you are, is totally invisible. It doesn't even exist in this dimension. It just reaches into this dimension, disguises itself briefly as somebody and then withdraws again, and then comes into another disguise. It's a ray of consciousness. It reaches from another... This is my mystical intuitive insight, if you will excuse me. It, it reaches from another dimension into this, becomes a human being with experiences, perhaps extracts the, the essence like a bee the, from the experience, extracts some, and then it withdraws. Still exists for a while as a form beyond, beyond the material, and then perhaps this ray of consciousness that emanates from the central sun of consciousness, which is God, and then it, 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 again it reaches out into this dimension, which is the surface dimension, that, is, that by the way is a lifetime. from a cosmic scale that's even shorter than that. <laughs> Many lifetimes. And, and every, every, every living being is a like, little spark of consciousness in different, different vibrational frequencies that illuminates this world. And gradually, this timeless consciousness that comes from the, the central core of all being that is totally beyond space and time, God has no location in space or time. It, it is transcendent to space and time. Ultimately, totally inconceivable. Can't even talk about it. It's, even to, it's a sacrilege even to utter the word God, I believe. But I said it anyway. So that shines into, like the rays of the sun come into this world and give life to this world, physical life. Um, it's not surprising that ancient cultures like Egypt, God was the central deity, God, because it's a great analogy. So something emanates into this dimension from, and that which emanates into this dimension is the light of consciousness. The light of consciousness 
And gradually, the light of consciousness, which is the essence of who you are, uh, grows here as you humans develop. So there is a time, a development that takes place in time, although consciousness itself is timeless. It's a little paradox. But the essence is to, to, to sense your essential connectedness with the source of all life and you sense it the moment the thinking mind becomes still alertness remains and suddenly you sense there is a at first it seems like nothing but in that nothingness there's also the fullness of being. Buddha described it as nothingness. Jesus described it as fullness, because Jesus said, I want you to have the fullness of life. In other translations, it's the same thing. It says, I want you to have abundant life. I would suggest Fullness of life is a better translation because abundance seems to imply many, many things. Fullness is one thing or no thing. I want you to experience joy, he also said, to, experience, to have the fullness of life. Buddha said the emptiness, but there, it's the same no thing. The mind becomes still, stillness remains. At first it feels like nothing, and the, the egoic self feels a little uncomfortable with it. It doesn't want to go there. Many people cannot tolerate stillness. When they go into a room, they immediately need to switch on something. But she becomes still, and then you sense an, an, an underlying presence, hard to describe, this. it has no form. There is a presence there, a beingness, an aliveness. You might even feel it with every cell of the body, that, that presence, not just with the head. You can sense a, an underlying presence that is and as you sense that, at first, as perhaps as little glimpses, and then perhaps you sense it for a little longer, and then you begin to sense that it seems to deepen, and there's great peace there, but not the peace of sleepiness. It's a, an alert a sense of aliveness and peace. It's consciousness, knowing itself. Consciousness, knowing itself, realizing itself. Consciousness becoming conscious of itself. It's, it's more than a personal thing, far more. Consciousness becoming conscious of itself. And then you can sense there's a vast power in there and gradually or in some cases suddenly you can you feel that you are being carried by that power it's your home that's where you are deep really at home not, not an external home. And when you habitually you feel you can return to that again and again until it becomes second nature to you, so to speak. So it's always in the background of your life. You can always sense an underlying presence or beingness that's the essence of who you are as consciousness.
even while you deal with things. You don't completely lose yourself anymore in the doings or in the thoughts. Sometimes you lose yourself and then you return, ah, I was lost again, you return. It's, a, it's a, the most important thing in your life is to find, to be able to engage in this dance of which we might, what we might call a doing and being. So that you don't lose yourself in the doing, but you also don't completely lose yourself in the being, because then you would be incapable of taking any action anymore. You just go, ah. Oh. And it has happened to some people. If they were lucky, they lived in India, where people under have some understanding for that and respect it. If they're unlucky, they live in the West when this happens to you, and they will take you away. <laughs> or if you live in, in, in Los Angeles or San Francisco, they will allow you to live in the street, but they won't take you away. But it's not respected in the West, it's not recognized. Uh, so in, there's still many sadhus in India. Well, some, of course, or quite a few are pretending to be in that state. That's another story. It, it can also be a good a living without having to do any work. That's another story. But, but some are real. Some are real. And they live in that state of continuous connectedness with being. They take a little bit of that. They can still walk from here to there. They certainly don't work. They're just there as, and being emanates from them. And it's quite beautiful. These are extreme cases. Not very few humans are destined to, to enter that extreme state of absorption in being. If it's you, you'll know it. And then I would advise you to move to India. But to, to, to have that and still be able to function in this world, I don't, this, finding this balance, I didn't always have that. When it first, this realization came to me, I was for a while quite a little bit like these Indians who, so I was sitting around on park benches. Go ahead. The moment was so, so wonderful and alive. There was no point in having any future plans or anything. What's the, what is the point? This is just oh, incredible waves of bliss, which in India they call sat ananda which means being, consciousness, bliss as a one single thing or no thing. Sat means being, the relation of being. Chit, C-H-I-T, consciousness. Ananda, bliss, the three come together. Uh, the, the realization of, of consciousness, which is the realization of being, is in, in itself blissful. But don't look for bliss. No necess do not go and, where's the bliss? <laughs> it's just be, be with what is in the present moment, bring an accepting, an acknowledgement to the present moment as much as you can so that you don't continuously lose yourself in future or past. Bring attention back to this, beginning with sense perception and then being aware of the underlying awareness and practicing in daily life. There are many opportunities for practicing Dropping the labels, the naming. And it does not mean that you become stupid. The egoic self might think, this is dangerous. You won't know anything anymore. <laughs> but it doesn't know that there is a deeper knowing that is non-conceptual. We could call it also a higher knowing. There is a higher, deeper knowing that is non-conceptual. That is, it is vital for humans 
to encounter, to live th through that dimension in addition to the conceptual dimension, the thinking dimension. It is vital for the now, for the survival of humanity, it is vital to go through, uh, achieve this shift in consciousness, at least a certain percentage of population of the planet. This is a critical stage where the egoic sense of self has reached its final point where it either it will, self it will destroy the planet in its madness or it will be transcended. Eventually, I would, I feel certain, uh, I can make, I very rarely predict anything, I'm not that interested in future, it doesn't exist as you know. The, the arising of the next stage of consciousness, which is a stage of awareness and transcendence of ego, I still believe it is inevitable for humans. Not a hundred percent certain, because if, if humans are so insane that they, they could conceivably destroy themselves and the planet at the same time. But the transcendence of is guaranteed because that is where the evolution of conscience is going. I still have, I still believe it, it will happen through the human species. If that is a failed experiment in consciousness, that, that's fine too. The universe is infinitely abundant. It can choose any channel for the evolution of consciousness. So if the human was a failed experiment, it doesn't matter ultimately. It's sad from this dimension here where we are. But ultimately, consciousness is evolving. And every setback is actually, unfortunately, a necessary part of the evolution of consciousness because it evolves not in a straight line and it only evolves when it encounters opposition, difficulties, when something seems to, it, it hits, something, it comes up against obstacles and then in other words, things going wrong. That is both on an individual level and on a collective level, both true. Consciousness does not evolve until it has to evolve. And it doesn't have to evolve until it finds a huge, it encounters a huge obstacle. That is the case on every level that the what is usually called bad from our perspective is part of the evolution of consciousness you can see it in your personal life many of you perhaps can or if you haven't yet maybe you will bad things that happen to you for example um, very loss of a relationship or marriage, breakdown of a marriage, loss of a job, loss of possessions, loss of status in society, loss of home, anything that's usually conventionally called bad, an illness, potentially fatal illness that comes. Uh, and many humans have told me that I wouldn't, this, what you are talking about was totally meaningless to me until I experienced, and then they refer to some con event that is conventionally called very bad, until that happened to me when this broke down and I lost that and I had this accident and that, then suddenly I began to realize something deeper. So consciousness grows when it's something that seems to prevent the evolution of consciousness ultimately becomes that which propels the evolution of consciousness.
that is a paradox. But this paradox is already, for example, contained in the uh, ancient image of, that's how I interpret it, the image of Jesus on the cross. And the, the meaning of the cross is very interesting the, because it points to ultimate human suffering, the ultimate of human suffering. The, Jesus on the cross, uh, the cross is a torture instrument, the worst thing that could happen to you. Then the cross has a second meaning, a double meaning. It's a symbol for the divine too. That's very strange. If you came here from outer space and you looked at that, you'd see, what's, how strange is that? The cross is a symbol of the divine and it's also a torture instrument. The, together, <laughs> you, you don't need to be a Christian to appreciate the meaning of that. Jesus is the archetypal human. It represents every human. It, it, it tells you something about the nature of suffering. <clears throat> that which, that which trans, and that which transcends suffering. So, whatever you encounter in life, the seemingly bad, is ultimately something that can deepen your state of consciousness if approached correctly. It can also pull you into, back into a state of unconsciousness. A seemingly bad event can go either way, depending on where your consciousness is. For many humans, a big challenge that comes into their life, like recently, the past two years, the pandemic, many humans have become more unconscious more fearful, more angry through that. And some others have become more conscious, more accepting of the present moment. It can always, a challenge can either make you more unconscious or a challenge can make you more conscious, depending how it is approached. But so here we come to the highly helpful nature of challenges because they will come. Even as you awaken spiritually, challenges continue to come. Life throws them at you. You might have noticed. For a while it leaves you at peace. You know, oh, it's great now. One great relationship and job, everything is going fine for a little while. And then, oh no. Why is always some people take it personally. They say God is doing this to me or that the universe is treating me unfairly. Why is it always me? I was deeply, when I was a child, I was very deeply trapped in negative thinking. And I remember a very a thought that would come to me continuously, hundreds, thousands of times, <laughs> that started already at the age of eight and lasted until the age of like 14, 15. And the thought was, bad things always happen to me. Bad things always happen to me. Oh. And often they did. <laughs> so I was, I was trapped, in, trapped in that thought. But the, the challenges are great. Another example. Your body, even on a physical level, it applies on all levels. Difficulties are needed, challenges are needed, obstacles are needed for the evolution. All levels, the evolution of consciousness, but even the evolution of, of, of physicality. Uh, if you want to strengthen your body, it will not happen unless you challenge your body. And what does it mean to challenge your body? What does it mean when you start lifting weights or start jogging? You've been lying on a sofa for a year and then you start jogging. Oh. Or you try to lift weights. Oh. It's not pleasant. And what you're doing is you're, you're making life difficult for your body, obviously. 
you're making life really difficult for your body. And what happens then if you carry on, then after a while, on some level, the body, because it suddenly is needed, the body cries out for more energy. Oh, I need more energy. And suddenly an influx of more energy comes because there is a demand for it. The life of the body was becoming too difficult without an influx of additional energy. And then it comes. And then it, you start jogging and it's no longer an ordeal. It's actually, you can f feel the movement of energy through the body. Because it wasn't there before. It came because the body's life was becoming too difficult. It's just well, a practical example. It happens on every level. I talked to a gardener who showed me he plant, was planting seeds and the little sprouts came up out of the soil and then he put some soil back onto, uh, on top of the sprouting little sprout, the plant, and he said, now the plant will have to struggle to get through the soil and it makes it stronger. Oh, that's interesting. And so it, but it applies also in, on the level of consciousness. Consciousness grows through adversity. As the ancient Latin proverb from Roman times say, per aspera ad astra, which translates approximately as through adversity to the stars. <laughs> through ad aspera is like rough stuff, adversity. Per aspera ad astra, to the stars. So it's through, through adversity you, you evolve. So instead of demanding from now, once we know that, we have a different, we relate to the world in a different way. We no longer demand, demand that, that the circumstances of the world, including other people, situations, places, we no longer demand that they should make us happy. We no longer tell the world, make me happy because as long as you tell the world make me happy it's not going to make you happy it can't do that you have a you're living under the delusion that the world can make you happy but it's not here to do that because you might have noticed it can happen sometimes for sh short periods it doesn't last because the world is here to make you conscious including all the obstacles that are an essential part of the evolution. The world is here to make me conscious, not to make me happy. Every relationship is also here to make me conscious, not happy. When you no longer have place unreasonable, impossible demands upon the world, including that a relationship should make you happy or some kind of achievement should make you happy, there's nothing wrong with achievement. It's beautiful. But is it going to make you happy? Is it going to c create a deeply satisfying sense of identity? In most cases, not unless you have some transcendence in you. So the, the paradox is when you drop the demands that people, places, or situations should make you happy, they actually become quite enjoyable. <laughs> the demand is dropped, they become enjoyable because some, something else arises from within that is inseparable from the present moment and it's not some external thing that is going to do it for you the, that which arises you begin to live in acceptance of the isness of things yes you're able to make changes that's fine but your inner state of being your state of consciousness is aligned with the present moment and there comes an acceptance of the isness of things and that immediately brings about the deepening to the essence of who you are with the acceptance that's a, one of the portals one of the main portals of your to your essence identity is present moment acceptance and present moment awareness some people speak of gratitude, I, that's, there's a lot of truth in that. They say, be grateful for life, for the present moment. That's good, 
But what is gratitude? I've, some people I've spoken to said, who am I grateful to for? Because I don't, a Buddhist said to me, I, I don't believe in God. Who am I grateful to? Um, of course, Buddhism is not an atheist religion. It's just they don't have a concept of God, but that's another story. Uh, now, gratitude is, what is gratitude? It's a, an appreciation of something that is to appreciate, to give it attention and appreciate it. Uh, gratitude is not so much to do with your life situation. Some people say you should be grateful for what you have because look at other people, how much more you have than other people. So be grateful for what you have. I don't think that's that, that great because then your, your, grat, your, your state of greatness depends on the others being worse off than you and then you can be grateful. <laughs> So that is not the real, the deep, the deep gratitude is simply not some story you tell yourself, oh my life isn't so bad after all if you think of other people. Then you have another conceptual thing happening in your head. But the gratitude for just the simplicity of this moment, whatever is at this moment, the gratitude for this beautiful thing here, beautiful amazing presence, the gratitude for this giving appreciation of the little, all the continuous little things, your life consists of little things, even if you're a VIP, ultimately really your life is full of one little thing after another. There's no, ultimately there's no big thing, unless I have a concept, glass of water, the reflection of the light in the water, just take a moment to appreciate, oh, and you are present. And as you are present, there's not only the water and the light, there is, you can sense the presence that you are in that moment of stillness. You are the stillness. And then you taste the water. Oh. Some people need to take acid to, to feel that. <laughs> <laughs> But you, you, you don't. But no. <laughs> people take acid because I can see what it does for some people. They are so trapped in their mind and you take this thing and it frees you from being trapped in your mind and they become, your, your senses become very good. I tried it once, by the way. Uh, uh, <laughs> Because people asked me about it many times, I said, I have to try it now, because <laughs> how can I answer questions about it if you haven't tried it? So it, it frees you from, you know, it, it amplifies, at least in my case, it enormously amplified sense perceptions. So the water has a particular taste that I never tasted. Wow. Uh, they, so it, it can temporarily perhaps free you from your mind. It's, there's no ultimate solution there. It can give you a glimpse perhaps of what's, what is possible. I, my usual state is a hundred times better than the acid-induced state, so I didn't take it again. It's fine. But uh, it was an experience. It's fine. So the appreciation of little things instead of conceptually looking for the big thing to happen to you when you can finally start living. Many people have that. When I make it, then I'll start living. They, they feel they're not really, they're not really there yet. <laughs> I haven't started quite yet. My life hasn't really started yet, but I'm just trying still to get there and there and there. And then, then you are, are 25 and then you're 35 and then you're 50 and you still haven't arrived. Or, or once or twice you thought you had arrived, but then it turned out to be not it. <laughs> and then towards the end you say, when I re reach my retirement, I'll start living. And then you retire and for a few weeks you feel good and then you sit there and say, what now? <laughs> Who am I even without my job description and my position? I'm nobody, I'm worthless, there's nothing for me to do, oh my God. 
and then you die. <laughs> so to, 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 to keep your attention in the present moment, <laughs> some people would, if I had a conceptual thing in my mind, for example, <clears throat> this afternoon, I knew I was going to give a talk, and conceptually that would be a big event. I have to give this talk to, to large numbers of people. I hope I can do it. What are they going to think of me? Is the inspirational flow going to be there? Oh, oh my God, this is huge. I'm not getting ready. I prepare myself. Uh, um, and then, but that would be very stressful. But if you can just stay with this moment, I'm just, yes, I know I'm giving a talk, but at this moment I'm drinking a cup of tea, and then I'm eating a banana, and then I'm getting dressed, and then the car comes to pick me up, and I step in the car, and I stay present instead of projecting anything. I mean, and I look out of the window, just present. Okay? It's all little things. It's, it's not, there is no big thing. Just, just a little, then I step into the so-called green room, which isn't green, but it's called green room, I don't know why. Uh, and then I sit in the green room, just breathing, I'm walking a little bit, because I didn't want to sit for so long. Uh, just, again, this not a big thing, and then I step out here and sit, a man is sitting on a chair, that's all. It's nothing is big, ultimately. Every life consists of little things that you, you can appreciate and uh, give attention to. That's, so to look for the big, the big break, when it comes, it might come, but, it, but it's, it'll be some form of illusion, ultimately. <clears throat> so appreciate all the, the present moment. The, the present, find the presence of God in the present moment. Find the presence of God in the consciousness that you are. And if you can sense the consciousness that you are, you can sense the presence of God in the deepest meaning of the word, which is an emanation into this dimension from the central source of all life, being itself, the I am of the universe. You are a microcosm of the macrocosm, many secrets of the universe, most the essential secrets of the universe you can find out by going deep enough, deep enough within yourself. It's all there. That's the, so the, our, your purpose here is to embody this arising consciousness and allow it to live, it wants to come through you if you allow it, you, you have to cooperate with it, <clears throat> allow it to emerge through you. You don't, you don't have to make it happen. It happens if you do not uh, create excessive obstacles to its arising, which is the egoic sense of self. But key is present moment awareness continuously, which is External, drop the naming as much as possible in your daily life. Have many moments of simple presence and feel the two levels, sense perception and the underlying consciousness that is the essence of who you are. The stillness behind the sense perceptions. Wow. And that stillness then deepens and in that stillness the vast intelligence of which the human mind is only a reflection. It's not separate from it, but it's a reflection. There's a vast intelligence in that stillness. In that stillness, then, can use your mind. It can give a talk for two hours. And you, when you stepped onto the stage, you had no idea what you were going to say. <laughs> so it's kind of, it carries you. And with that comes a deep, not self-confidence, but not in the conventional sense of the word, but in a deeper sense of self, the transcendent being that you are. That is the power in you, and that ultimately is the meaning of the power of now. The power of now 
this this now that you described of the now actually the, the now is you the essence of now is consciousness so ultimately the now is who you are you are the now unfortunately this didn't occur to me when I was writing the power of now otherwise I could have put it in the book <laughs> Thank you. Uh, this was the secret of life. I believe that uh, it's something that you can now, you are living it already, many of you, and now every one of you is an essential element in this awakening, awakening of conscience. And we can perhaps even prevent the worst things from needing to happen on this planet. And that is my hope and my belief with your help this will happen. Thank you. I'm sorry that my chair is more comfortable